These chairs are low. And they don't go up. Okay. They go up. You just got to get off it. Yeah, I tried. All right. They won't go up. May I have everyone's attention, please? I call to order the work session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Wednesday, May 17, 2023, at 10 o'clock. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis. Here. Vice Mayor Lunt. Here. Commissioner Eisner. Here. Commissioner Kulias. Here. Commissioner Kulianis. Here. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is I was going to let anybody want to make any comments on the commission uh, make them ahead of time. I had a conversation uh, with the attorneys for the sake of time. We're just going to go ahead and get into the, um, the presentations. Um, Ms. Kardashian is going to start it off with the government and the sunshine, and then after that'll take about an hour or so, and then after that we'll have a 10-minute break, and then before we begin on the public records, and then around lunchtime, around noon, we'll have a 30-minute break for lunch, and lunch is being provided. Uh, the city clerk will explain about that a little later. So, Ms. Kardash, if you'd like to proceed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I do want to thank you for setting aside the time to do this. Um, I think it's very important um, that we regularly do this, not only because you have the edu educational requirement that's part of Florida statute that every year when you follow your financial disclosures, you have to check that little box that says you did, you know, your sunshine, uh, public records and ethics training. Um, I think it's also important, too, for you to make sure that your community is aware of these roles and our uh, rules. Um, and laws that are applicable not just to your public officials and elected officials, but a lot of them are also applicable to your staff and your public employees. So thank you for giving uh, Mr. Salzman and I the opportunity to present this information to you and um, to go through just sort of some of the basics and some refreshers for those of you who may already know some of this. Um, so I do want to take a moment. Um, I am a board certified lord, lawyer in city, county, and local government law. And for those of you who don't know what that means, board certification is a process with the Florida Bar where uh, they vet the attorney to say that they have expert training and knowledge in their particular subject matter area. Um, board certification includes not only testing um, on your knowledge of the material, it also includes a certain number of years of practice and then um, some uh, practice hours within your certification area. Then after that, you are also peer reviewed by other lawyers who also uh, practice in your area and lawyers who also don't practice in your area to vet your professionalism and your knowledge that way as well. Then after you're board certified, that does not stop. Um, you have to frequently um, re-up. So every five years you go through another process where they go ahead and um, you, you have to get letters and, and recommendations from, again, your peers saying that you have maintained um, the standards of knowledge and professionalism in order, in order for the board certification to continue. And I did just receive my second um, re-up. So for the next five years, um, I will also uh, be board certified. So I like to start off with the oath of office for public officials. A lot of times what I'll do is, is pull this up and say, you know, <laughs> if I have to sit down and have a conversation with you where I am going over um, in detail your oath of office, it's probably not going to be a very pleasant conversation. But aside from that today, what I really want to point out is what you're actually promising to do when you take your oath of office. You can see there that it actually stems from the state constitution and then you have some specific portions of your oath that, do, that are specific to your community, specifically the charter of the city of Tarpon Springs, right? Um, and I want to talk a little bit here about the um, supremacies of supremacy of laws. So you have the United States Constitution. It says that you will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States and the state of Florida. So you're making that promise to uphold both of these documents and the charter of the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, and what you have, the, the highest law of the land is the U.S. Constitution. And then you have your federal elected officials that do uh, make the United States Code. Um, and then you have your administrative agencies that make your Code of Federal Regulations. Then moving down to the state level, you have your state constitution and then your Florida statutes and uh, the Florida administrative agencies that promulgate your Florida administrative code. 
then you come down to your city government. You start here with the charter of the city of Tarpon Springs and the duly elected officials who are the legislative body, similar to the state legislature or U.S. Congress, you are the legislative body for your community. And that is your role pursuant to your charter, um, is that you make your ordinances and your resolutions. So your ordinances are your more permanent laws, the things that you intend to be continuing, the things that um, you know can be enforced through certain legal actions. And then you have your resolutions, which are, which are really more intended to be temporary statements of policy. That's part of the reason it's easier to change resolutions than it is to change your ordinances. There are more detailed and stricter requirements for passing ordinances. You have to have um, multiple hearings and, and um, you have to advertise it so the community knows. And then when you're dealing with land development code and land development regulations, um, a lot of that uh, can, can uh, increase as well and there's additional regulations that you do have to apply. Yes. Ms. Kardash, I think um, as we discussed, if there's any questions from the commission to ask them as we go along, is that correct? Or do you want to wait till after your presentation? Yes, please. Um, if the commission has questions, please don't hesitate to, to ask or interrupt me. I, I don't mind. <laughs> I won't be offended. Um, and I know that some, some of this may be a little basic for some people, but um, I also want to make sure that we have a little bit more of a robust history as we kind of move through this so we can kind of understand where we came from, where we're going, and make sure that we all have kind of that basic premise and understanding. Because I know there's all kinds of people watching and listening um, that will have different levels of experience and knowledge when it comes to local government law. Thank you. Um, so I do want to give, on that note, I do want to give a little bit of a brief history lesson on the Florida Constitution. Okay, so the, Florida, the current Florida Constitution was adopted in 1968 by the people of Florida. Um, and with that new adoption of the Constitution, we have what's known as home rule power, right? So previous to home rule power, what the state and local governments operated under was something known as Dillon's Rule. And the major difference between Dillon's rule and home rule authority is the fact that under Dillon's rule, you only had the specific powers as a municipality or a county, um, as a subdivision of the state, those specific powers that were granted to you by the state legislature. So basically, if your enabling charter or, or your um, enab enabling legislative act didn't give you the authority to do it, you couldn't do it. And what ended up happening is that the state legislature became incredibly overwhelmed with all the small local bills um, that were being pushed on them and it kind of prohibited them from doing the more general work and the more important work of the state. So what they did when they changed the Constitution is enact home rule authority. And home rule authority gives municipalities the ability to act and to do anything for a municipal purpose. And when you look at what constitutes a municipal purpose, it is generally to protect the health, safety, and welfare of your citizens and of the people who elected you into office. So when you're, you're legislating and you're enacting things and you're providing things for your community, it becomes really important <coughs> then to look at it through the lens of how is this affecting and how is this important to the health, safety, and welfare of my community. So in addition to home rule authority um, being uh, in the Constitution, there are also um, a, a lot of things that can prohibit you, even though you have this basically grant of plenary authority under the Constitution, um, you can have what's called a preemption. And a preemption means that either the state or federal government has has and typically it's it's going to be you know your your um, your state government because the federal government will will normally put preemptions on states but don't usually do anything with local governments. Um, but this, what the state legislature will do a lot of times is preempt a particular area um, so that local governments can't alter or cannot amend what is going on in that regard. Um, and there's two kinds of preemptions. Um, there's express preemptions, and express preemptions are one where it specifically states in the bill or the legislation that's being passed that, hey, you cannot do this. You are not allowed to act in this area. We want the state legislature 
we as the state legislature um, want to have the authority to, to do that. Um, and over the past several years, we have seen a large increase in the bills that are coming to us from the legislature where they are putting these preemptions um, in there and sort of slowly starting to erode away at what would otherwise be the plenary authority of municipalities to act for a municipal purpose. The other kind of preemption that you can have is, what, is what's called an implied preemption. And implied preemptions are implied from where the legislature enacts such a comprehensive um, regulatory scheme that it really doesn't leave local governments a lot of ability to maneuver around that. And so they've sort of taken up all the space there is there to legislate or to regulate in an area, um, and that would be considered an implied preemption. One of the best examples of that is, is um, when you look at motor vehicles, motor vehicle regulations, um, chapters 316, 317, 318, those are areas of state law um, where the, the legislature has sort of overridden that and um, has it so that there's very little for local governments to regulate in, in that regard. So with that, I want to turn to a little bit um, of what your specific role is here in government. As I mentioned, the Board of Commissioners, the Mayor and the Vice Mayor, um, you are ultimately governed by your city charter. What you can and cannot do in office is actually laid out fairly clearly in your charter, which Mr. Salzman is going to cover in a little bit more in depth. Um, but what you have here is you all are the legislative and policy making body and then you have a city city commission city manager form of government so that you have actually delegated through your charter the people you know it's your charter is your contract with your people with your citizens um, and by voting on that and putting that in place your citizens have essentially told you that they want you to remain in that legislative and policy making role and to then delegate the administrative and the more day to day tasks of running city government um, to vest that in your city manager. So that's how you kind of operate. That's what you have pursuant to, to your charter. Um, you do have some specific officials that are mentioned in your charter, and you can see these can kind of be different from community to community. Typically, you're always going to see your clerk, who your official records keeper is, so that's in your charter. Your city attorney um, is, is usually in there. You also have, in addition to the city manager, city clerk, and city attorney, you also have an internal auditor that's part of your charter. Um, and that was actually something not a lot of governments have that anymore. Um, I have seen too recently some, some uh, governments that had just the auditor position um, and then have kind of uh, moved away from that and to include city managers um, because in some communities, city managers will also take on that role of making sure that your departments um, and your directors and, and everything within your city is running appropriately and running efficiently the way that it was intended to. So also here I have your city employees. So you do have certain city employees and um, certain city officials that are vested with a certain amount of discretionary authority. Um, those are people like your police chief, right, and your police officers. They are vested under state law with discretion, discretionary authority to perform their work, the work that they do, to make the arrests that they make, and, and to perform independent under state law. Um, uh, sort of a little bit outside um, of that realm. Another place where you kind of see this also too is in your building department. Your building official is governed um, by Chapter 553 Florida statutes where they have some specific discretionary authority that is vested to them pursuant to state law. Um, additionally, your city, uh, city attorneys, we um, don't really have necessarily authority because we don't have authority to act. We have authority to advise. Um, but the advice that we give is largely discretionary, and we're governed by the Florida Bar and the Florida Supreme Court in what we do, the advice we give, and, and how that sort of plays out. So those are some, some examples of officials that you have that operate in your city who are not just governed by your charter, but they are also governed by provisions of state law and have other licensing requirements um, that aren't governed by this specific body. So then you also have um, appointed boards within your city, and there is a difference between boards that you delegate specific final decision-making um, 
final decision making authority and also boards that make recommendations. Now boards that make recommendations, even though it is a recommendation to the city commission for final action, those are still boards that are going to be covered by Sunshine and typically you establish those um, if they're ad hoc or temporary boards through a resolution um, or if they're going to be a permanent board of the city, they're going to be governed by the uh, provisions that you enact in your code of ordinances. Um, so one thing that's important to remember is when you hear the phrase, and you'll probably hear it a couple times during the presentation, um, uh, a lot of times probably during the ethics portion, where you hear the phrase um, proper performance of public duties, and that is a, a legal standard. And what that means is if you are acting outside the course and scope of your duties, so if you are taking actions um, outside the duties that are specifically delegated to you under the charter or under state law that there can be adverse consequences um, for that. And we'll kind of talk about some of those as we go along. So now I'm going to get a little bit into the word of the day, which is government in the sunshine. Um, and really what that is, is it provides a right of public access to the official government decision-making process. Um, it was specifically put in place to combat and to fight corruption, to make sure that there is not closed door politics, to make sure that the things that you do are transparent, that they're apparent to your citizens, um, that you know, you're not making closed door decisions and then just kind of perfunctorily approving what you already discussed and decided outside of a public meeting, and that can be very important. So that does emanate to us from the state constitution, and that was state law prior to the 1968 constitution. Then the legislature sort of fine-tuned it a little bit when they enacted 286.011 Florida statutes. Um, and one thing I do like to point out is that all 50 states and the District of Columbia have some form of open government laws. There are even two additional states that specifically call their laws sunshine laws, and that's Wyoming and South Dakota. And I like to mention that because a lot of times I hear people say, well, why does Florida have this law? This isn't important. We shouldn't have to you know, follow this. It's, it's cumbersome. It inhibits the proper conduct of business, you know, and, and it doesn't. The purpose of it is that it's there to make sure that the business you do is correct. It's there to make sure that, that the people of your city, the people of the state of Florida, are entitled to the honest services of their publicly elected officials. So, and that's something that's very important that I like to point out. Um, and so now I'm just gonna take a moment um, and I'm gonna read some quotes from some previously uh, enacted cases. So this is from a 2010 case called Sarasota Citizens for Good Government. It says, because the Sunshine Law was enacted in the public interest to protect the public from closed door politics, the law must be broadly construed to affect its remedial and protective purpose. The Sunshine Law should be construed so as to frustrate all evasive devices. And this can only be accomplished by embracing the collective inquiry and discussion stages within the terms of the statute. A mere showing that sunshine law has been violated constitutes irreparable harm and irreparable public injury. And therefore, where officials have violated the law, the official action is void ab initio. And that term void ab initio means that any action that you took where there was discussion outside of the sunshine is subject to being automatically overturned as if you never enacted that measure. That's what void ab initio means for those who don't know. And there is an ability um, to cure sun, sunshine law violations. Sometimes that can be, um, it can occur inadvertently, particularly when you're dealing with citizens who don't really know the law or citizens who may approach you or try and talk to you and say, well, Commissioner so-and-so said this. Um, and the case law really does put the onus on the public officials as the individuals who, who um, 
have to abide by these laws, right? Because sunshine doesn't apply to citizens. And it doesn't say you can't talk to your citizens. But what it does say is that you can't use citizens as a means of transmitting information in between commissioners, right? <laughs> so then the onus comes on to you to then tell that citizen that you can't talk to them, right? Um, and then also, too, if there are violations of sunshine law, to cure them, a lot of times the cure is the disclosure. And there are some cases where they talk about whether the Sunshine Law cure that's enacted um, is, is actually sufficient to, to combat or to overcome the actual harm that is done. And typically that involves some sort of disclosure on the public record that there was this conversation or that this thing did occur. So usually what I like to do, especially if it's a more substantial regulation, and, and I'll give the example of um, post-COVID. So you know during COVID, we had something that we never had in the state of Florida where we didn't have to have a quorum physically present in order to conduct government business. And this was done pursuant to an attorney general's opinion that was that was issued throughout the state that said, you know, this is temporary. We can do this and suspend these rules in a state of emergency, um, which is strongly persuasive authority, but ultimately isn't the law of the land, right? So just in order to protect um, my communities, I did a sunshine cure resolution where I sort of laid out, hey, you know, this is the situation. This is what happened. These were the executive orders that were in place. So this is the law we followed. Nothing was intended to violate um, a strict compliance with sunshine law. So a lot of times that's how your cures should look, that there should be something that says, hey, this is what we did, this is what happened, it wasn't intentional, um, and our intent is to properly enact this reg regulation and to make sure that what we do um, is proper, essentially. So with that, I'm going to take a little moment and talk about the basic elements of Sunshine Law. And there's three basic elements that are laid out by the statute. The first one being um, that your meetings must be open to the public, right? Sort of the basic premise there, transparency in government, public access, right? So yes, um, your meetings of your public boards and, and your commission must be open to the public. Um, the second requirement is that reasonable notice must be given of such meetings. And then the third one there is that minutes must be taken um, of, uh, at your meetings to sort of memorialize what happened, what occurred. And, this, and it's important to know that your meeting minutes are not required to be a verbatim transcript. There are other areas, um, particularly when you get into shade meetings, where you are required as a governing body to have that verbatim transcript. Um, but generally, minutes only have to generally reflect the official action that is being taken. Um, it doesn't even have to really um, say what the discussion is. It just has to say discussion. Now, a lot of times there is a preference um, within a community for whatever reason to have a little bit more detailed minutes. That is not a legal requirement. It can be something that's part you know, of your rules or your policy of the government body as to how detailed you want your meeting minutes to be. Um, I would also note that there's no requirement for you to record your meetings. Although it is now a pretty generally accepted practice that there's some recordings. I mean, we have the technology, right? But this is a, these are laws that far predated a lot of the technology that we, na we now have. Um, so there is no legal requirement for you to record, to broadcast, or to do any of the things that you all do um, and have made those policy decisions to do as a community for your citizens and for their access to your uh, government decision making. Um, then um, the other thing I also like to point out is that you are not, uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, on all the other boards in the city that I've participated in, we've always approved the minutes. Yes. But we don't do it at the Board of Commissioner meetings. Why is that? Uh, I w it was my understanding that they were part of your consent agenda. Is that not the case? That is, yes. that is correct. We're just behind. OK. We will be bringing a whole bunch forward. Oh, OK, I haven't seen it. In the, I've only had been to two meetings. <laughs> uh, OK. <laughs> it's very limited. So, OK. I All right, one. thank you. <clears throat> yes, Commissioner I have Eisner. a question. Um, we had COVID for approximately two years, and we had mm -hmm. meetings for two years. What was to stop a person from having your phone connected to John, for argument's sake, just hypothetically, and to be muting your computer and going back and forth and <laughs> having a conversation and knowing full well what he's going to vote for, what I'm going to vote for? How, did that, how does that get rectified? Because it is a violation. 
So there is some case law that has graciously come to us from the COVID period that I'm going to be going over. And there actually is one that kind of touches on that situation because there were incidents where you had public officials on the Zoom meetings that were clearly texting, that were, um, you know, doing things that they really shouldn't be doing. You know, um, uh, I I also have seen because there were also indeed shade meetings that occurred, um, you know, dur- during the Zoom era. And one of the things that I would kind of harp on if I was doing a, a, a shade Zoom is that there cannot be anybody else in the room because um, if you break that confidentiality of a shade meeting, then, then that confidentiality is lost, right? Um, so there are things like that that didn't happen, and there, there were some consequences to some of those actions. Um, and, and I know at least one of the cases that we're going to go over here today does sort of address that exact situation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other thing I do kind of want to point out is, you know, it just says reasonable notice of such meetings must be given, but the law ultimately does not really clearly define what that notice is. Um, generally, if it's just your regular perfunctory meeting, um, you know, at least 72 hours, you're also not required to have an agenda unless you have adopted a policy that says you have an agenda and what's going to be on it. And I will say that that is usually considered um, to, to be particularly where you have a lot of items to consider, um, an important part of the orderly and efficient conduct of government business, um, particularly be, when, you, when you do have um, extensive materials to go through and, and things to go out, but you do have the ability to amend your agendas, right? And that's kind of why I like to point that out, because it's not a sunshine law requirement that you actually have an agenda. Um, it's something that you adopt as a policy to ensure that the things are coming before you that need to get before you at any particular meeting. Um, now, there are other types of things that do require some specific notice. Um, again, land development code regulations being one of the most important ones. Not only is there general public notice that has to go out um, within certain specified periods of time, also when you adopt ordinances, there's a, there's a time frame. I think it's um, at least 10 days prior to the final adoption is what 166041 says in terms of how much notice you have to give of the final adoption of an ordinance, and that's just a general ordinance. Then there's additional advertising and notice regulations that will apply to your land development regulations, and also some situations where um, citizens and affected parties are going to be required um, to have specific notice. Some of that is governed by state statute, um, and some of that is governed by your actual code of ordinances (laughs) that have been adopted in accordance with uh, best practice standards. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a meeting. Um, And a meeting can actually be anything. A lot of people will will be like, well, if I'm just at a coffee shop or I'm just at a bar and I'm going to talk to my fellow commissioners, that's not a meeting. A meeting is only when we're in this formal setting, and that absolutely is not the case. Um, All that is required for something to constitute a meeting under Sunshine Law is that there are two or more officials from the same governing body, right, that are discussing matters that come before, that are likely to come, likely or will foreseeably come before them for a formal decision, right? That is all that is required to constitute um, a meeting under Sunshine Law. And that meeting does not have to be in person. It could be over the phone. It could be via email. It can be via text message. Um, It can be any form of communication that you might be using to talk to another commissioner. Those are all things that are going to constitute meetings under the Sunshine Law. Um, And one thing that I also like to to point out um, is Facebook. Right? If you are posting something on Facebook, right, um, and you know another commissioner is going to see it or is likely to see it, you know, you do have some protection under, you know, what sometimes is referred to as the first bite at the apple rule, where you can issue um, memorandums or you can issue position papers on a particular topic. Mm-hmm. Yes? Could you hold further conversations that we have going on in the back of the room while we're trying to concentrate on what you're saying? Thank you, sir. Um, So uh, the 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 Facebook issue being, um, you know, if if you're putting, you know, it's one thing to just say you're having a meeting or there's going to be this issue, but if you're saying I'm going to vote X Y Z or I'm going to do X Y Z. 
um, you know, knowing that other people on your, your governing body or your, your government body are going to see that, that can become problematic. Where it becomes really problem, problematic is if one commissioner posts something and then another commissioner comments on it. That's really where you're going to have a problem, and then that comment on the other commissioner's post is going to be a slam dunk under Sunshine Law that this is a violation, right? Um, so that's what you really want to try to avoid is, is having um, that type of a scenario arise um, where there's comments or discussions on each other's um, posts. Or it can also be, and I use Facebook's just one of the more common examples, um, but any sort of message board, chat board, there's lots of different social media platforms out there. Um, I have been working and looking at some social media policies, um, but part of what I've been waiting on is that there is state legislation that is coming down that is going to govern, govern certain applications that can be put on government phones so and government computers and things like that. So any employees that you have, any commissioner who um, are issued um, devices, um, they're, they're, and, I, and I'm not even sure if it passed or, or if it's going to be signed, but um, there are some specific um, applications that are going to be limited by the, that are supposedly going to be limited by the state legislature in terms of what you can and cannot download uh, for apps on any phones that are, that, um, are issued by issued by the city. It's not going to govern personal phones, right? Your personal phones are your personal phones. Hopefully you're doing all your business on, on whatever government issued <laughs> devices you have. It's just an easier, cleaner way to kind of keep things in line. Um, but uh, there, there will be, um, we anticipate there being a limit on that. Yes. How do they touch base with likes, you know, loves, angers? I mean, we have so many things that you could post on that. How does that play into it? I understand fully upon the comments. Right. But if you post a like, do they have any ruling on it? Because I just want to know, I mean, it's very easy to just ignore it, but right. it's just not done. I mean, you know, somebody goes to do a, a fire or something and you hit a like that you like the person did it. Right. <laughs> where, do you, where do we draw the line? That's my question. That's going to be something that the courts are going to have to tell us ultimately. Yeah. And um, at the end of the day, the question will probably come down to whether or not you're um, communicating an approval of uh, a decision, right? So are you communicating an approval? Are you communicating um, displeasure with whatever it is they posted? That does become a communication then, sure. right? Uh, yes. So, yes. Okay. So... Um so when you're posting, if you're posting something on something that's innocuous, right, like mm -hmm. um, uh, vice mayor was wearing his fire uniform and I actually posted, oh, mm -hmm. I can't wait to do that too or whatever I said, I can't. And then, um, and then I thought about it and I shot that over to the city clerk because I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, but again, it wasn't something we are voting on. It Correct. was just... He was wearing a uniform and thought it was whatever. And then, so that's part one. And then okay. the other is reflection. So if if a, a commissioners um, are talking after a meeting mm -hmm. and reflecting on their vote, you know, oh, you know, hey, what did you mean when you said so and so? You know, on that issue, or, or you know, even something is like. I didn't think you were going to vote that way. I thought you were going to vote no, but you voted yes or whatever. I mean, can we, is that uh, a violation? Um, the best lawyer answer ever. It depends, right? Okay. So, <laughs> so you have to remember that the qualifier here is discussing a matter which, were, which will foreseeably come before you, right? Um, and, and so obviously in the example that you gave of, uh, uh, you know, just a picture um, in a uniform, that's not really a, a, a matter, right? Um, but when you're talking about something that you already took action on, um, it may very well be that that is a done deal, it's over, you're not going to have to deal with it again. But you really don't affirmatively know whether or not that issue is going to come back before you in some way, shape, or form for some other type of decision. Um, and it becomes even more problematic if that specific decision is regarding something that's a quasi-judicial hearing. 
Um, you know, so I, I try and temper those comments or, or um, advise just, just to avoid it um, if you can, because you really don't know for sure, even after you've taken official action on something, whether or not in some way that's really going to come back before you um, for whatever reason. Um, but if you, so you don't envision it's going to come back from the board and the rule is foreseeable. Correct. So Correct. if it's a if it's already decided, for right. example, and you don't know if it's going to come back before the board, does that qualify as foreseeable? Does that mean every action we take as a board is foreseeable because almost every action we take can come back to the board? Well, um, I'll, you know, if you're, if you're fairly certain it's not going to, let, let's say, you know, there is something that you're fairly certain is a done deal and you don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, you have some conversation after the fact um, <coughs> with a fellow commissioner and then all of a sudden somehow um, it's back there. Um, a simple disclosure on the record that you had that conversation can cure the uh, violation or at least the perceived violation that there was that that there that you were taking action or discussing business outside um, of, of that context okay. that's if you remember it <laughs> <laughs> yes so that that's a different issue <laughs> okay but when, when would you do that disclosure you would do that disclosure when discussion on the item begins so with oh, a quasi, if it, if it comes back, if if it comes back, if you. it doesn't come back, then it's not business that's coming back before you, is it? Okay. It's not. It's not something that's that you're then going to be acting on. It's if it comes back, then yes, you do have to make that disclosure. Okay. Thank you. <sighs> okay. So I'm going to look at a couple of those elements um, a little bit more in depth. Um, and so we had open to the public, reasonable notice, and minutes must be taken. Um, and later on, when we get into the case law, I am, I am going to talk to um, about something in the minutes requirement as well. Um, but here, open to the public, these are some things that have emanated to us from case law. Um, the, where you're holding your meetings has to be um, accessible, so meet ADA compliance and provide the opportunity for individuals who might need assistance to, to participate in civic discourse, to have that ability to participate. <laughs> right? And then they also have to be adequate for the anticipated crowds. So the reality of the situation is that you're not always going to know for certain whether, you know, what kind of crowd you're going to get for a particular meeting. But oftentimes there is some sort of indication. Um, maybe your, your planning and zoning department has received an inordinate amount of calls or an inordinate amount of objections to a particular item, or, you know, your city clerk has received multiple calls uh, about a particular item that may kind of indicate um, that you're going to have an excessive crowd. Now, the reality is that your commission chambers are very large. Um, you know, down there in the theater, you have a, a vast amount of space compared to some other um, city halls that, that may not have that um, amount of space, even the county commission chambers. Um, I would venture to guess that I think the county commission chambers are, are uh, smaller than the facilities that you have down there. Um, and I, I like to give the example um, from when I was on the local planning agency um, that there were certain measures that were coming before us where they would actually move our meetings to like the St. Pete Epicenter um, or, or other campuses where we could actually accommodate that. Um, and if you do know that, they're, that you're going to have this crowd or if a crowd shows up that cannot be adequately housed in the facilities where you're holding the meeting, um, that you do have to either cancel the meeting or, or make accommodation um, for that. Um, so that's something that's important to remember because, you know, otherwise then we would just all hold our city council meetings in somebody's office, right? <laughs> so um, that's <coughs> not something that we want to do that would be considered an evasive device um, to, to frustrate, you know, uh, attendance and the access of the public to whatever meeting you're having. So the second one down there is no inaudible discussions, and, and um, this can become um, incredibly important. If the purpose of Sunshine Law is to have those conversations, to have that information um, on how your decision-making process is working, and you're having inaudible discussions on the dais 
during a public meeting where they can't hear what's going on or they don't understand what's going on, um, then that can be problematic in terms of whether or not you're actually having a meeting that is open to the public. And there has been a substantial amount of case law on that particular issue. Um, and, and I have no um, inaudible discussions, um, but as of recently, I have seen an increase in like note passing <laughs> um, and things like that where it may not be as obvious or visible. And, and I will tell you that that certainly invari invariably um, it is a problem, that that is is going to be considered not a, an act that is in line with sunshine because you're not having a, a meeting that would be open to the public. So you do have a requirement in state statute um, that the public has a right to be present and to be heard, um, but that is not plenary, so that is tempered a little bit. Um, this is an excerpt from that state statute, Florida Statute 286.0114, basically says that subject to limited exceptions, um, public boards have to provide an opportunity for comment prior to taking official action on a proposition. And, and you all do um, have uh, quite a bit of public participation um, in, in your government process. Um, not every government is so lucky. So, so a lot of times they only hear from their citizens when, when they're unhappy about something, right? Um, but you guys get everything. You get the good, you get the bad, you get um, everybody who's interested in what you're doing and wants to participate in the government of the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, and, and so you do have to give the opportunity for public comment, um, but you do have the ability to enact rules that govern what that means. And I'm gonna go over two recent cases um, that talk about and sort of cement the rules that go along um, with public comment there. So the first one that's listed is the Larson versus Palm Beach County case. Um, on this case, uh, Larson sued stating that um, they were vital, vi violating the state statute because um, he was only given three minutes to comment on the consent agenda, and he was not given three min minutes to comment on each consent agenda item. Um, he said that that was supposed to apply and that he should have been able to have the opportunity for each item on the consent agenda to, to get those three minutes. Um, and the court upheld the county's rule and said no. You know, the, the consent agenda is the consent agenda because these are just routine and perfunctory matters that, you know, um, aren't out of the ordinary. It, it's, it's our routine government business. You get three minutes to comment on the entire consent agenda. And the court emphatically upheld that and said that that was not an evasive device to, um, to deliberately dilute um, the public's right to be heard. So that second case um, is a little bit more stringent, that Moms for Liberty um, versus the Brevard County Public Schools. This particular case, um, the, uh, I believe the speaker was removed from the school board's chambers um, because of some of the comments that were occurring because the school board actually had rules of decorum um, and how you can and cannot present um, things that you can and cannot say. You know, you couldn't be abusive. You couldn't have personally directed comments to members um, either of the governing body or to staff. Um, and that's important to remember, too, because you don't want to create a hostile work environment for your staff by allowing members of the public to berate your staff um, at public meetings. So you can explicitly prohibit that. And if people do not abide by that rule, this case says emphatically, it's a Florida federal middle, middle district case, um, and it was affirmed by the 11th Circuit Court that says yes. You can remove your chair, your mayor, the chair of whatever board it is, and the mayor in your commission meetings does have that ability and that right um, to request that the sergeant at arms, whether it's your police chief or um, another officer who is in there, um, can remove somebody from a public meeting for violating your rules of decorum. That is absolutely allowed. Um, because what you want is civility in the conduct of your, of your public business. Yes, you want the public to come, you want them to comment, you want them to have their input and their opinion, right? And now, um, I, I do wanna make a, dis a quick distinction here about First Amendment and First Amendment rights and case law. So under the First Amendment, you know, everybody likes to say I have a First Amendment right to say whatever I wanna say, whenever I wanna say it, and unfortunately, that is not true. Right. The amount of expressive conduct you actually have 
um, depends on the forum that you are in. And typically there's three types of forums, right? There's your traditional public forums, which pretty much allow for unfettered um, unfettered expressive activity, whether it's, it's verbal or whatever the case may be. Um, then you have limited public forums. Um, now your meetings um, are deemed um, pursuant to law to be limited public forums where you can enact measures um, that put uh, restrictions on uh, on the, the expressive activity that is incurring, such as your rules of decorum and things like that, right? Um, and what the, the case uh, here, the Moms for Liberty said, is that content-based restrictions on expressions in a limited public forum are permitted if they are viewpoint neutral and reasonable given the forum's purpose. And your forum's purpose is always the orderly conduct of official government business. That is your forum's purpose, right? Um, and, and what becomes important here is that when you do have these rules, that they're evenly handed, uh, applied, and that they're not being applied with respect to the speaker's point of view. Um, and where I see this becoming problematic, um, you know, particularly in smaller communities that don't necessarily get a lot of public participation, sometimes they just let people speak unfettered, and then all of a sudden somebody comes up and they censure them. Well, how does that, how, how does that speaker know that you're not censuring them just because you don't like what they're saying if you're not even handedly applying you know, the decorum rules and the rules of procedure that, that you put in place um, for that type of comment before your body and before your board? So, so that's some of what um, they will look at um, when they're determining whether or not you're actually restricting somebody, somebody's ability um, to have free speech, um, or whether or not uh, you know you're you're trying to maintain the orderly conduct of government business. Mm -hmm. Yes. You go, you go first. <laughs> Age before beauty. No. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm going to bring this up because that has been happening of lately. Is it mm -hmm. the mayor then's job to um, do that? Is it our job as commissioners to do that? Who stops if the if the person is breaking that rule you just said? Um, well, the first person with discretion is the mayor, um, but you as a commission can request that the mayor in, invoke that ability um, to, to shut that kind of thing down. So you as a commission can also ask for that um, within the context of Robert's Rules of Order. Sometimes it can be brought up you know, uh, as a point of order that somebody is violating your your policies and what you have enacted in terms of your rules of decorum. Thank you. So I, I don't know exactly how the this meeting is going to take place. Or if it's a presentation and then we have a workshop opportunity to, to discuss things. So I'm throwing them out there now. This may be something that we talk about later if we're doing this in a workshop format. This this um, is your workshop. This is so, okay. Yeah. So I can just throw. Okay, so I'm going to throw yes, it out there. Please. <laughs> okay, so um, these these are just thoughts in my mind, so I don't want anybody to get bent out of shape. Okay. Um, but when we, can we have limitations on certain kind of um, conversation? For example, um, we sometimes we have people who come up and speak on times that there's issues, right? And then they use it as a format to pontificate about some other matter, right? Okay. Uh, that seems to happen on a regular basis. We have um, that happening. So uh, th that can be limited, right? If somebody, if we're talking about a, uh, the vote, we're voting on a roof situation and then somebody comes up and talks about, you know, the constitutionality of, of Disneyland, um, can we shut that down? Okay. And, 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 and I'm not, I'm just, I'm right. You, you understand why I'm saying I this. do. Okay. <laughs> so, um, he here's what I'll say about that is, is one of the things, um, that this moms for Liberty case says is that you can shut down irrelevant comments. Okay. okay? So if it's not relevant and that can become more important again, within the context of a quasi judicial, 
um, procedure where the comments that are being made from either proponents or opponents um, do have to be related to the issue that's under consideration, right? So that's more clearly defined. Um, I would say that there is a little bit more latitude when you look at just open public comment, right? Because you are giving, um, you know, with when you have something on the agenda that says, you know, citizen comments on, on any subject, that is very broad, right? Yeah. So again, you're looking at the purpose of the forum and what opportunity, you know, you're, you're giving there. Pu the public comment at the beginning, I understand right. you, that you could bring up anything. Yeah, and, but, and um, Andy, I don't, yeah. did you wanna no, weigh I in mean, as well, I, I think? I mean, what you talked about, and when we go through Robert's Rules of Order, that is a point of order. Okay. Is the particular issue that's being discussed or people making comments dealing with that subject. And it needs to be restricted to that subject. As you said, oh, that's what, that, that's public comment at the beginning on any matter that is not before the board, right? But it's also, you need to bring it back to your agenda item. So that is part of Robert's rules that you can call. Yeah, and the importance of this is, is not, in my mind, not to take away anybody's right, but we obviously want, uh, in my, in, personally, I'd like to see our meetings be more concise and shorter. I also think that it's not good government when we, these things that drag our meetings out to where we're deciding important things at 1230 at night when citizens aren't in the audience, citizens have already gone to bed, and then here we're deciding because meetings have been drawn out by all this, you know, these kinds of, and, and, and sometimes you, you affect change not with a sledgehammer, sometimes you just use a chisel, right? And it might be just a, five minutes here, five minutes there. Before you know it, we, we saved a, a 30 minutes and it makes a big difference, I believe, in, in the way the form of our government works. The other thing is, can we limit, um, say, for example, four minutes for residents and then two minutes for non-residents of Tarpon? Can you do something about, to that effect? I, I actually would shy away from putting anything in place or any regulations in place based on residency okay. um, because I don't think that the, that the, the rules regarding public comment um, can limit uh, based on that. I, that may actually be a federal constitutional violation. Okay. I'm just asking. <laughs> yes. So you spoke of three minutes per the whole consent agenda. We have ten things on the consent agenda. Um, Craig Lunt pulls number three, I pull number five, John pulls number seven. Mm -hmm. So we have the first, the mayor calls for the agreement, we all take a vote. Somebody gets up to speak for the three minutes, then we have, Craig has his three minutes, does, does that constitute another person to be able to speak on what Craig pulled? what I pulled and what John pulled. This I is would question. say yes, once you pull it out of the consent agenda, then they're gonna have that ability to comment on that specific item because you're, you're changing how you're making your official decision on there. So if you're passing everything all at once in the consent agenda, then yeah, they only have their three minutes to talk on all those items. But then once you pull something out and you're taking a separate action on it for whatever reason, because you have some comments that you wanna make as a commission, right? You have the ability to do that, but then you have to also then in turn give the public to comment on that as well. Thank you. That wasn't covered. That's why I was okay. asking the question. Yes, absolutely. Ms. Kardash, yes. as we talked about um, ir irrelevant comments coming into on certain items, uh, would you say that if any one of us on this board brings up a, a comment that's really irrelevant to the, the agenda item we're discussing, does that not open the door for... Uh, public comment from an individual to expand on that item that was discussed? Well, what I would say is that the rules of decorum and the relevancy of what you're discussing is also applicable to the commission and the commissioners that are discussing it as well. Um, you know, it doesn't serve the purpose um, of your office um, to go off in a different direction, you know, when you have an agenda item at hand that you're supposed to be covering and discussing and debating, right? It, it always makes more sense to sort of stick to what it is um, that's before you. 
Yes. Um, and that also helps your citizens to understand that, that you know, you have to be the example for your citizens um, in how you're conducting, you know, your government and your government business. Um, and, and so part of that can be also your own adherence to the policies that you're putting in place um, in terms of your rules of procedure, your decorum, and how you're going to discuss your items. Okay. And uh, when it comes to public comments and pretty much directed a towards us as a commission, you know, that they may be critical at times. Yes. Um, I, I have a, a viewpoint that the tone mm. and the way the comments are expressed also takes into um, consideration the form of business and decorum and civility. Yes. If someone comes up there and whispers comments and we don't like it, is it out of decorum? Is it out of civility? As opposed to someone coming up and yelling the same comments because it takes a big perspective in the content of civility and decorum in which we have to listen to. Yeah, a lot of that can be very fact specific given what's going on. Um, so you have your general standard um, sort of what you're aspiring to. And, and I would say just as a general rule is that the law will not tolerate um, abusive conduct or, or you know, obscene conduct. Um, you know, and so where that line is drawn sometimes can be very difficult and can be a matter of discretion that sometimes can, um, can go one way or the other depending on how it's perceived. Um, one thing that I've kind of noticed in when I'm sitting in a meeting and sitting there and, and discussing things with, with um, people on the board um, and then I go back and I watch it on, on the YouTube, um, it, sometimes it looks different and it feels different than when I'm physically present in the room and doing it. And so that's also something that you should be very co cognizant of because you do broadcast your meetings and you do record them. Um, you know, that sometimes what you're seeing and, and what you're feeling um, when you're up there and you're doing what you're doing may be perceived uh, differently and sometimes more objectively um, by the camera that's on you. anything else on that okay I, I have a question yes mayor um, you, you, we, we heard a lot of things about uh, what residents say and do and things of that nature I recall somewhere in the past um, I think it was uh, maybe you or mr. Salzman that brought it up that is that the parliamentarian pretty much determines when there's violations of rules of procedure and decorum and I know you answered uh, Commissioner Eisner in the sense that, mm -hmm. you know, commissioner can bring it up. The mayor should be the line, first line of defense. But oftentimes when any, any, anybody ever says anything, it's a political, it's, it's interpreted as a political action. You know, I don't like what you said about me, therefore I'm going to object. It's a violation of our decorum, um, so forth. And I thought that um, when that statement was made that, that it would be the attorney, I thought that, well, that's a pretty fair way of doing it because right. then it's not a political issue. Mm -hmm. It's none of us, but it's the actual person that is deemed by our charter mm -hmm. as the parliamentarian of our meetings. Correct. So could you comment yeah. on that? So, so your parliamentarian can step in, right, to, to make those determinations. Um, you know, the, you know, uh, Unfortunately, you know, that seat is the hot seat, the mayor seat, the chair seat. Um, so you're the first sort of like that first step, right? Um, and, and then after that, it does fall onto your parliamentarian to then step in. And usually where the parliamentarian is most useful is if there's questions about the application uh, of what you're doing or application of the rule. Um, they have a little bit more of that ability to sort of provide that clarification um, for, for you um, as the body that's using those rules. Yeah, just so and that's helpful. And, and for the record, if somebody challenges whether something is uh, outside of our rules of procedure, uh, if I'm presiding over the meeting, I'm going to turn to our parliamentarian and said, what's your comment on that? What's your take on that? Correct. And then we'll go from there rather than me make, making a call. Absolutely. So, that that yeah. is definitely um, a good way to handle it um, and, and to help for clarity, too, for folks who may not understand what's going on. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Are we breaking up your chain of... Are we breaking up your chain of thought or by inter interjecting so much or not at all, uh, all right. not at all I so, think we're yours all day so <laughs> all right well then I'll, I'll interject um, you know I've seen different uh, 
boards and, and have different styles, right? I, I saw, I, you know, one of the, like the prior uh, mayor and board, you know, people got up and spoke and for the most part, they would just say thank you and they sat down, mm -hmm. right? And no matter what they were saying, throwing flames, whatever the, they're mm -hmm. doing. Uh, I, I'm of the feeling that, that, you know, citizen, that, that this is the citizen's house. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we decided to run and take this position, but they, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, they're not, we, we, we want to debate things they don't necessarily want to they want to come up and just express themselves mm -hmm. now we have we've kind of gone to a little bit different where we're now interacting with them mm -hmm. they come to the podium they say something and then we have you know commissioners and mayor whoever all you know kind of having a back and forth dialogue um is it, it are both appropriate uh, well both are legal um, okay. But if you're asking my opinion, um, it is public comment and not public discourse. Um, it is also not uh, for the public to ask questions. Um, you know, that it's for them to come up and express what they want to express. There's other forums and other methods for them to ask questions and make inquiries. Now, the reality of the situation is sometimes, you know, that is the best place for them to come and, and ask their questions and things like that. Um, but you do not have to necessarily answer them. You do not have to engage with the comments. Um, that is something that you all have to decide how far you want to take that as elected officials. So, but then if you do it, again, getting back to that, making sure you're doing it even handedly and in a content neutral manner. So if you're gonna do it for one, you gotta do it for all. Um, and if you're not gonna do it for, for one, then you can't do it uh, for all. Okay, so. thank you. Um, so we'll move now into some uh, exemptions to Sunshine Law meetings, um, and I'm not gonna get into detail on these, um, but these are some very basic uh, um, exemptions where a, a governing body does not have to meet in the sunshine. Um, but here's what I would really like to point out with respect to these. Whereas the Sunshine Law is to be broadly construed by the courts, these exceptions are to be narrowly construed by the courts. Um, so when you're looking at these, you have to look with specificity at what the, the statutes say in terms of um, how you can handle these meetings, what is required to be done to, at these meetings. Um, you know, like I mentioned, shade meetings have some very specific requirements. You have to have a court reporter there. Only those people who are specifically listed in the state statute um, are allowed to attend shade meetings. Uh, and, and so those are some things you just want to keep in mind where you do come to a point where you might be invoking one of these exceptions um, is that either myself or, or Mr. Salzman is going to make sure that you're sticking by the letter of the law in terms of the requirements um, that you have to meet so you do not run afoul of sunshine um, in having any of these um, types of meetings or conversations or discussions. Um, and so I, I also point that out to point out that that does not mean that you can have plenary, unfettered, um, out of the sunshine discussions with your fellow commissioners about these topics, right? Um, any conversations that you do have about these topics outside of the sunshine does have to meet um, those statutory um, and case law uh, requirements and criteria. So now I'm going to get into um, some of the new cases that have kind of come out um, with respect to Sunshine. Um, and these are just, we're just gonna do these three. Um, and then I have um, some more that are going to go um, a little bit more in detail. So the first one here, Florida Citizens Alliance versus the school board of Collier County. You might notice that there's quite a few school board cases <laughs> over the past couple of years. Um, which is uh, interesting to see. So um, in this Citizen Alliance case, um, the Collier County School Board convened a staff committee um, to pre-vet uh, the textbooks that were set to be approved um, by uh, the, the school board. Um, and they went ahead and they vetted those books and then they made a recommendation to the school board and the school board with one single exception um, adopted uh, that recommended list of textbooks. 
So uh, the Florida Citizens Alliance sued and said that the staff committee meetings should have been open to the sunshine. So um, the, the court said absolutely. Um, what the school board did was delegate a decision-making function to the staff. So typically if you have a staff committee that solely serves a fact-finding purpose without making any recommendation, just gives you information, um, that is going to be a committee or a board that is exempt from the sunshine. But once that committee makes a formal recommendation to you for action, then, or you're asking them to make that formal recommendation, then you have delegated them um, a decision-making uh, um, authority and, and function um, within the scope of your, your official decision-making process. All right, and so uh, that is a second DCA case there. Um, the next one down, another school board case, Collier County versus Mason Classical Academy. Um, there was apparently some issues um, with how the uh, Mason Classical Academy, which was a charter school, how it was being run, um, and there were some investigations that were taking place um, into uh, the academy, and they started to do some public records requests, and, and um, they knew that there had been a, a meeting regarding um, their school with two uh, school board employees um, and uh, with the school board attorney. And the academy said, this is a meeting that should have been subject to sunshine, uh, was part of your um, official decision making process, and the court said no, that um, this was not a sunshine meeting. Um, and then part of what they were also trying to do was take the deposition of the two employees with respect to what occurred during that meeting. And the court said, oh, by the way, um, because this was solely fact-finding, there is no attorney-client privilege in this meeting. So the two staff employees that were in the meeting with the school board attorney were not extended the attorney-client privilege and um, were uh, permitted to be deposed on the conversations that they had with the school board uh, attorney. Um, essentially, the, they qualified it by saying the meeting... Um, did not exist for the purpose of uh, obtaining legal advice or legal services. So that certainly is something that you, you need to keep in mind. Um, and, and we'll kind of touch too on some other limitations of the attorney-client relationship um, in respect to, to your taxpayer-funded city attorneys, right? And, and that, can, that can be very important, right? Um, so then we have um, Jackson, that last case down there. This is Jackson uh, versus the city of South Bay. Um, Mr. Jackson lost his election and uh, made a public records request um, to the city's canvassing board for the minutes um, of their meeting. Um, and they kept saying, well, we don't, have, we don't have any minutes. They don't exist, right? Because under public records law, if a record doesn't exist, right, you don't have to provide it because um, it doesn't exist. But um, the court said, no, there's no public records law violation here. Um, but what we do have is a violation of sunshine. Um, and because the minutes were not produced and were not timely produced, the court did find that there was a violation of sunshine law because you were missing one of those three requirements under sunshine um, in terms of making sure that minutes were taken at your public meeting. All right. And so um, with that, I am going to turn to my last case that I am going to cover for Sunshine. And there's actually two cases involved here. So if you look in your folders, um, you've been provided with some materials in addition to a copy of my PowerPoint. Um, on the other side of the folder, there are two cases. One is the Gillum's case and one is the Paris case. Um, and I don't usually do this, but um, I have been doing this for all of my communities because um, I believe that it's important um, that people kind of understand what happened here, what went awry, um, and, and what to do um, if situations like this occur. So commissioners, if you want to follow along, I am going to turn to page six. So this is a fourth district course, court case. It comes to us from the city of Sebastian. <coughs> um, and you may notice in looking at the style of the case, Gillum's v. State, this is a criminal law case. 
and there were three commissioners from the city of Sebastian um, who were charged both with perjury and for a violation of Florida Sunshine Law. Because if you don't know, um, knowing an intentional violations of Florida Sunshine Law is a crime. It does carry criminal penalties. Um, and there has been an uptick um, over the past several years of prosecutions for violations of Sunshine Law, public records, um, and, and ethics too, is, is also certainly been on the rise throughout the state. Um, and in this particular case, um, there is a companion case. You have both um, in your folders. You have both the Gillums and the Paris case. The third commissioner um, that, that was uh, arrested um, actually opted to plead, and these were appeals. So two of the three um, individuals who were charged with violation of Sunshine, they were also charged with perjury. Um, they actually uh, uh, appealed their sentences um, from the trial court to the 4th District Court of Appeals. And you'll notice there, there's not a full case site because this opinion was just released last month. Um, you actually even have um, on your copy of it the sort of qualifier um, that says, you know, it's, it can be withdrawn within 30 days and, you know, we're, we're pretty much past that, right? So, um, and, but it hasn't been put into uh, the reporters yet. So that's why it has a, sort of a case site there that, that looks different. But it is from um, the 4th District Court of Appeal. And what happened here is it, it was during COVID. And it was in the very beginning of COVID, like I think March uh, or, or April. So one of the, the first or second meetings after, you know, we had all the governor's orders and all these regulations came out. And there was a regular, regularly scheduled meeting of the city council they were expecting a larger than normal crowd. They were ex expecting a crowd that was not going to fit in their uh, city council chambers and certainly not a crowd that was going to fit um, in their city council chambers in accordance with um, COVID restrictions and guidelines. And part of the reason that this was going to be important is because there were um, city uh, council members and commissioners that wanted to fire the city manager, right? So the city manager actually had authority um, under uh, the emergency order that had been issued as part of their city to go ahead and cancel the meeting. Um, and because of the crowd that was anticipated, of course, you know, that's how he testified, because of the crowd that was anticipated, he went ahead and canceled the city meeting. Um, and uh, one of the commissioner, of the council members there in particular, decided that he didn't like the fact that the, the city manager was going to um, cancel this meeting because he was adamant that he was going to get rid of him, right? So he contacted two other um, commissioners in order to get a quorum, right? It was a, a five-member five council um, and contacted two other commission, uh, council members and got them to um, come down to City Hall. They entered City Hall. They conducted um, a meeting with the, the three council members wherein they fired the city manager, the city clerk, the city attorney. Um, then they uh, purportedly impeached the mayor and made Mr. Gillums the mayor of the city of Sebastian. All right. So, and this meeting continued and, and went on um, uh, until the police showed up and, and arrested the commissioners <laughs> in attendance, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> So this is what Judge Sicklin had to say about this case. <clears throat> um, the majority opinion solidly stands for the clinical legal reasoning and academic analysis behind our decision to both affirm and reverse certain of the convictions that occurred before a jury below. So what they did was they actually reversed the perjury convictions but upheld the Sunshine Law convictions. I think it is important, however, to issue a clarion call to the hundreds of Florida public officials who are subject to the Florida Sunshine Law. Indeed, as more and more individuals become Floridians and engage in civic involvement, our new citizens need to be fully aware of Florida Sunshine Law. The appellate briefs filed in this case suggesting that the Sunshine Law is vague and unclear or that the law is weak and unprovable have given me a pause and a commensurate urge to raise a warning flag. It has been many years since a comprehensive opinion has been issued by a Florida Intermediate Appellate Court on the subject, and thus perhaps this admonition is particularly timely. 
it seems unlikely in this unfortunate series of events that former Sebastian City Council members Pamela Paris and Damian Gillums would have ever thought it imaginable that they would now be appealing criminal convictions for which they have been sentenced to serve jail time of two months and six months respectively. My guess is that in retrospect, they would have run away and resisted any temptation to get caught up in the excitement of the moment, as unfortunately, they ultimately did. The recent Indian River County Sunshine Law prosecutions and convictions illustrate actual examples of popularly elected local governing body officials being ordered to do real jail time in a real Florida County jail for the commission of a real Florida crime. Of course, whether elected or appointed is of no consequence. The Florida Sunshine Law applies equally to all. After now engaging in significant research on the law itself, plus sitting for oral argument on the topic in January, I have developed a concern that some government officials subject to the Sunshine Law may not, be, may not fully appreciate the law's meaning and or the possible criminal penalties that lie in wait for those who carelessly fail or to fully comprehend the Sunshine Law and abide by it. And this baffling complacency is not for want of official publications, including the current 360-page Government in the Sunshine Manual prepared by the Florida Attorney General. To be sure, the briefings in these consolidated cases and our majority opinion are considerably lengthy because the issues are complex and yet, paradoxically, not at all that difficult to understand. The scenario in this case is alarming. Three duly elected members of the Sebastian City Council who were not allowed to privately discuss foreseeable government issues did so anyway. They decided amongst themselves as their personal protest to the mayor and city manager's decision to cancel a regularly scheduled city council meeting because of COVID to enter the city council chambers and conduct the canceled meeting anyway, armed with a government issued pass key and in an unlit city council members these three city council members took it to the dais and purported to take official action in at what in essence became a spontaneous, non-announced meeting of the three of them that lasted until the police showed up. That imprudent action itself was a flagrant, flagrant violation of the Sunshine Law and a reading of the statute makes this conclusion abundantly clear. Whether two or more officials privately discuss in any manner whatsoever a foreseeable issue of any magnitude inside the other's office or at a coffee shop or in the spectator audience of a child's soccer match or at a statewide education conference or by quick text or whether they do so through surrogates such as aides, friends, relatives, or other government officials or whether, as in this case, they decide to spontaneously convene an unannounced rally or meeting so long as two or more of them are involved, these are all distinctions without a difference. And every individual unauthorized private discussion between two or more officials along the way constitutes an individual statutory crime against each person with each separate charge carrying a possible penalty of 60 days in the county jail plus a $500 fine, plus substantial court costs, plus six months of probation per act. And notably, in the state of Florida, no statutory sentencing guidelines exist for these types of crimes, and consecutive jail sentences and consecutive probationary periods are permitted and within the unfettered discretion of the trial judge. So... Um, I do like to point out, uh, you know, they had the sentences of um, six months and two months, you see, so one only had uh, one count that they were being charged with, and then the other, which I believe was Mr. Gillum's, um, was charged with uh, six, three counts, so <laughs> quick math. <laughs> Um, and then you see there uh, some of the other, the other, the, the fine is kind of negligible, but when you take into account the fact that you're going to be paying attorney's fees, um, because if you cr uh, commit a criminal act while in office, um, you are not entitled to uh, avail yourself of the taxpayer funded representation of either myself or Mr. Salzman. Um, so we do represent the city and we only represent the public officials 
and city employees to the extent that they are acting and operating within the proper performance of their public duties. So that's um, something very important that you have to remember. So with that, I have come to the end of Sunshine. Yes, sir. Whose obligation is it to, when you become a city official, to be trained at this? So um, it really is not incumbent on the city to provide that training. Um, however, I consider it best practices to in some way, shape, or form um, provide it to um, city council members, um, city commissioners, and and um, and usually when it's employees, they have a supervisor that's supposed to go over an employee manual with them. I really don't handle a lot of public employment law, um, but I do know some of the basics, like you should have you know, an employee manual that, that new hires are trained on and then have to sign. Um, I have in some of my um, communities made sure that there are statements and information um, regarding Sunshine Law, public records, and, and um, uh, so, some certain ethics provisions too that, that can be problematic for employees in your employee manuals. Um, also too, you know, there is that state statutory requirement that you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning where you have to check that box that says that you received this training. I would note that that is actually newly applied to municipal officials. It used to be that it only applied to county and, and state before that, but then they did go ahead um, and make that applicable to county and municipal officials. Then in addition to that, we're waiting, waiting to see when it's going to be applied to folks from other special districts, because you have to remember there's all kinds of other special districts that constitute local governments, you know, community development districts, special fire districts, um, you know, special hospital districts, things like that that exist throughout the state that are also subject to these same rules. So, so here's the uh, statement I want to make to you. Um, I found what you've had to share with us is amazing mm -hmm. and enlightening. Um, so I'm going to go back to my question. Mm -hmm. um, should this not be um, taught to every commissioner elect? Should it not be? Is there a time frame? Did anybody put a time frame in? Um, or is it okay for an attorney that works for the city to do nothing and, and leave you in the dark is the question I want to make. So um, under your rules of procedure, I believe that you um, have uh, provided that your city clerk does your training mm -hmm. under your specific rules of procedure. Um, I myself consider it best practices, um, a, a best practice for a local government law attorney to make sure um, periodically, not just once, um, and, and in some communities they will have an annual training that's set up um, for all their boards, all their members. When you get new people on a board or in office, that is always the best time to do it. Um, and, and I think that, um, you, you know, th there's nothing at law that says your attorney has to provide you this training, right? Um, because it is a training, it's, it's not necessarily legal advice, um, but sometimes it does move into that realm of providing legal advice to you all, right? Um, but no, it is not a legal requirement for your attorney to do that. Now, there are some areas where if you are doing something um, and your attorney never advised you of it, where it could be exculpating um, in terms of any punishment that, that were to arise, or if you specifically received advice that is contrary um, to, to law from one of your attorneys, um, that can also be, um, can provide a bit of a buffer there. Um, but for myself, um, I want to help you um, be the best commissioner that you want to be. And part of that is making sure that you have the information that you need to do your job appropriately. Thank and, you. Yeah, and I think that's both how myself and, and Mr. Salzman um, approach these types of positions. So. Ms. Kardash? Yes, sir. Uh, when we were all elected, we were given handbooks from mm -hmm. the city clerk, from the city attorney, in which I believe we signed off receiving them. Isn't that enough there? I mean, training going over everything's a different matter, but isn't it in the same sense that all this information has already been disclosed to us about our responsibilities and us 
reading on them to enact in, in a professional manner? Yes, essentially when you signed off that, you know, you received it, it, it does sort of indicate, you know, that you have received the information that you need to do. And um, you may notice um, in your folders, it's kind of in the back, but if you, if you look in your folders, um, I believe it's on the left-hand side, sort of towards the back, um, <coughs> there is a statement for um, all of you to sign that says that you um, – uh, have received some of this training and that you understand it. Um, now, you also have to keep in mind, too, that uh, you do check that box every year. You're required by law currently to file your Form 1, maybe Form 6, we'll see. Um, but you're, you're required by law to check that box that says that you received four hours of sunshine law, ethics, and public records training. And so you're certifying to the state that says, yes, I know how to do my job. Go ahead. <clears throat> Commissioner, it's, as you point out, it's very important that people read those things because honestly in a lawsuit, someone brings a lawsuit against the city and let's say it's an action of an individual commissioner. Well, a defense to the city is you signed off that you read that. You're assumed to have known that. And if you act in a willful and wanton manner contrary to the city and as you actually have in your codes, you could be out on your own. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you're aware that if you're signing off, that you read it, and if you have any questions, otherwise, and I think uh, you all were provided something that's going on in our community where individual commissioners could have their own responsibilities, paying their own attorney, paying any kind of judgment, because, yes, I acknowledge I knew, I read these things, and, though, and I still acted a different way. So it's helpful for the city may be not helpful for an individual commissioner if they don't follow those guidelines. Thank you. I have a question. This, this particular statement, which I assume you're trying to get us to sign, does it cover <laughs> the annual four hours of ethics training that this, we're This know, will cover. To... This is going to cover everything <clears throat> that you need for that, yes. All right. So I don't have to take another four hours from FLC. Not till next year. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I did go a little bit longer. I had really only intended for this to be about an hour long. Um, I, can we take about a 10-minute break before we then move into public records? 10 minutes. And then um, <clears throat> your next one will be on public records, and that will be about, um, just for the purpose of the clerks, maybe about 1230 or so is when we'll be planning on lunch. Yep. Is that right? Or does yep. that sound good? Yep. Okay. Uh, I could probably do it in 45 since we're running over a little. So, but we'll we'll see because I can always continue it after so lunch. Let's recess at 11:26 and reconvene at 11:36.
Right. What about if I... Perfect. Thank Is this you. where you were at? No. no. She was we were on, my at, other one. on the That's other one. one. Ms. Kardash, let me know when you're ready to go. Okay. Oops, sorry, man. <coughs> <coughs> you ready? Yes. Are we, we are reconvening at 11.40 a.m. Ms. Kardash? Thank you, Mayor. All right, after that fun sunshine law, now we get to get into some public records. So similar to Sunshine Law, public records is also a constitutional right of the people of Florida. Um, that's where it emanates from. And then Chapter 119 is where the state legislature <coughs> has given us some uh, additional information in terms of how to administer, how to operate um, under Florida's public records laws. There is um, an extensive section in Chapter 119 that deals with exemptions. Um, I will touch on some exemptions, but I'm not going to go in, into detail on them because there are many, and there are many that are also outside of um, Chapter 119 Florida statutes. Um, and, and part of the reason that it's important for you, if you ever do receive public records requests, to, not, to notify the city manager, <coughs> the city clerk, and myself, is because there are some specific things that you have to do um, sometimes and check and there's certain records that can be released and cannot be released and and it's just very important that you let us know if you ever receive a public records request so I'm going to start with just the basic what is a public record so this is the statutory definition of what is a public record and you can see it's rather long it's it's um, you know, encompassing, it's, it's basically anything. It doesn't matter what the form, the physical form is, what the characteristic of it is, or the means of transition, uh, transmission of the record, right? What's important is that it's made or, or, or received pursuant to law or ordinance, right? And that it's in connection with the transaction of official agency business. And similar to Sunshine Law, a lot of times um, this definition <coughs> is given a very broad and very wide scope by the courts. So this is a little bit more of a watered down definition that comes to us from case law and I like to kind of break it out like that because it, 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 it um, makes it a little bit more digestible. So basically it's any material, it doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter if, it, matter if it's paper, doesn't matter if it's a recording, a picture, a voicemail, um, text messages, all of that are going to come within the ambit of a record. Um, what's important is that it's um, prepared in connection with official agency business and that it's intended to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. And I like to use that example because, um, you know, you always have that example of personal notes where if you're sitting here and you're taking things to help you remember or help you um, organize your thoughts on something, right, and you don't share those with anybody, those are your notes. You're not communicating that knowledge. You're not communicating <coughs> that information. That is something that you have made for your own personal consumption. But if you then use that to create an official document, if you take that and you transmit it to somebody else, then you are sort of entering into the realm um, of, of this is going to be determined to be um, a, a public record. So what you're saying is if we prepare in some cases, detailed notes, mm -hmm. um, or in some cases, research 
on particular subjects for our own edification Correct. and don't transmit them to anybody else. Is that not still considered trying to formalize your knowledge? Yes, but you're not communicating it. Um, and that's usually a distinction that that is made is that it's something that you're not using to to perpetuate that knowledge for somebody else, right? That it's your own personal notes. Those are going to be your own document. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. What if you're communicating public knowledge? Uh, then, it, then it's going to fall within the realm of a public record. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just, just for clarification, I'm, I'm taking notes as you're speaking, <laughs> <laughs> and so are these notes public record? No, I'm sir, those are out. your notes. Those as are long as you're notes. not passing them to, to Commissioner Eisner or to the mayor, those are your notes. Okay. But once That's you clear. share them or, or to family and friends at home, then, <coughs> then you're also going to break that as well to, to, to your citizens. If you then transmit those notes to your citizens, then yes, then that's going to fall within the realm of, of a public record as well. Okay. So, but if you're the only one who ever sees them um, and it's just something for you to help you remember, then it, it's highly, highly unlikely that it's really going to fall under the definition of a, pu a public record because you're not using it to then communicate that knowledge elsewhere. Okay, so if... But if you use it to create an official document, then it, it could potentially, it will likely fall under this definition. And I say that because some of this hasn't really come out very strongly in case law in, in, no. as far as an interpretation. Okay, so, you know, oftentimes, uh, say at the planning and zoning, we would get printed material, big, thick printed material. Mm -hmm. And in there, I'm taking notes on the margins and things of questions I want to ask mm -hmm. staff. And then I leave those. Like, I don't take them with me. I never took them with me. So if I just left them at my spot, now I don't, I assume that they get picked up by staff at the end of the night or whatever. Um, is that an issue? Um, I am not aware of any case law that exists on that, and I have seen communities handle that different ways. Um, you know, some communities, uh, they actually, rather than providing the written materials, uh, provide like little iPads, and then everything you do is done on that iPad, and it's preserved, and, and they keep it, and you only get it during your actual meeting, right? Okay. That's, that's more of an uncommon practice, um, <coughs> and usually is um, for special districts and and, and smaller government entities where you kind of see that. Um, but then uh, there are some communities where when you do leave that, they will take it um, and some will preserve it. Some, I don't know where it goes into the black hole. Um, that's, that's up to them to deal with. Um, but I am not aware of any formal law that says that you have to, to take care of that. Now, if it's your property, right, you are the custodian of that record. And that's what I think is really important to remember is, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means to be a records custodian, because if it's your record, you are responsible for preserving that and for taking care of it. Um, and, and unless and until you transmit it to the city, it's your responsibility then. Right, so you're gonna be the person that's held to these standards and the city won't be liable for anything that happens with respect to that, that record, you will be, right? So what do you uh, recommend with regard to the material that's given to us that we might take notes on and do we take it with us and, and shred it ourselves or do we hand it over to the city clerk or, or what, what would you suggest? I would suggest that um, you take it with you, um, and then when you're finished with your term in office, that you turn it either turn it over to the city, or if it's something that you never shared with anybody else, um, to check the records retention schedule to see if it is something that you have to preserve. I'm not aware of how that would be treated. So for those of you that don't know, um, the Florida um, Department of State Division of Library Sciences actually publishes a record retention schedule, and in that record retention schedule, it identifies the record, you know, what level of government you're on, and then, um, sorry, <laughs> and then um, how long you are required to keep that record, um, and then when you're allowed to destroy it, right? So the destruction of public records 
does have to be reported to the state. Um, and that becomes very important because it actually is a criminal offense and it's a different criminal offense than just your general public records law violation to destroy, alter, or in other ways manipulate um, you know, public records. It, uh, in some cases it's a misdemeanor and in other cases it's actually a <coughs> felony. Um, and to destroy public records outside of that rec records retention schedule. Um, and then they actually have forms that you have to fill out and send to the Division of Library Sciences um, every time you, uh, you destroy uh, a public record that has reached the end of its life cycle. So it's really not something where you can just plenarily uh, have plenary authority to sort of throw out this paper. There are actually guidelines and standards that tell you how long you're required to keep this material. Um, and then one of the things that the law does tell us is that anyone who is in possession of a public record is deemed to be the custodian of that record, right? And because of the way that the attorney's fees provisions worked in this particular statute and in the law, um, what they actually found is that people were taking advantage of Florida's public records laws because there are some strict attorney's fees provisions um, that are assessed against communities who do violate Florida's public records laws, and in some cases um, against individuals who individually violate Florida's public records laws. And there were multiple attorneys, and there still are attorneys throughout this state, um, who unscrupul unscrupulously use these types of laws basically to make themselves rich by getting attorney's fees under this state statute. Well, the state legislature several years ago actually recognized that, and they made it a little bit harder and and, and not to get the records themselves, but to get the actual attorney's fees that go along with these types of violations because you were seeing like six, uh, six figure attorney's fee awards on a public records case. Like I saw one that was um, over $700,000. That's a lot of attorney's fees. Um, and so when you're dealing with stuff like that and that number where taxpayers are actually paying this bill to attorneys who are taking advantage of loopholes in the law, um, the legislature in, in their infinite wisdom saw that as bad public policy. So what they did is they put in the state statute the ability for communities to designate an official records custodian. Um, and I know that that is something that the city has done and your city clerk is your official records custodian, right? Um, and then one of the other things they did that made it a little bit harder to get attorney's fees in this case is that they did um, put in a notice provision that says you have to provide notice to the community. I think it's at least five days prior to filing suit on a public records claim. Okay. Ms. Kardashian, I know we've beaten up this question, but I, I just want <laughs> clarification. So I have notes, whether I made them before I came to a meeting or I'm jotting notes down during an agenda item. Mm -hmm. And during my, my portion of discussion, I may say, well, in my notes, so, so, and so, or I may, you know, basically read them out to the public and, and to the commission. Are they still my notes, or have they become public record at that time? They have become public record. After, after you read, I would say that, that that's that communication element, right, that then makes that uh, deemed a public record. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, with the recent spate of public record requests, <laughs> uh, some of them predate the time that we were elected to office. Yes. Um, but my understanding, anyway, is anything that predates our actual election date doesn't fall under public records at it, all. It, well, your candidacy. So when you're a candidacy, candidacy and you're a commissioner-elect, those records would fall under the public records because that is applicable to, to candidates for office as well. Um, and also, too, if you are, um, it, even if you're communicating as a citizen to the commission, now the, it, it's sort of like a continuing obligation. So folks who leave office and leave with public records and still have them and haven't properly turned them over to the city, then they are actually going to retain that individual liability. So when you have and you receive public records requests um, for uh, information and materials that are in the possession of a former commissioner and they refuse to turn them over despite the city attempting to get those types of records, then they as an individual are going to bear the brunt of those types of attorney's fee awards and um, th those types of, of penalties that can go along with this, including the criminal penalties. Yeah, I understand that 
okay. the former part. Right. It's the, we want records from 2019, and I wasn't elected till 2021. Well, those aren't public records. So they're not public records. No. All right. Yes, sir. So I've got to give me a, <clears throat> the hypothetical case. <laughs> you have a situation where a, a resident sends you <clears throat> um, a question, and you mm -hmm. send them back an answer that they don't like, but it's a public record that you're sending back. Yes. Okay. Um, and then they just decide, for argument's sake, they want to block you. How does the courts decide? You know, there's so much yet to be decided on social media, and you right. know this. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there is no real laws yet to decide on this. So we could be set up as well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, depending on um, whether or not uh, it, it's signed, and I'm actually going to a legislative update, uh, a virtual one tomorrow afternoon, um, to see what they have done with the social media bill, sure. um, you may actually be precluded from using that in your official capacity. Um, so that would kind of resolve the issue a little bit. But as it stands right now, um, you have the, um, again, as the public official, you have uh, the duty to preserve that. Um, you know, a lot of times what I encourage is like screenshotting um, or things like that um, to, to make sure that it's properly preserved. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times that doesn't happen, right? That's part of the reason too why, you know, when you're posting as a city, you know, as a policy, posting something where uh, the public can comment on it, that you have a mechanism in order to save that, to back it up, to make sure it becomes then a part of your official record, right? So that there's, there's not an issue there. Um, I'm a big fan of turning comments off. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, when you're posting something officially in your official capacity about official government business that is going to be deemed a public record, if you can't keep track of those comments, those shares, or all of that, then just turn it off. Okay. <laughs> i got to follow it up. up. <laughs> I understand all this, believe right. me very well, but we have situations out there where people clone people. I mean, um, people can misrepresent you Mm -hmm. They could pull a question. You can um, give something and mm -hmm. then have them be blocked. There is no way I could then go back and look at Regina Carter as she's blocked me. Right. There's no way I can get to you. I can't pull that. I can't copy that. Uh, or if I didn't have a record request at the time, why would I even think to make that copy yet? Well, that can get into some of the things we may be putting into your social media policy, which you do not have yet. I 100% right. agree. <laughs> Shut your Facebook off completely. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a fan of that, too. I, I know. I know. So, okay, I, um, I, I yes, sir. Have, uh, two comments. Um, yeah, on the, I got a, I'm sorry, I received a text from a uh, a citizen talking about their whatever their particular issue was mm -hmm. and I interacted with them to some extent and then eventually did the the proper thing of saying we are a policy board <laughs> I was like, the city manager was proud of me we are a policy <laughs> board the city manager runs the day-to-day -day operations I can't really help you now if it comes before the board of commissioners I will I will be a, a fair in, I'll intently listen to your right. issue and then I can make a decision at that time but right now it's not in my hands talk, a plus. To, talk to the man and he was happy and so <laughs> I mean I took a screenshot of all that and I sent it uh, over to Irene yes. and had, you know, and got myself covered on that. Right. So, but uh, like Denzel Washington said in Philadelphia, talk to me like I'm a third grader. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, I got this stuff. I know I'm harping on it, but I, I just need a like definitive answer. I got all this stuff you gave us. I've been taking notes on the margins of different things you're talking about. I have a pad here with notes. What do I do with these things? Do I take keep them home, it. stick them in a box, and yes. keep them there forever? Yes. Well, okay. You don't have to keep them forever. forever or whenever. <laughs> okay. So tell me exactly what to do. Um, you want to make sure that you preserve it appropriately until its useful life has ended. 
Okay. So, <laughs> that's the, the third grade answer. <laughs> so I take them, I put them in a box. At my, I'll, go, I'll go in my office. I'll have a box for my city stuff. I will take this and throw that in the box. So and then, I and then would, what do I do with this box? Anything that you are keeping, again, that, that you, you believe is for your personal use, that you are not using to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge, okay. um, I would keep separately from your other materials and documents. So because this is really an informational training, I am giving you information. You are taking this information um, in order to use it in the conduct um, of your official business, right? But you're not going to be taking it and using it to, you know, write something or give it to other people. No. That's one thing. You're not perpetuating that knowledge. You're keeping it for yourself, for your use, for your future reference, right? Take it home, put it in a box. And right. leave it there and until I'm out of office and I can hand it over the box to Irene or whoever. Correct. Okay, thank you. Third great answer. <laughs> Attorney Kardash, uh, going back to uh, what Vice Mayor Lunt was asking. Yes. Uh, prior to becoming, uh, I know some ha weren't on a board before, but can you go explain to them, too, the reason why if they served on a board, that would also be public record? Ah, uh, Yes. Um, yeah, public records are public records irres irrespective of whether, you know, you're a board member, whether you're an employee. So public records applies to all your board business. So um, even if you get a current request um, in your position as commissioner and you did serve on a prior board, um, then public records still applied to you within the context of that prior board service. So that is something that's important to remember. I have a, just a really sideways question. Okay. You keep talking about screenshots for text messages, et cetera. Uh -huh. I tend to use a program called Textra, mm -hmm. which exports my text. It keeps date and time and, and different information, but it's definitely not a screenshot. It probably has more metadata attached to it than a screenshot. Is that allowable? Um, that's, that's allowable. And one thing I do want to point out is that um, metadata actually is part and is covered actually, actually extensively. There's lots of cases on it. Um, and I am not a particularly tech savvy person, right? So the first time I saw a case with metadata, I had no idea what it was. I had to have somebody explain to me what data, what metadata meant and what it means. Um, and when you do have public records that have metadata attached to them, um, that metadata does constitute a record that is subject to um, to this this law. Okay, so the only metadata that's going to be attached to a screenshot is the day the screenshot was made. Correct. And, you know, the whatever, the uh, resolution of the screenshot, that sort of stuff. Right. Whereas the records I'm producing actually has... More information. More information right. than that. So that's acceptable? Good. It's, it's acceptable. Because it's Absolutely. ridiculous trying to go through and screenshot everything. This program just allows you to export it. Uh, um, usually I find the, the screenshotting um, technique to um, be a little bit more efficient sort of like in the moment, right? Um, because you may not always remember to, to go back and do that or to go back and vet it. But if you just remember, shot it you know, email it, copy to the clerk, because I believe in your rules of procedure, you do have something that says you're supposed to turn over all of those types of things to the clerk. Um, so if you kind of do it a little bit more in real time, it can um, eliminate the, oh, I forgot, oh, I missed it, oh, now somehow the record's gone, right? So. I never erase anything. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the scope of the Public Records Act, um, because I always do like to point out that it is not um, just applicable to public officials. It is applicable to private entities that serve either in a delegated, um, a delegated position where you are delegating authority or um, uh, they are acting on your behalf. Um, the legislature also did address this in Chapter 119, where they actually have required language 
um, that's been around, I want to say, since 2011 or 2012 that you are supposed to have in every city contract where they are performing services or um, some government function on behalf of your community, right? And so there's very detailed information that is supposed to have, um, it even tells you the font that it has to be in within, within your city and your government contracts. Um, and uh, there is an onus on these contractors to preserve these records and to turn them over to you. And they, they can be subject to their own penalties for failing to respond or refusing to provide um, any records to the city after you have notified them um, of a public records request that you have received and they have records that are in their possession. Um, one of the things that I also kind of typically like to do is sort of tell them, look, at the end of this contract, just give the records to the city and then you don't have to worry about it. Otherwise, they are responsible and essentially in the same shoes as the government entity um, to keep and to preserve those records um, and to respond to records requests that they receive, whether it's it's directly from, from the city or directly from the requester. Um, they do have to provide those and there can be actions and obligations to implead third parties into litigation where they possess records um, that are responsive to requests that you may receive. And, and Andy, please, if you um, want to chime in on any of this, uh, go, please no, go ahead. All right. <laughs> So, and I'm going to talk uh, a little a little bit now about um, exemptions that are permitted by state statute. So, there's actually two types of exemptions. There are um, ones that are just generally deemed exempt, um, and those actually can be released in the discretion of the agency. So, if a record and the and the statutory language just says that the record is exempt from sunshine, you actually do still have the option if you choose to to release that record. Records that are deemed confidential cannot be released, and in many cases, um, there may be criminal penalties with releasing records that are deemed uh, by state statute um, to be confidential. And I specifically say by state statute um, because if you are claiming that, there, that a record is exempt or confidential, you have to say that in writing and you have to provide what law you are relying on for that exemption. Um, and another thing that becomes important about that is that these confidential um, and exemptions under state statute do not apply to the entirety of the record. They will only apply to that specific <coughs> portion of the record that is covered by the statutory language. So sometimes you'll see records that are released that have certain things like blocked out um, and then uh, like a citation to the authority or a letter explaining this was pursuant to XYZ statute or XYZ law that this cannot be released, right? And this becomes very important when you are dealing with police records. Police records are some of the most tedious, those and also um, EMS and, and fire records are the same way, right? Because you're dealing with people's confidential medical information, um, you're dealing with people who are victims of crimes. Those are some very important and some very hefty exemptions um, that uh, are applied under state law. And if you don't properly take the time to go through um, and, and redact that, there can be some severe criminal penalties for improperly releasing that type of information. So it's very important that when you have people who are redacting your police and fire records, um, that they really know what they're doing and are doing so in accordance with state law. So we actually have two very long pages of um, case law to cover for um, our, our public records portion here. <clears throat> so you'll notice the very first one there, uh, it's Tallahassee case, and it is the Police Benevolent Association. And this is a Marcy's Law case. What you had here was um, an officer involved shooting where the officer was deemed to, or at least preliminarily, pending the investigation of the state attorney for that area, um, deemed to have been acting in self-defense and, and therefore deemed to be a victim of the crime. Um, and uh, they, they, the city of Tallahassee and, and the Benevolent Association sought um, declaratory relief from the court to say, hey, um, can we even release this or is this officer um, considered a victim under Marcy's law? 
And the court emphatically said yes, um, that Marcy's law applies. But what they did do was qualify that and said that, that that application of Marcy's law could be lost. And that could be lost in the event that the state attorney's office revealed that no, this was not a self act of self-defense. He was not in fact a victim or, or something of that nature, right? So it's not something that's just going to plenary, plen uh, apply automatically, right? It can, it, it doesn't continue on. Um, it can be lost if the investigation reveals um, that, uh, that the officer was not, in fact, um, a victim. Uh, the next case down, the city of St. Petersburg uh, versus Dorchester Holdings. So there was an empty lot in the city of St. Pete, and there was illegal dumping going on um, on that lot. And so the city, through their code enforcement, went ahead and stepped in um, in an attempt to remediate and stop the illegal dumping that was going on. And um, the, the property owner um, started uh, propounding the city with like all these public records requests, like request after request after request, right? And the request resulted in over 146,000 emails, and that's just the emails, right? Over 146,000 emails um, alone, not to mention all the other records that were responsive to the request. Um, and the, um, the cost uh, to the city that they cited to the person was six figures. It was well over six figures. I want to say probably close to half a million dollars that the city was requesting from the records requester um, in order to review and redact and, and produce these records and copy them to the records requester. And so they kind of got fed up with that. And they're like, well, no, we're just going to sue and we're going to figure this out in court. Um, unfortunately, what the court sort of did in this situation um, wasn't really helpful in terms of giving us guidance. The court did find um, that the cost to produce the records was unreasonable, um, that it was not in line with public records laws, um, and remanded the case and pretty much ordered the parties to work together to, f to figure it out, right? So how you can narrow the request, how you could get the cost of producing these records down, and, and that's what's come to us um, in 2021 from the second DCA. Um, the next one down, the Miami-Dade College versus Nader case. Um, in this particular case, you had uh, a contractor uh, of Miami-Dade College who was making uh, public records requests. And uh, the, the college just said, no, we're, we're not going to give them to you. You know, you sue us if you want them. So they did. They sued. Um, and in court, they actually got the records that they were requesting as part of the discovery process. And then after the, the records were produced to the contractor during discovery, uh, Miami-Dade College came back and said, oh, by the way, uh, you owe us $200,000 for the production of these records. And the court said, no, they don't. Um, they don't have to give you that because you never told them up front. You never told them before you produced and gave them the records um, that uh, there was going to be the substantial charge for giving you the records. So we're not going to now turn around on the back end and give you a, a monetary award okay. and a monetary relief for producing records that you should have produced in the first place. So um, this next case is a little interesting. Uh, the City of Sunny Isles Beach versus Gatto. Um, this is one of the ones that comes to us from the pandemic-era pandemic Zoom meetings. Um, during a City of Sunny Isles uh, Beach commission meeting, you had um, a, a commissioner that was texting um, during the meeting while there was discussion. They were, they were seen right on the video doing whatever they were doing. and, and um, the uh, members of the public did go ahead and make up public records requests for that commissioner's texts. And originally, um, they did not produce them and said, you know, these aren't a public record. The argument was that because you were texting during a public meeting, that yes, it does constitute um, a, a public record. And the court said, um, you know, that's not necessarily true. So in the lower court, um, they did an in-camera review. So if you're not familiar with how public law cases kind of progress, is um, there's an in-camera review by the judge to determine whether or not the records that are being requested do fall within the scope of um, the public records laws, and then you kind of go from there. Um, and at the trial court level, uh, the judge said, yeah, all these text messages are public record, and you have to turn them over. Well, the city um, took issue with half 
actually half of, of those records. Some of them they conceded were actually public records because it was communications between the commissioner and a citizen regarding public business. And so there was a, a clear line there where the court said, yes, this is absolutely, and, and, the, um, and the appellate court, the third DCA, did uphold that and say, yeah, these ones with this citizen were public records. However, they overturned it with respect to the communication between the commis commissioner and her husband. So she was also, in addition to texting a citizen about public business, was also texting with her husband. And when the court reviewed these records, they looked at them and they said, no, these are purely private communications. You know, they're not, they're, they're not covering anything related to what was going on um, with the commission. However, the court does point out that once you cross that boundary, right, it, it says, um, that, that the text be between the commissioner and her husband did not touch on public business. Um, but if he moved out of his role as husband and into Joe Citizen and started to engage in public discourse and make comments regarding public business, that yes, these absolutely would have been deemed public records and deemed to be subject to disclosure under Florida public records laws. Um, so, you know, at the time he was not seeking to influence or engage um, in public comment, so there was no question there, but that is something that can be lost, um, you know, so, but the court also did emphasize the fact too that just because the text messages were occurring during a public meeting, they did not necessarily step into that realm because they were not about public business. Uh, the next case down, um, this one kind of goes into a little bit about what I was just talking about in terms of an in-camera review. This case actually comes from the Armour Correctional Health Services. There was a video post-arrest. Um, I Unfortunately, I think the um, individual that was the, the subject of, of the video actually did pass away, so it was like a wrongful death case. And they were trying to get the video from the, the, the um, jail health services, um, who again, even though it was a private entity, they were performing a, a public function. Um, and they did a public records request, the Human Rights Defense Center did a public records request for the video of what happened after the um, arrest to this individual. Um, and uh, they refused to release those records. The Human Rights Defense Center sued. Um, and the trial judge said, you know, no, that's not a public record, you can't get it. Well, they appealed and the appellate court said that the right to access public records is of a constitutional magnitude. Disclosure is not a discretionary act, and they remanded it back to the trial court because the trial court never did an evidentiary hearing and never conducted an in-camera review of the actual videos to determine whether or not they were um, a public record and what portions, again, because the entire record um, is not necessarily um, confidential and exempt, only those specific portions that are granted that statutory exemption are deemed to be um, confidential and exempt. So there could have been other parts that were subject to release and, and the appellate court said, no, judge, you have to conduct this evidentiary hearing and review the records before you make that determination. Um, all right, next cases. So some of these um, are a little I interesting and a little bit more um, political and, and current. So the very first one there, the Florida Department of Health v. Smith, um, in this case, uh, it, it's again one of these pandemic 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 era cases um, where there were uh, public records requ requests, and the um, plaintiff wanted to conduct a deposition of the Florida Surgeon General, uh, Mr. Lapido, and um, the Florida Department of Health filed for a protective order. Um, to prevent his, his deposition, and the court said, no, you're not getting your protective order. He's the custodian of these records. You have the right to depose him, um, and that there's no e irreparable harm by allowing this deposition to continue. So that's that first case. Then you have um, O'Boyle versus the town of Gulfstream. Um, I like this case. 
it says that you don't get attorney's fees for litigating attorney's fees. <laughs> so if the only thing you're litigating in your public records case is attorney's fees, you do not uh, get to claim those attorney's fees um, against the other side. So that's, that's we're really happy with that particular case. And again, they're, they're looking at it through the lens of, you know, this is public money. This is taxpayer money that is funding this. Um, and so you shouldn't be entitled to, to attorney's fees for litigating over how much attorney's fees you get. Um, so then you have the Florida Center for Government um, Accountability versus the Executive Office of the Governor. Um, so this case is currently pending in the First District Court of Appeal. Um, what the actual records request was for um, is what they kind of call the Martha's Vineyard texts, right? So these were text messages that occurred um, between the governor and other individuals um, when they made that decision to um, bring some in individuals up to um, Martha's Vineyard. Um, and the governor's office um, did not release all the records uh, that surrounded that. They asked for all kinds of things, you know, text messages, emails, um, things of that nature. And um, the court, the trial court, did say that the partial production of those records was unreasonable. Um, and now that appeal the, um, is pending uh, before the first DCA. So we'll get to see what, what they decide on that. Um, and then this last one, um, Doe versus DeSantis et al. Um, this is another one that is currently pending um, and is rather interesting because depending on what the first DCA does is it could overturn a longstanding rule in, um, in case law interpretation, I believe from the Florida Supreme Court um, regarding public records that you do not have the right to request or know the identity of the person requesting the records, right? That's one of the no-nos. You don't ask who's asking for it. Right, that's something that you're not supposed to do is ask the identity of the requester or really the reason why they want the record because it's a constitutional right. So it doesn't really matter why they want it. It doesn't really matter who they are. It's a constitutional right for them to have access to the records. Well, in this particular case, it stems from um, some statements that the governor made in September regarding his Florida Supreme Court appointments. And if you're not familiar with judicial appointments or the way that judicial appointments are made in Florida, it is a public process. We have judicial nominating commissions um, where they interview candidates who go up to the governor for appointment. You are permitted as members of the public to sit in and to be present, just like any other government meeting, to see what is going on um, in the appointment of judges, and, and that applies all the way up. So what happened in this particular case is um, the governor made statements that he had um, a group of experts that were interviewing his Supreme Court justice candidates for him and, and essentially making a recommendation. So we know from Sunshine Law that you, know, you, you can't do that. It essentially would have been a Sunshine Board, right? And so these individuals, um, whoever J. Doe is or are, whether it's one person or a group of people, um, made public records requests for the names of the individuals that the governor was using to vet Florida's Supreme Court justice candidates. And um, so far, they have refused to release that um, information. And uh, the 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 court, what they what they asked the court for is called a writ of mandamus. And uh, the judge, the trial judge in this case, said that he will not issue a writ of mandamus for uh, an anonymous email address, is what he said. And so um, J. Doe, whoever he or she or they are, um, decided to go ahead and appeal that to the first DCA, and that case is pending. Regina. Yes. Hypothetical again. You get a... Um, anonymous mm. record request mm. and yes. you respond that I think it's you and I respond back to you not so nice what happens then <clears throat> well whether or not it's nice may not mean whether or not it's a violation of the law right okay. um, but what I usually like to say is that if you get um, 
a request for records, uh, the answer is never no. <laughs> the answer is thank you for your request, we will get back to you, right? At which case you engage either myself, the city manager, or the city clerk to assist you in, in responding to that records request, right? Um, because there are certain things you can say or certain, certain things that you could do that would then um, expose either you individually or the city um, to that attorney's fee award that um, I was sort of, uh, that I was discussing, right? So, um, that's why you always kind of want help. And one of the first things that I always say, it's right up there, do not ask the identity of the requester, right? Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter why they want it. And we'll see whether or not that, that particular law of the land and of the state of Florida changes here in the near future. So that's just asking. What about accusing? Well, accusations aren't a request. Um, so that's an, an accusation is an accusation that is not a request for records. <coughs> and that's, that's not what I'm yeah. saying. Accusing you, can, you of what? If you get a anonymous record request and I believe it's you and I respond back to you. Mm. Um, whether or not you believe it's me or, or anyone else, I always um, respond back to the source, right? So if I get an email address, somebody because typically that's what people will use if they want to do an anonymous one they typically will use email right, right. so if they want to take that and they want to send me the request via that email i respond to that email i don't go out and find some other you know ip address or try and source it that way if there's an issue that needs to be dealt with with that level of investigation typically it's going to be something that i refer to the police department anyway gotcha yeah okay. um so but but yeah i i would not substitute um, a belief as to the identity of the requester because that could also, and, and, and this is just an opinion because I don't really think there's anything out there on that, um, is that uh, you could be substituting your belief about the identity and therefore revealing the identity of a requester who desires to remain anonymous um, for whatever reason. Um, so within that realm, here's a couple things um, that I like for you all to keep in mind. Uh, you can't make a records requester write it down. The reality is, is most of the ones that you will receive nowadays um, are coming in through email or some other written source via letter, courier pigeon, I don't know, but typically you receive them in writing. Um, when you do get ones that are oral, so if somebody is calling you over the phone, they don't want to give their name, right? Because a, a lot of times, especially the people who are doing this to get attorney's fees, will play these little games to, to try and kind of catch you on the, on the sly, right? Um, you know, you get a phone call from somebody who doesn't want to identify themselves as asking you for a record, right? The, the best thing to do is ask, don't ask them who they are. Just say, how do you want me to respond to you? So, um, and you could kind of see that, I know, what was it, the First Amendment Foundation? Um, they would do like these, or like that audit, the audit site, right? Um, where they'll come in with like their little cameras and, and um, try and put, you know, your employees and your public officials on the spot, you know, to do some of that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll try to get you to violate some, some of, of these sort of guidelines that are out there and responding to these things. And that is a common one, write down the request. You are not required to write down a public records request to respond to it. So, um, the other thing too, I kind of already touched on it that exceptions to, uh, must be identified in writing with cita citation to the legal authority. Um, confidential material can't be released. Also, too, the records request must be sufficiently clear to identify the records that they're actually requesting. Um, so they can't make like these broad sweeping uh, requests that aren't actually identifying a record that the city holds. That's not a valid records request. You can ask for that clarification. Um, if you can't, if you don't understand what they're asking for, you can say, what is it that, that you're asking for? How, you know, help me figure out what it is that you want, right? Um, also too, I kind of already covered and mentioned that you don't have to create um, a record that does not exist. So if they're asking you for something and saying you have to have X, Y, Z, and then it's, it's not a record that exists within the city, we do not have to produce that record in order to turn it over to them. And that becomes important because public records requests 
are not requests for information. You are not required to provide information under this constitutional section. Information is a different animal, right? The city is not required to provide that information, particularly anonymously, um, to, to people who are making these types of public records requests, especially if they're, they're doing it with these types of motives um, in order to, to get money or some exact sort, some sort of vengeance, whatever the case may be, right? Um, you don't have to give them information. You can just give them the record, and you are not under any obligation to actually explain that record to them, right? Now... A, a deposition is a different animal then too, right? But <laughs> that's that's different. But um, ultimately, you are not required to provide information. Um, but then the bottom line here is you don't refuse a public records request. You say thank you. Um, let me get back to you to get to to get with somebody to assist you um, in responding to that request. So. And I am at the end of this particular portion. I think just the last one is the penalties for violation of public records laws. And these are very specific to um, the constitutional and chapter 119 violations. Um, later, after the ethics portion, I am going to cover some criminal statutes with um, respect to records um, and, and intentional records destruction. So, yes, Mayor. Um. Could you say, I've got two questions. One, a little bit on transitory records. Um, for example, um, hey, are you going to be at this thing next week or something like that? That, um, you know, you're asking somebody about that and that's, you're creating a public record, but the, but it's not really of value. There's some something in there about transitory public records. Yeah, typically with things like that that are scheduling matters that, that aren't really reflecting a, a solid policy or, or something like that of the city or official action of the city, um, those aren't really the intent of what's supposed to be covered here, correct? Um, and that leads to the next thing. I, I, it's hard for me to believe that um, and I'm not saying it, that's not the way it is, but it's hard for me to believe that a person could walk up to me and say, okay, I'd like to have all the emails that you've sent to um, the Florida League of Cities. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then I said, okay, fine, and then I'll go to the clerk. But the, the fact is if I don't hold those, for example, if we abide by our rules, that the clerk has them, mm -hmm. and that response is coming, that request is coming into me, and I've done my job. How am I responsible for that records request if I've turned everything over that I've already had to the city? I thought that it was the city's. Right. Okay. Y you are correct, sir. What you actually um, can do is say, you know, thank you for your records request. Our official records custodian. Um, is Irene Jacobs, our city clerk. Please contact her, and she will assist you in procuring the records that you're looking for. That would be a good way to handle that because then you've directed them to your official records custodian that you've designated pursuant to state law um, to then answer on behalf of the city. Because I, I get records requests to me in my name, and right. usually it's copied sure. to somebody in the city, mm -hmm. and then we get records requests to the city of Tarpon Springs that um, in, may involve communications from the mayor or whatever. I see that, but I just don't see just like, I mean, from a legal perspective, some guy said, you know, comes up to the commission meeting, you know, says, I asked Mayor Vatikiotis for all his emails on this thing. He just wasn't responsive to me. And I said, well, no, I, you never asked me anything. I mean, it, it's like, how does that all get cleared up? Right. Um, so one of the things you have to remember, and I'd actually kind of have to do a little bit of a deeper dive on this particular rule and its application to public records, but some of that actually stems from a time in society where not everybody could read and write. And there's actually a lot of things in the law, you know, the, the fact that you have to read things orally when you are charging people in criminal court, you have to read out the charges against them, and that does stem from a time in society where people couldn't read and write and couldn't necessarily understand, you know, what you were handing them, um, you know, in writing. So I, I'm not actually 100% positive where that particular you don't have to write it down rule stems from. It's something that's been in existence for as long as I've been practicing in this area of law um, and is kind of in line with other things um, in the law that you see um, where the oral exchange is considered um, sufficient. Yes. Let me tee off what he just, what the mayor just said. <laughs> Someone comes up and asks myself or the mayor 
for a record request. We don't hear it. Well, I'll, I'll let Andy. Yeah. First off, the law has changed, okay? And it used to be that anybody could come in to anyone and they would go to your maintenance person and say, hey, mm -hmm. can I have the public records? Yeah. And then when you didn't have them, they file suit, and then it's attorney's fees, exactly. right? <laughs> That's changed. When you, when you declare and post that there is a records custodian, and as the mayor said, you go to Irene. We have a records custodian. Go ask that. You've covered yourself. But you didn't hear it. That's, again, I can't sue the city. Well, I can, but I won't get anywhere <laughs> if I'm, if it's posted on the website who the records custodian is. So even though I'm asking you and you don't give them to me, that's, I'm doing it improperly for, for purposes of forcing you to give me a record. I, I hear what you're saying. There's just so many variables <laughs> to this true. mess. Well, that and that's why I said what, what's legally protective from a lawsuit is how I'm looking at it. I know the process is people will do that. Um, you just, and I can't say anything if you didn't hear them. Um, I'm deaf in one ear, so, uh, you know, I understand that. <laughs> before, before we break for lunch... Um, you know, besides the exorbitant salary that we receive as elected <laughs> officials, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's this, all this stuff is very informative, but it's also scary. Yes. Because, <laughs> you, you know, we, <laughs> <laughs> this might be the shortest tenure ever. <laughs> no, I think God, one guy stayed for two weeks, so. But I, I don't think I could have the record. But you no, know, in, in all seriousness, it's it's scary because it's so serious, and these penalties and punishments and and all this. And then we want to encourage people to, you know, step up and be civic leaders and and do all these things. And then it's it's tough. I mean, it really is. It's just a comment. I don't have you to answer anything, well, but it, it really is tough. And and. I actually do have an answer okay, on that. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> so yeah, it, yes. it actually gets down to um, what exactly what you're saying is that, you know, the, the, the government doesn't want to discourage people, especially people who want to provide those honest services, from serving efficiently and effectively in government. And the reality is, is there is a lot of exposure when you are serving in these public positions um, in terms of people who, who come after you. That's part of why we have... Uh, criminal statutes that address threats against public officials, right? Because there is a certain level of exposure there. Um, but what the, the courts have said, particularly in the realm of case law, is that they do offer um, recourse for individuals who are acting um, as as um, proper w within the realm of the public trust and the proper performance of their duties, doing what they're supposed to be doing, have that ability to seek that recourse um, to get their attorney's fees back and to have that representation that's funded through taxpayer money. But that always becomes the issue is that you're acting within the proper performance of your public duties. Because when you step outside of that role, then you're not acting and doing what the people elected you to do. So then there's no en entitlement to uh, taxpayer funded representation. I, I want to tee off of what John just said. Mm -hmm. um, for the $8,000 or so, you're making yourself a target. And truthfully, with all the variables that I've listened to, um, I'm sure you realize this being an attorney, mm -hmm. there are people out there that are trying to zero in on that target. Um, so it does make it very hard for people to want to do the type of job and also take the, uh, the you have to be a part-time attorney, mm -hmm. you have to be a part-time decision maker, you have to be a statesman. I mean, there's, I could go on um, listening to all of the requests that we need to know from people just coming up and asking us and not knowing whether we heard it or not. Um, yet, it's, it's, there should be more um, checks and balances mm -hmm for the system to not be abused because the more variations that come about, mm -hmm. the more um, the more venue for abuse. That's 
not very, just the very way. Very true. Well, it's part of the reason why folks like Andy and I, and I know the people at my firm, do what we do, right? It's because we believe um, that public service um, is a calling, um, and it's a calling for people who who want to do it and want to do it, you know, the right way, um, and want to be um, servants to their community, essentially, because that's what you're doing, um, and and you're not just servants, but you're also leaders, um, and people who who really understand and appreciate leadership do understand that that sometimes um, the the best leaders are uh, servants to their community. The worst part about it is, is that the legislature who writes all these laws exempts themselves from it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the sad part about it. Um, Ms. Kardashian, yes, are, are, you, are you saying that you're done now with your portion? I am. Uh, so, no, I have um, ethics afterwards, right. after lunch. After lunch, and so um, we're ready to break for lunch. Um, Ms. Jacobs, are you ready? ready? Okay, do you want to go over what, um, I was thinking a half an hour for lunch, and can you go over what we need to do? It, it's available. Uh, between, uh, in, what do you call that space? Yeah. Uh, or it's in, office. it's yeah, in the city, lunch is in the city manager's um, conference room, right? I'm hosting, my tables and stuff are available, so <laughs> okay. I clean All them. Right. <laughs> and we'll see you back at, um, Half an hour from now at 110. Yep. We'll reconvene at 110.
before I said I'll wait. All right. <laughs> Got my pool light thing. Yeah. Everybody ready? Ms. Jacobs, your son? Okay, we're reconvening at 113, um, the work session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs. Uh, I do have one announcement um, before we get on with the ethics presentation. Um, Mr. Salzman and I had a conversation and he had already spoken to Ms. Kardash about this, about um, the schedule today and one of the purpose one of the reasons for this meeting is obviously item seven um, so what we would like to do unless a commissioner has an objection that we can discuss it is to complete the ethics agenda item and then move on to item seven so that we don't wind up running out of time on that particular item uh, does any commissioner have any objection to that are we specifically time limited today it, it's just Mr. Salzman, do you want to have any comment on that? Well, I, it may take a while, and the other issues are things that we could either do afterwards if we have time, or, I mean, one of the parts of having the meeting was to resolve this issue and bring it forward. Um, the other issues can actually, if they had to, can be done at, you know, at 20 minutes during a, a at the end <coughs> of the meeting. So the, there are things that we can do that after Regina finishes hers, because that's part of the four-hour training so we want to get that through okay you okay with that I'm fine okay why don't we proceed uh, then Ms. Kardash thank you <clears throat> well good afternoon 
Um, so we are going to go ahead and dive into, I don't see it up yet. And, and Ms. Kardash, just for the record, this, compl this, this section completes the four hour training. Is that the purpose Correct. of it? Okay, <clears throat> got it. Yeah, that, that'll be the purpose of, of this mm -hmm. year. So I don't see my PowerPoint up. All right, so on to Florida's ethics laws. So um, you see sort of the motto there, um, it actually does stem from the Constitution, a public office is a public trust. Um, I also published a, an article um, with that title last year in Stetson's Law Review in the, the March 2022 um, Stetson's Local Government Law Symposium Law Review. <clears throat> and the purpose is to make sure that Florida's elected officials um, act in a manner that is um, appropriate and um, preserves the integrity of the proper conduct of government business. Um, one of the sections that I'm going to go over a little bit more in depth is Article 2, Section 8 of the Florida Constitution, which is actually what my paper was about. Um, and that particular section actually creates the uh, Florida Commission on Ethics. Um, and the bulk of it was actually enacted in 1976 under what was known as the Sunshine Amendment um, to create an independent body, which is the Commission on Ethics, in order to um, investigate and uh, uh, produce opinions and levy penalties for violations of Florida ethics laws. Um, in 2018, after the Constitutional Revision Commission, they made some amendments to Article 2, Section 8. And the reason <clears throat> I really kind of like to bring that up is because 78% of Florida's voters passed that specific constitutional amendment. It's one of the highest um, percentages of, of affirmative Florida votes for constitutional amendments, and that's a little little over six million um, Florida registered voters that said that we want to make sure that um, our public officials in this state are acting in accordance with these rules and guidelines. Um, and then uh, you also have uh, Part 3 of Chapter 112 Florida Statutes, which has more ethics regulations and some more specific applications. Um, regarding Florida's ethics laws and the specific provisions that both public officials and public employees um, are required to abide by um, in the conduct of their business. <clears throat> and I'd like to talk for a minute about the composition of the Florida Commission on Ethics. It's actually composed of nine members, um, five of which are actually appointed um, by the governor. And there's some interesting rules, which I kind of like to go over a little bit in terms of who actually sits on this commission, because they serve two year terms and they're term limited to two consecutive terms um, on the commission. The Florida governor, like I said, appoints five, but only three of them can be from the same political party. And one of them has to be a former um, city or county official or employee. Then there's two that can be appointed by the president of, of the Senate and two by the Speaker of the House. Um, and only one uh, of those appointments for each of them can be from the same political party as well. And none of the individuals that currently sit are currently sitting on the Florida Commission on Ethics are permitted to be public employees um, of any uh, uh, subdivision of the state of Florida or state agency. So that also is incredibly um, Im important as well. Um, the other thing that I also like to point out is that <clears throat> currently the penalties that surround Florida's ethics laws are civil in nature. And um, up until 1974, they were actually criminal. So after 1974, they took them out of the, the realm of criminal conduct um, and made them civil penalties. Um, and there has been, um, <clears throat> and there's, there's a couple really good reasons for that, one of which is it lessened both the intent um, with respect to violations of Florida's ethics laws, um, and two was that it also lessened the burden of proof that is, is required in order to prove a violation of Florida's ethics laws. Um, and now they really are uh, um, civil in nature, um, and we'll talk a little bit more um, about kind of what that means in, in sort of the grand scheme of how these are applied and implemented. Okay. 
So here's the two main amendments that, that uh, came to Article 2, Section 8 of the Florida Constitution. You do have a, a full copy of that provision um, in your folder. Uh, I did go ahead and provide that to you so you can look and see what it actually says. First is the abuse of public position. Um, and then the second is the lobbying restrictions. So it used to be it only applied predom well, predom uh, predominantly to state officials. There was a prohibition for two years after leaving office from, from returning to, to lobby um, when you were leaving any sort of state, state office or employment. They went ahead and they specifically extended that in the amendment to um, local governing bodies such as counties and municipalities. And then they also extended that prohibition from two years to six years. So for six years after you leave office, um, you're no longer permitted to, to lobby for compensation before your former governing body. And that took effect um, beginning December uh, of 2022. <clears throat> the what the, the provision on abuse of public office says is that public officers and employees are, are prohibited from abusing their public position in order to obtain a disproportionate benefit for themselves, their spouse, their child, or a business with which they are affiliated. And so one thing I, I do want to point out is when they have that, they have that specific classification of who can receive that benefit. And then when you look at the law, it actually does charge the Commission on Ethics um, with defining what a disproportionate benefit is. And then they also, in the constitutional amendment, um, directed the Commission on Ethics uh, to determine the intent that is required to violate this constitutional provision. And what we received from the Commission on Ethics is this particular rule. And what it does is put folks on notice that these are the six factors um, that will be examined when they are looking at whether or not um, an action that you, you took was intended to give a disproportionate benefit to yourself or one of those categories of people that was listed um, in, in the Constitution. And then the d d intent that they defined is actually a very interesting level intent because where you have criminal laws and criminal statutes that require a certain level of specific intent to violate the law, the only intent that is required here is an intent that is inconsistent with the proper performance of your public duties. And that's something you know we kind of talked a little bit um, about here already today. So that is the intent that they will um, look at to, to see whether or not you um, intended to abuse your, your public office. <clears throat> and when I also talked about the standard, um, there's really a clear and convincing evidence standard with the criminal law provisions that were in effect prior to um, 1974. Any criminal law has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So when you're, you're, you move from that criminal realm into the civil, civil realm, that burden of proof is lessened. So you actually don't have to prove that this was um, committed with this intent beyond a reasonable, a reasonable doubt. There only has to be clear and convincing evidence that you intended to act inconsistent with your public duties. Um, and what's interesting here is that in 2000, when Jeb Bush was governor, um, he convened um, a, a committee to basically research this throughout the state. And this <laughs> committee came back and they published some recommendations um, about what would help the state of Florida and the public officials of the state of Florida. Um, and one of the big things that they, they did say, say is that there are certain items within the Florida Ethics Code that should return to criminal penalties. Um, and also, too, that the um, financial penalty of $10,000 is really inconsequential to today's public officials um, because these really those penalties and things were really enacted in the 70s, and that $10,000 really isn't a meaning penalty or a meaningful deterrent to some public public officials, because that applies regardless of what level of government you know you, you serve in. Um, and they recommended increasing that penalty from $10,000 to $100,000. 
Then in 2010, um, Charlie Crist convened a, another committee that took the work that that committee did, did the same thing again, and then expounded on it and said, not only do we adopt what they, the, what their, their findings and what they were proposing in 2000, but we are also going to propose the same thing. There, need to, there needs to be criminal penalties in order for there to be a sufficient deterrent um, to public officials who want to act on ethically, and also that there should be higher penalties because the, the $10,000 per act penalty does not seem to be a sufficient deterrent um, for public officials who intend to um, violate the law. So I kind of break these down into some of these broader categories, into four general categories uh, of ethical conduct. One is pro uh, prohibited conduct, voting conflicts, prohibited business and employment practices, and then um, financial disclosure, disclosure basics. Genu genuinely, under the law, there's really only two major categories. One is what certain acts that are prohibited and prohibiting certain acts. And then the second category that the law recognizes um, is requiring certain disclosures, um, such as your financial disclosure and, and things like that. And we also kind of talked a little bit about certain disclosures that are required on the record, right? And so this kind of adopts that same method. Sometimes there's certain disclosures that you have to make on the record, whether it be in the context of a hearing or a written document that's either filed with the clerk or filed with the state. Um, with respect to um, either your, your business dealings or what the source of your conflict of interest is. So these are the ones that I kind of put within the um, prohibited conduct. Ms. Kardash? Yes, sir. I did want to ask a question. <clears throat> With voting conflict, since we're right into this area, uh, for example, if uh, a sitting commissioner had a attorney-client privilege with an attorney who was applying for the position here in the city of Tarpon Springs. Should that not have been disclosed on both ends during the hiring process of that attorney? Well, with that particular issue, there um, are certain layers and levels. First of all, um, where attorney-client pr privilege is involved, that legal privilege um, on behalf of the client um, they are not required to disclose that. That is something that is within within their discretion. That's why it's considered and deemed by the law to be privileged, right? Attorney-client privilege is, is with the client. Um, and the attorney can only make disclosures under the Florida Bar rules um, that are permitted by that client and permissible for that client. Now, when you're talking about it within the context of um, a city bid, Right? There's some other issues that could arise. One of the things that could arise in the context of the city bid is if you have adopted uh, policies that govern your, proc your procurement um, and your bid policies. Um, I, you know, sometimes you hear it called as like the cone of silence. You can only, you can't talk to any city officials, you know, about this during, during the, the progress of this <laughs> bid. Um, then, then that could be a violation of that policy that could um, in, invalidate that bid if there was that communi communication that occurred dur during the bid period, right? Um, but no, uh, somebody who, who holds the privilege of the attorney-client privilege is not required to, to necessarily disclose that. Now, sometimes that can be um, a little different because we already talked earlier about a case where there was deemed to be no privilege um, regarding private business. And we've also talked about some circumstances where an individual is not permitted to, um, to have that representation um, funded by the taxpayers, right? And so let's use an example of somebody um, who, who is sitting on a board who may have committed some act that may or may not be criminal. First of all, they had like that right and protection of self-incrimination, right? I can't advise them on that. That's something I could not advise them. They would, it would actually be incumbent on that person um, to seek independent counsel, and then them and their counsel would have that attorney-client privilege because that attorney isn't representing the government entity, right? So if the attorney's not representing the government entity, um, then, then, then they have that opportunity to have that level of privilege. Okay, so in the, in the case in which you were mentioned before with Collier County Public Schools versus Mason Classical Academy, yes, uh, you know, a fact-finding purpose, mm -hmm. would that help 
uh, the situation with the attorney-client privilege, which uh, could possibly be withheld? So what you actually have there, though, is that attorney was already representing the school board, right? So that attorney's obligation was not to those two staff members that he was interviewing and meeting with because it was possible that he was interviewing and trying to fact find to see if they vol violated the, the school board policy. Um, and so that's part of the reason why the court sort of took it upon themselves to interpret that as saying, no, this was fact finding. Um, and he was interviewing these folks to fact find, he wasn't acting in a capacity as their legal counsel to provide them with legal advice um, or to perform legal services on their behalf. The legal services he was performing was on behalf of the entity, in that case, the school board. Okay, so uh, the final question. During the hiring process, if a, a sitting commissioner was talking about any city-related business, without that being uh, acknowledged or talked about during the ex party communications. Mm -hmm. You're saying right now through the sake of transparency and perception that no one, the commissioner or the attorney on both ends did not have to ex uh, disclose their personal, their attorney client privilege relationship or their city relationship and advice. Mm -hmm to the Board of Commissioners during that hiring process. So what you also have to remember is that the Florida Bar's conflict of interest rules are going to apply to that attorney, right? And if there was representation that causes um, a conflict of interest um, or, or could potentially cause a conflict of interest, then yes, that has to be disclosed, right? And that, that's and then both clients, both the, the client that they would be engaging and the client um, that originated the conflict, they would have to settle that and waive, each client would basically have to waive um, that conflict um, in order for that representation to continue. But where the issue lies here is if it's just that one commissioner that they're talking to or had talked to, right? that one commissioner does not have the right to act on behalf of the governing body to engage that lawyer on behalf of the governing body. They could only engage that lawyer on behalf of themselves concerning their own personal interest. Um, so that then, again, you're, you're, you're not talking necessarily about the same things. And in terms of conflict of interest, the representation has to actually be adverse. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, Obviously, we, you know, if there was something, we don't know what that conversation was because it's a privileged conversation. But if it was not related or something that would be adverse to the city, um, I'm not sure that it would rise to the level of a conflict of interest necessarily. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so my question is, is it appropriate <laughs> for a city commission to go um, and make accusations that are a fishing expedition or having fact? There are situations where it is appropriate for <laughs> commissioners to ask questions about the conduct of government officials, mm -hmm. um, about uh, their government employees and how things are being done. Um, that is an ability, right? So, so now you're talking about like legislative policy, and yes, you do have the ability to ask questions about how things are being done. If you want to know, make sure that they're being done appropriately. However, you don't have the right to act. You don't have the right to order and do some of those other things as a specific individual. Um, I don't ever think that it is a good idea to make accusations in any forum or any context um, unless you already have uh, particularly in a public forum, unless you already have solid proof um, to back it up. And then also, too, sometimes that's really not even appropriate. It should be done through a regulatory agency. So kind of towards the end here, when I talk about what the Commission on Ethics does, um, I'm going to talk about some of the agencies and some of the other means and mechanisms that you have um, recourse to that can actually impose certain kinds of discipline um, and disciplinary processes and procedures um, that uh, can sometimes carry a much bigger stick than what you can do as a commission. Because, you know, your role really is to be that legislative and policy-making body. You are not a disciplinary body, right? Now, sometimes in your context as an employer, 
that can be the case. Um, but certainly in the, in the context that you're sort of discussing, I, I think that um, looking to the agencies and the bodies throughout the state of Florida that do have that regulatory and disciplinary authority um, is more appropriate in many cases, um, especially when it comes to matters that may arise from people who are on the same body and do have to work together. But we as a body cannot together file something on the Commission of Ethics for one individual of our body. That is not something that should occur now. Okay. Yes, sir. I have to ask the next question then, and we're going to get so close to number seven, it's not funny here. Okay. Um, is it ethically acceptable to take no facts and to ask a fellow commissioner to resign having no facts, having no figures, having anything to do with it, is that an ethics violation? Um, we'll leave it at that. Is that an ethics violation? So um, we haven't even talked about all the ethics rules yet. Sure. So how about if we kind of go over some of the ethics I, rules I'm, I'm before, <laughs> before we start talking about what does and does not constitute <laughs> violation of the same? Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. What, um, what I'd like to do, if we can, is just stay focused on this last section, ethics. Mm -hmm. um, everybody will be able to ask whatever questions they have. The two attorneys are not leaving. And I'd like to get that four-hour block so we can <laughs> sign that signature uh, to our page out of the way. So if, if, if you can in, just indulge me a bit. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Kardashian. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> All right. So um, turning back here to uh, where are we? So, so we'll start with the solicitation or acceptance of gifts or honoraria. Um, so you have some citations there to, to some of the statutes, right? Um, and I do want to point out that there are many, many statutes. What I did provide you, you see that Florida statute section 112.313. Um, I did provide that for you in your folder, and that really covers a majority of these. But I do also want you to know that this is not the only one. This is not like the end-all, be-all of what exists in Chapter 112. Um, this is what I would consider um, a solid introduction to Florida's ethics laws, right? Um, so with respect to gifts, you can never accept anything that is being given to you to influence your official decision-making ability. So if you know or if you reasonably should know that something is specifically being given to you so that you give somebody a favorable ruling or you act or, are be, or if you are being asked to act or refrain <clears throat> from acting in a certain manner, any gift that's given in that regard is always going to be a violation, right? But what you have is anything under $25, right? We all know we have to file your Form 1 and, and, and probably coming up here soon, your Form 6. <clears throat> yes. Um, so uh, this is part of the way that the state tracks what's actually going on and what business interests you actually have. That's what they use these forms for. So that it then becomes a public record. So when you file voting conflicts and things come up, they can actually look at what you filed, look at what's going on and make a determination as to whether or not there's that violation there of Florida's ethics laws, right? Now, anything under $25, there is no reporting requirement. It's, again, still an illegal gift if it's being given to influence your decision making. Um, then you have a reporting requirement that has triggered if you receive anything of value between $25 and $100. And I do want to emphasize that it is really anything of value. And it, and it also, too, in some cases and in some circumstances, it's anything that's, that could just be deemed of value to you, right, for certain, for certain violations here. But specifically re with respect to your reporting requirements, if it's between $25 and $100, you have to report it. Anything over $100 is going to be a presumption that it's an illegal gift. And there are also certain categories of people 
really more so if you work in state government with like a lot of lobbyists and things like that. But, you know, in, in your circumstance, you do have people that regularly appear before you. Um, and in many instances, there can just also be that same strict prohibition on accepting any type of gift from those types of individuals um, that are appearing before you for your official decision making capacity. And and usually, um, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example. The, the other day, um, I, I walked into a meeting and there were like little little gift bags and it was for a quasi judicial hearing and I kind of like stopped for a minute and I was like oh what is this right because I have seen it where people who are applying for something will give gifts think that it's appropriate to give gifts <coughs> to the commission or to the body um, right before they're coming before you right and th they don't always know it's not always done with that like insidious intent or anything like that but sometimes they just don't know so but I when I saw that I did make an inquiry of where they came from why they were there and it was really something that was innocuous and it was definitely under $25. So I, you know, it, it wasn't an, it was not an issue. Um, but you know, a lot of people don't know or understand these rules. And again, the onus is on the public officials, the purpose, the people who are receiving the gifts, the people who took that oath of office, um, to know and understand and help to in educate their citizens, um, and the people that appear before them as to what that actually means. Right. Um, unauthorized compensation. I have it there. You can't, um, receive any money that is not due to you pursuant to law and policy. You can't receive money that is being given to you to, again, influence um, your official decision making. And there actually is a companion um, criminal statute that I kind of have at the end for you guys to look at and, and kind of compare. So I have the ethics one in your uh, folders. And then in, as part of the presentation, I have the actual language that's the criminal statute that has the higher intent. Um, I usually, usually people will think about this in terms of bribery, right? Um, but ultimately, uh, you also cannot receive um, any type of compensation that is not authorized to be given to you by law. Um, so that means if you have um, an ordinance in place um, or you have a pay scale in place for your public employees, you can only give them what's in that pay scale. You can't exceed that. And when you do give bonuses and things like that, there are certain rules and laws that have to apply to the policies and the manner and mechanisms in which you give out bonuses to your public employees and um, in terms of the compensation that you all receive yourselves. It has to be pursuant to law or policy that you have put in place. Um, and there are some restrictions on that. Um, and municipal finance and employment law is another class. So. You also have here um, misuse of public position. Um, so misuse of public position is actually akin to the um, abuse of public office. And this has this particular provision has far predated the constitutional provision. Um, and one of the things that the Commission on Ethics affirmatively said is that we are going to use this body of opinions and cases that we already have um, in applying and interpreting what constitutes an abuse of public position. Um, the biggest thing that I like to point out with respect to this particular provision um, is that uh, whereas you have that specific class uh, of people who the constitutional violation applies to, where it says, you know, the person, their spouse, their child, misuse of public position says that if you are doing it to give a benefit to anyone, that they are not entitled to by law, to anyone. So that is a much broader category, right? It can be yourself or anyone else, any business, it doesn't matter. So the this particular provision is much broader and it reads that you are prohibited from corruptly using or attempting to use your official position or resources to obtain a special privilege or benefit for themselves or others. Right, and so that also includes biz business entities. It's that or others that makes this particular provision incredibly expansive. Also, too, it's not just your official action in this particular provision. Um, it's the resources that are available to you as a, a public, um, a, as a public employee, as a, a public officer. Right. So, what happens if you're asked to endorse a particular position that's not really related to your municipality, but could be, um, and they want you to endorse it as your elected official? Um, it's been a while since I looked at that particular provision, but there are some um, 
case law, uh, or not case law, ethics opinions that talk about when you can do that like on your official letterhead, right? So you can only use certain things like your official letterhead, your official city seal, and things of that nature in specific instances that are related to city business, right? So, so I would actually have to look to see, it may depend on what type of endorsement it is, it may depend on whether it's somebody who's asking you just by virtue of your public position. It may be something that's related to your public office. So a lot of these things can be very nuanced and intensive in terms of how you interpret the facts surrounding the situation. Um, so that's not, so basically I'm not answering your question directly. <laughs> um, but what I am saying is, is that there could be certain circumstances where yes, you can write an endorsement um, on your city-issued letterhead um, with your signature as your official um, signature as your commission as a commissioner as vice mayor right um, and then there can be other situations where that would be prohibited okay so what if the endorsement isn't on city letterhead if it's just if it's personal your then personal it's personal endorsement it's, if it's personal you can't sign it as vice mayor Lunt play it ah, safe okay. ah yes <laughs> and, and then I, I believe that I believe I know in our rules of procedure you also have to identify it as being your own opinion and not necessarily that of the city or the Correct. city commission. Right. There has to be um, a specific Spoiler. act of the commission for it to be um, deemed to come from the governing body itself. Okay, because yes. I get a lot of requests for endorsements of ah. various pro and anti legislative things ah. that I'm sure I only get asked about because I'm the vice mayor of Pink Springs. <laughs> Correct. Well, that one I actually can answer because if it's specifically um, legislative, there is now a prohibition on using city funds, which can include those endorsements um, for state legislation. It's something that the legislature gave uh, municipalities and counties um, to try and prohibit us from influencing their legislative process in Tallahassee. Okay. Yes. This is a rule that I need to ask you because it was brought up to me. Um, I took a trip to Texas. I grabbed a couple of shirts, and I was on my merry way. One of the shirts was a city shirt. Mm -hmm. I was holding my granddaughter with the shirt. Um, I got requests from the editor. Um, did I use that on the plane? Did I use it? Um, is, is this a ruling that, I mean, I know they were going to give me a seat on the wing, and then when they saw the badge, they gave me a seat inside the plane. It was ridiculous to even have to answer this question. Is it a ruling? Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't even remember whether I used it walking through an airport or not. So I need to know. Well, for everybody, we should know when are we allowed to use it and when are we not. So there are some um, s statutory rules, I believe, that's, that that um, actually surround. Uh, they might be administrative rules, but um, that surround how your city seal is actually used. And there is a difference between you know your official city seal and your logo, right? Okay. Um, what the issue then becomes is if you are wearing that in order to gain some advantage or to gain some recognition that is not appropriate to what you're doing, right? If you're doing it just to it, at, a, at a city function in order to identify yourself as a member of the city commission, that's obviously fine, right? That's really what they were intended for. But if you're wearing a city commission shirt to go to a non-city function or, or something that's not related to your specific government business, um, in order to get that recognition um, or some other special privilege that wouldn't be available to other members of the general public, that's when you're crossing that line, right? So they're not going to say you can, you can wear it here, you cannot wear it there, but what it is is they look both at the effect of, that it would have in the particular, particular context that you had it on, um, whether or not that was intentional, those are some of the things that they, they would look at. You know, think of this scenario where, you know, you're coming directly from a city, city meeting to go and then get on a plane, obviously you're just coming from a city meeting and wearing your shirt, right? That's one thing. Um, but if you're specifically wearing that because you want to get upgraded to first class or you want something like that or you want to bypass the security line or some intent like that, 
that's where it's going to become, you know, a problem, um, you know, and, and looking at how it's being used and the intent with which it's going to be going to be being used. That's really the, the factors and the information that the commission is going to examine and trying to determine whether or not it actually constitutes a violation. Thank you. Um, so the last one, disclosure or use of certain information. So oftentimes there may be things, like I said before, you're not required to give information um, out. It's not really what you're here for. Um, but if you do come upon information within the, the conduct of your public v business, which may not be readily available to the public, which happens and especially happens when you have police and fire departments, a lot of times you will have access to or, or be given information um, that is confidential and exempt um, and that you, know, you need to do your job as a commissioner. If you then take that information and you use it to benefit yourself or to be benefit others or your business entity, and again, this particular statute also does do the same thing and uh, defines a specific class of individuals who are prohibited from receiving that benefit, right? Um, then, then that does become a, prob a problem, right? So if you have, you see it really most of the time in land use law and land development law where you have um, a commissioner who uh, has a, a business um, that uh, either as a real estate agent or a developer or something like that, and they have information about certain lands within the city or certain land development rules or regulations that are coming forward, and then they use that to specifically benefit their private business, um, then that's going to be a fairly clear violation of this particular provision um, because they're using that information that they only had but for their, but because of their position in the government um, that isn't readily available and they basically used it as an unfair business advantage, number one, um, and number two, they weren't given that information in order to perform those acts or do those things, um, so they are improperly using something that really is a public confidence. Um, so here's some of the um, prohibited employment and business practices. Um, you cannot do business with your own agency. So similar to using information that's privileged to benefit your, your own business, you actually cannot do business with your own agency. You cannot contract, you cannot sell, you cannot lease or do anything of that nature with your private business and your public office. Um, so there are some strict prohibitions here um, with respect to what that looks like and whether or not, you know, that you kind of think about it in terms of, you know, serving two masters, right? <laughs> um, you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to be acting in your capacity of, as a public official or you're not, right? Um, there are some exceptions to when there can be contracts. And I will say that in some of these um, relationships that uh, sometimes if it's pre-existing, the public officials um, taking office, so let's say they weren't an elected official and there was already an existing contract with the city and then they got elected into office, then they can maintain that office and, and the entity can maintain the contract. Um, however, when things would come up to vote on that contract or renew their, that contract, that particular official um, would have to um, uh, file a voting conflict of interest form and wouldn't be able to participate in that discussion either. So does that extend uh, by nature to participation in interlocal agreements? No, it's your specific entity because interlocal agreements are dealing with multiple government entities. Um, and usually there, there, um, there is only government entities that are involved, so there's no private business, right? It's only an agreement between two. Maybe so I've, you're thinking of maybe, maybe like a third-party beneficiary, beneficiary so of an interlocal? My normal employment is dealing with government agencies. Ah. So if I sit on a board that happens to belong to Pinellas County, for mm -hmm. example, does that preclude me from doing business with Pinellas County? It, um, so it would depend on the nature of the appointment, right? So that, that's the thing about all these ethics laws is it becomes very fact specific um, with respect to when you're triggering 
um, these particular elements that are laid out in the statute. Um, and sometimes you'll look at it and it'll read one way and then you look at how the commission interprets it and puts their opinions out and it doesn't really seem to comport. But essentially what you're asking is if you're sitting on this and the question then becomes, are you sitting on that by virtue of your public office or are you sitting on that as a private citizen or are you sitting on that by virtue of, of your, your contract with that agency? So there's a lot of little nuances to that type of, of, of a question. All right, so you, if I sit as in my capacity as, as a commissioner for the city of Tarpon Springs mm -hmm. and I sit on a board, um, happens to be a planning council and happens to be regional. Okay. Can I, am I prohibited? From contracting with that agency, from yes. From contracting with anybody from that agency, even not, though it, Not the individuals from that agency, with that agency. With that specific with agency. that specific agency. Ah, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> there's, I was gonna ask, there's also a mechanism if in situations like this to ask for an informal opinion. Correct, and, and I'm gonna go over how to request an informal and formal opinions and how to file complaints. <clears throat> so, um, yes. If a board member is going to financially benefit from a transaction that's taking place or that the board is voting on, does recusal alone um, clear them of doing business with one's own agency? Um, no, not necessarily. There can be circumstances in which it's still prohibited, that you still cannot have that contract, whether or not they're voting on it, right, um, where they would still be precluded um, from, from, from doing that. Um, but again, that depends on the extent of the business. Is it for one specific thing? Is it a continuing and ongoing contract that's going to be subject to constant review by the governing body to the extent it's going to inhibit that official's ability to do their constitutional duty? So if, um, if a project mm -hmm. is before the board, mm -hmm. And it's not a recurring project, it's a one-time project. Mm -hmm. And a sitting commissioner is involved in any way with that project and will be remunerated in, in some way. Does recusal alone clear them of no. that transaction? No, it does not. Okay, and so what it, what it says too under the statute is there is a 5% threshold. So you don't even have to be actively involved in the business. If you own 5% of stock or, or any sort of interest in that particular business, um, and, and not just you, it can also be the public official's spouse, child, um, or if they're an officer, employee, or owner, that's when it's going to trigger that doing business with one's own agency. That's a pretty, I mean, it's, a, it's meant to be very broad because what they don't want to see is individuals who basically continue to use government agencies um, to fill their own pockets, you know, whether it's with real estate, whether it's, you know, with um, construction services, you know, that's something that is uh, deemed to be in violation of this particular provision. And, and all that it has to be is that 5%. Um, so also, too, you cannot have conflicting employment or contractual relationships. Um, that becomes um, pretty important, too. You know, you can't have uh, somebody who is uh, employed by two governing agencies or uh, employed by a company um, and then also sits on uh, the board. You know, it's kind of the same kind of thing where <coughs> there's just this constant conflict of whether they're sitting there in their capacity um, as, you know, the business entity or they're sitting there in their capacity as a public official. So that certainly um, is an issue. Issue. Then also to um, anti anti nepotism, you cannot employ, promote, or or appoint a family member. And then in that particular statute, it gives you a class and defines who constitutes family under that specific provision. 
Um, and with that, I'm gonna go back to the dual office holding. So this particular one, dual office holding, this is a constitutional provision um, that says that you cannot hold more than one office in either state or federal government, right? And so uh, one of the first things that they look at is whether or not something constitutes an office. And I always like to use the special magistrate example. And I know that throughout Pinellas, um, and also other places in the state, but I particularly saw it a lot here in Pinellas, you would have um, special magistrates that served as special magistrates for multiple communities. Well, there's an attorney general's opinion that says, no, that's, that's not allowed, right? When you're serving as a special magistrate, you have final decision-making authority, right? And you are supposed to um, um, not hold any other office where you have those same entitlements and that same delegated responsibility. Um, so that is uh, deemed to be a violation of Florida's ethics laws um, and inconsistent um, with this particular uh, constitutional provision. Um, so one of the things I also put in your packet, because you may be aware and you may have seen um, some of the legislation that just recently came down, I know there was some uh, information on it, and what I included in your packet was from Chapter 99, and that is Florida's Resign to Run Law. All right, and under Florida's Resign to Run Law, it says basically that um, if you are going to run for office that overlaps in the terms um, of your current office, that you actually have to tender your resignation. And your resignation does not have to be effective um, immediately. Your resignation only has to be effective um, for the uh, date where you would take your new office, right? So if you know it's coming up um, and you're gonna have that office, you can say uh, you're gonna take office you know, on, on March 30th or whatever. You can have your resignation effective March 29th. But then it also goes on to say that you cannot um, rescind that. You don't have that ability to rescind. So you can't sort of pad yourself so that if you don't make it, you know, if you don't win your election, that you have something to, quote, like, fall back on. Um, and the legislation that recently changed is that we now have one singular exception to that, um, and that is if you are running for the office of president and hold office in the state of Florida. <laughs> All right, voting conflicts of interest. <clears throat> Public officials are prohibited from voting on any measure which would inure to their own special private gain or loss or that of a relative or business. Um, so this particular provision is contained there in that Florida statutory reference. I think I included that one in there. I know, um, I'm pretty sure that one's in your packet as well. Um, but that particular state statute, that's all that it deals with, is voting conflicts of interest. Um, I also do, because I, I hear people that always will ask me, you know, do I have to vote on this? Do I have to vote on this? Well, well, yeah, you have to vote on it. It's your constitutional duty to vote on it. You know, if you're not going to vote on the things that come before you, then then why are you here? That's sort of, that's sort of the point, right? Um, but you do have a constitutional duty to vote on the matters that come before you unless you have a legal conflict of interest that is covered in any of these ethics laws or rules or that is covered by this particular state statute. So there are disclosures that are required. Um, one thing I would point out is oftentimes it's something that I hear for the first time when we're sitting in the meeting or sitting on the dais. The statute actually says that you are supposed to make every effort to get a memorandum into the file in advance of the meeting. So if you are reading your agenda and you see something and it comes up and you know, right, you are supposed to make every possible effort to get that memorandum, that, that writing done and filed with the clerk prior to the actual meeting, right? Um, so I do always do it as a reminder, like when I go through the quasi-judicial things, say, hey, does anybody have any conflicts of interest? Does anybody have any ex parte disclosures? Things like that. Um, but you are actually supposed to do it beforehand if you know about it beforehand. Um, sometimes it happens the other way that you don't even know that, that there's individuals that are, are related to you or your business entities or whatever who are part of something, right? Um, and that you have 15 days um, to do it and you still have to do it orally at the meeting. So if it's something that comes up and you realize all of a sudden, oh no, 
Um, I, I, um, this, this might have a relative that works in this company or that company or whatever the case may be. Um, then you have the problem here where you have, um, you have to announce it orally at the meeting, fill it out after the meeting, and then that actually has to be attached to the minutes um, that then become the official record of that meeting. So it is very important to do that ahead of time. I don't want to specifically speak on any particular mm -hmm. volunteer board, um, <clears throat> but on many of the quasi-judicial boards, mm -hmm. including when I was on the Board of Adjustments for many years, mm -hmm. The first words the attorney says is, you have to provide findings of fact, right? Is that that's one of the things you should provide findings of fact. And I find that more times than not, when I'm listening to a case, there is no findings of fact. It's more of a opinion. Ah. Um, yes, so, so findings of fact, uh, particularly when you're dealing with quasi-judicial applications, um, they become more legally relevant, particularly when you're denying something, right? If, if you're giving somebody, you know, or if you're <laughs> granting something that you know is going to be challenged, it just becomes more important. Um, a lot of times, those findings of fact can be inferred from the record and the staff presentations. <coughs> so let's say staff is presenting you with something and they have, you know, based on this, based on this, based on this, um, you know, we are recommending this particular motion, right? Um, so then you already have in both a public record and in the presentation that staff is giving you the factual basis that they think you should be relying on um, in whatever recommended um, motion they're putting before you, right? Um, and, and so that's a little bit different, though, when you're talking about voting conflicts. So um, what you have to look at is actually um, the special private gain or loss and how that affects that, and, and that's really what you're putting in, in the record. And if you actually look at the voting form that's provided, that memorandum of voting conflict um, that we get from the Commission on Ethics, um, you know, it has, you have to put your office and, and, and what agency it's for, and then on the back, it has a little list of, well, what is your conflict, right? Where you actually have to fill that out and say how you are related um, or how you are going to gain or lose um, by virtue of your approval or disapproval of whatever the measure may be, right? And so then when that can be later reviewed, that's what they use to look at um, in, in conjunction with your Form 1 or Form 6 um, to make a determination of, of whether or not it's actually um, a valid recusal. And I would... I do want to clarify, though, that that is different from an ex parte communication, right? They're, they're definitely not the same thing. You can cure an ex parte communication Indeed. with an inquiry, yeah, with an inquiry on the record um, where you disclose the information that you received regarding the application um, and, and then verify that you are actually going to be able to receive the information within the context of, a, of the hearing and make your determination based on that information. Does yes, that have sir. to be done previous? Like a, it does at the beginning of the hearing. That's why when I, when in the quasi-judicial. Well, you said there was like a 14-day prior. Oh, that's for the voting. That's eventually. for the voting that's conflict. Just voting that's conflict. That's just well, okay. right. Yes, sir. That, that was yes. kind of my question. But it, uh, ex parte uh, disclosures does not have to be in writing. It could just be orally, orally at, the hearing. at the meeting. Correct. Right. It's, it's a different issue than, than whether or not you actually have a voting conflict. So. Ms. Kardash, I, I, we were talking about employment and, uh, you know, nepotism and stuff. Uh, I know a lot of people in town, and they're, you know, they're not related to me in any way. I just know them, and they approach me and say, hey, are there any city positions? And, and there's times I, I reach out to Mark. I said, hey, this person's applying for this position. Just give them a look. There's nothing wrong with doing that as, you know, funneling it through the city manager? Um, well, what you cannot do is step outside of what the city's process is. Yes. So if the city process really isn't isn't to do that, um, I, I would shy away from that because that actually gets more towards like a misuse of position mm -hmm. because you're basically saying, um, hey, I'm a commissioner and I have a friend that's applying for this position and I would like you to move their application to the top of the list. Right. No. So you're giving us it's yeah. almost like giving a special benefit for others. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to fall into that realm of the application of that particular statute, um, which you really don't want to do. Okay. Yes, sir. In addition, the city manager works for us, so Correct. it's not a good idea to do that in the first place. Um, you you vested him with hiring and firing power. Right. Um, so, so I'm pretty sure that that's part of the charter. Uh, I, I can't remember offhand right at the moment, but I, I'm pretty sure that you, yeah, you gave, you gave him the ability to hire and fire. Um, so you did grant that discretionary authority to, to him. If we hadn't, he's been doing it all along. <laughs> yeah, I have. Yes, I am. Gee, Mark. <laughs> all right. So um, requesting an ethics opinion. So uh, only um, public officers, candidates for officers, and public employees um, can request an official opinion from the Commission on Ethics. Um, and they can issue either formal or informal um, opinions. Um, they do have to be submitted in writing, and the writing has to describe um, the circumstances with particularity for the exact reason that I said, because a lot of these inquiries um, do end up being very fact-specific. They determine on the players. They determine, um, you know, the, the level of government. Sometimes there's even, there are some um, exceptions for smaller government entities um, for things um, like the anti-nepotism. If you have a government entity that um, is under a certain threshold of population, um, then there, it, it's almost like you can't help but have um, people who are in some way related um, employed in that city. However, um, you know, I, I, and I want to say you guys are close to it, but I would imagine that you are fast going to, to break that threshold. So, um, also, to uh, the effect of public uh, opinion, similar to attorney general's opinions, um, there is some precedential um, effect there, um, but they can be overturned by the commission. Um, you know, they, they really uh, do try and follow them so that there's notice of what they expect and how they're going to be interpreting those laws. Um, and, and they are usually considered um, to, to be binding. The other thing that I do want to emphasize is that you cannot ask hypothetical questions. They have to be based on actual real events, um, and, it, and it is limited to that defined number of people who can request an opinion um, from the Commission on Ethics. Now, I will say, unlike filing an ethics complaint, um, you can, as a governing body, direct your attorney to request an opinion regarding specified conduct, um, and that's different than filing a complaint. You can direct, as, as a governing body, ask your attorney to, uh, write, to write and request either a formal or, or informal opinion from the commission um, regarding any particular set of circumstances or um, a scenario that, that could be of issue. Um, that is something that you do have the ability to do as a governing body. Um, but that is different from filing an ethics complaint. All right. So um, with an ethics complaint, anybody can file that. It doesn't matter. Any citizen, um, any, uh, any business um, entity, but it has to be an individual, right? And the fact that it's an individual that has to file it becomes important because ethics complaints um, are required to be attested to. So if you look at the form that they actually provide, um, at the very bottom it has to be notarized, right? So that person is swearing that they have actual knowledge of the facts that occurred, um, that have been set forth in the complaint, um, and, and are going to trigger this investigation, right? And the importance to that is that that individual um, can then be liable for attorney's fees, costs, and other penalties um, if that complaint is determined to be frivolous, um, if it's determined to have been um, filed maliciously or with ill intent, um, and, and particularly if the, the facts surrounding it um, are inappropriate, right? Like if, if, if they're really doing it, the, the point of this is that it's not supposed to be used as a political tool. It is supposed to be used as a disciplinary tool. Right, um, and so the reason they set up these rules that way is so they that to, tr to try and dissuade um, public officials from using it as a tool to to kind of hammer some of their um, political opponents in certain certain circumstances and certain scenarios. So. Um, 
Uh, and also, too, you can see right in the statute where they talk about the attorney's fees. Yes. I know you and I have had this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, can the Board of Commissioners direct the city attorney to file a complaint? Oh, yeah. Um, I will tell you, as your city attorney, I would not do that. You can direct it, but I would not do it. Why wouldn't you do it? Um, because you or anybody else as an individual commissioner can file that complaint and it's not your role as a, as a body, right? So here, the, you're actually stepping outside of your public purpose by doing that in terms of how I read the statutes and the materials that I see published from the Commission on Ethics, right? Because they give this vast blanket of people, any individual can file this complaint, right? So there's nothing that prohibits you from filing that complaint and you can do that. Um, if you want me to request an opinion from the commission, I would happily do that. I would draft it for you and do whatever it is that you want. But no, I would not file an individual complaint um, uh, directed by the board. So here, here is something, um, too, that, that uh, you should know is that there are only some specific government entities um, that have been vested with the ability to provide referrals to the Commission on Ethics pursuant to state law. Um, and those uh, entities are the governor, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, a state attorney, or a U.S. attorney. These individuals and, and these entities can make direct referrals to the Commission on Ethics, and even when they do make those referrals, um, then it requires a vote of six of nine of the the commissioners on the Commission on, of Ethics in order to hear that case and make a determination on that case. Um, so I don't see where it says that um, city commissions or county governments can um, in and of themselves uh, file those um, because the onus then falls on the individual who's filing the complaint. And I would actually see that, number one, first as a huge liability. Number two, there's a, a good probability that the commission would be asking me to swear to facts that I don't know and I'm not personally privy to. Yes, sir. Well, we had a case like this in the previous board. And the question I would ask is our city attorney did do that exactly. I can't speak for a decision that another attorney made. You would have to ask why, you would have to ask that attorney why they thought, why they made that decision because I cannot um, guess at that. This is my understanding and, and my reading of, of the ethics laws and these state statutes. So what you're saying is <clears throat> the board couldn't direct their, or shouldn't direct their attorney to file an ethics complaint that one of the members of the board should do it personally? Yes. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I don't have a slide on it, but also um, in addition to the Commission on Ethics, the Attorney General also does um, issue advisory opinions. They do not issue advisory opinions to um, private individuals or citizens. They only will issue advisory opinions um, to public officials throughout the state. And it's really to give guidance to public bodies. Again, this is a scenario where if you, um, as the public body, directed me to, to do so, um, I would put together a request to the Attorney General's Office for clarification on a matter. Typically, they won't. They don't usually do um, ethics laws as much because the Ethics Commission really is the body pursuant to the Constitution that really has the authority to answer uh, those questions. Um, but sometimes there's a tangential issue that that they'll kind of throw in there. Um, but they they typically will look um, at uh, at questions of state law, and because technically ethics is a state law, sometimes, you know, they will take that upon themselves. Other times, you know, the Attorney General will say, no, we're going to refer you to the Commission on Ethics. It's, it's not for us to answer, right? Um, so the other thing that I have here is the penalties for violation. This is just one snippet. I do want to let you know this is just really to kind of give an example of what the penalties look like um, in, in the ethics code. 
right? You have um, forfeiture of your office, $10,000 fines, um, restitution of any pecuniary benefits that you may have received. So if you received public funds um, or are monies in a private business in violation of any of these ethics laws, you actually are required to pay that back. In some cases, if it can't be paid back directly to an entity, sometimes it is just collected by the state. Um, but you also are subject to public censure, reprimand, suspension, impeachment, all those kinds of things, and any contracts that you may have entered into um, that are in violation of any of these ethics laws, um, they are actually voidable as a ma matter of law and um, would not be considered to be valid contracts. Um, so that's important to remember. Also, pursuant to um, state statute 112.3231, um, liability for any acts committed in um, office extends for five years. So even if you no longer hold office and still have committed acts that are in violation of Florida's ethics laws, um, you can still be subject to the penalties of Florida's Ethics Commission um, for, for five years following that particular act. And that's important to remember there as too. So, Unfortunately, I have gone over the, the 45 minutes, um, but I would, if I could, just ask for 10 more minutes, if that's all right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Just um, uh, Vice Mayor Lund asked whether we're on a time frame. I'm not, and I would suspect most of the commissioners are not either. That would be up to you two, um, the attorneys, and um, as far as any time frame goes, and, and uh, to continue on, I, I uh, want to make sure we get this. Again, I want to make sure you get the four hours. Item seven so that, out of the way. Okay, and the four hours. A, okay. Just have a restroom. No, no, we will. Okay. Ms. Right. Kardash, if you could you're right, finish up, and then what we'll do is take a 10-minute break and, and then come back, and everybody will be ready for item seven. All right, so I'm just going to dive into some of the, the criminal acts here. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first we have, it's actually a misdemeanor to provide false statements in writing to a public servant in the performance of his or her official duties. Um, this is, uh, although you would normally see uh, staff being the ones who are providing you with the information, you know, you would hope that your staff is open and honest um, in, in providing you with the information that you need in your official decision-making process, um, but it is a crime to intentionally provide false information in order to manipulate the outcome of something, um, and this also does apply to the public. This isn't something that would just apply to your public officials. If you have individuals from the public who are in intentionally providing you with false information to get you to decide something in a certain manner, particularly, you know, quasi-judicial hearings, yes, you expect that. It's under oath. It's subject to penalty of perjury anyway. Um, but anything that is provided in writing to a public servant um, is, is a crime if, it, if they're intentionally providing false information. Yes, What sir? about applicants who, in, during their application, during the quasi-judicial in support of their particular position actually lie and it's that's perjury that's perjury that's perjury but here this this particular crime right and this is just a smattering there's all kinds of things in in 837 and 838 um, that do apply to to sort of the realm that we're operating in in terms of government agencies right um, and, and so the other thing, too, to remember is that because this is criminal, you're dealing with specific intent and something that has to be proven, by a, a, a proven um, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Um, so you have a little bit of that higher degree. But if somebody is in, intentionally providing you something in writing that they know is false, um, you know, then this is going to be what, what kicks in. Yes, sir. I have to ask the infamous pink elephant in the room question. What happens when somebody accuses you of firing someone that resigned? That's a false statement, isn't it? Um, I am not clear on the context of that, so we'll discuss that later. Thank you. 
Uh, so here, um, in terms of uh, Florida statute uh, and Chapter 838, these are some of the definitions that apply. I know that's very, very tiny writing. <laughs> I was just trying to get it all on one slide, right? But really what, what I'm trying to kind of highlight here is some specific um, definitions. Benefit is deemed any gain or advantage. Um, and also, too, it, it's, it could be any gain or advantage that is specific to the person um, that is receiving that gain or advantage, right? Um, then also harm, we always think, um, you know, in terms of threats of harm, that it's actually physical harm, um, but there's a greater realm of harm, that uh, a, a notion of harm that is adopted here, and that is any um, pecuniary. So it can be a financial loss that you could be threatening somebody to suffer um, because of, of whatever act you are trying to get them to do or refrain from doing. Right, and then also to um, public servant, it defines public servant as any officer or employee and does include your city attorneys. Um, official misconduct. So we're moving out of misuse of official position into some official criminal misconduct and what that means. This is actually a third degree felony. Um, and this is uh, if you knowingly or intentionally obtain a benefit um, for any person or uh, cause any unlawful harm to another by falsifying any official document or record, concealing, covering up, destroying, or altering official documents and records, um, or you know, delaying or preventing um, again, information. So if, if you know, Andy and I are trying to give you information, if your staff, your, your planning department, your building official is trying to communicate information to you and somebody intentionally frustrates that, that does constitute a crime because they're trying to manipulate the official decision-making process and that can be a very serious issue. Um, you know, and you, you do kind of see some of that rear its ugly head in terms of, um, you know, land use law and decisions and things like that. So when people People try to um, prevent, obstruct, or, or, or uh, manipulate that flow of information in your official decision-making process, that does constitute a third-degree felony. Ms. Kardash, would that also include us as uh, board members giving false statements or false information to individuals who may use anonymous uh, names or anything like that as well to present items? It, it really is the other way around. It can apply to you and other public officials, to you as a commission and other public officials, um, but not you necessarily to the public because you remember, you know, you're really, if you're transmitting information, it's really supposed to be in the form of some um, official proceeding or official meeting is really the, the context where you're supposed to be transmitting information to your citizens. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, so here you have unlawful compensation or reward for official behavior. Again, um, this was kind of reiterated, and I did go ahead and print out the full definition there so you can see it. But again, this gets back to that um, bribery language and what that means. And this is actually a two-slider. So you have that part and then this part here. Oh. <clears throat> And then here, corruption by threat against a public servant. People are not allowed to threaten you to exercise or refrain from exercising your official, uh, official decision-making authority as an individual. And again, remembering that that threat does include pecuniary harm. That's a definition that does apply to this. So, um, and this is also a felony. Uh, that people cannot threaten you within the course and scope of your, your public duties. That, that is a serious crime, and um, we have seen a significant increase in this um, across the state as well, um, both physical, monetary, you name it. So um, this is a fairly serious crime. And then this one, too, we kind of already talked about the disclosure or use of confidential information. This one I like to share for any agency that has um, a police department. 
that if you do come across criminal justice information, there's also other you know, laws that apply to um, the disclosure of uh, criminal justice investigation information that's not allowed to be disclosed. Um, you know, this, this can cause a lot of problems, not just for your uh, police department, but also in the um, proper administration of justice. So you wanna make sure that you mind your P's and Q's if you happen to receive something um, that's, that's related to your criminal justice agency. All right, so that is all I have for you. If you have any final questions on this, um, you know, please, uh, you can ask now or you can reach out to, to me at another time. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and turn this over. Yes, Mayor. Um, the forms, sign them and give them to who? Give them to your city clerk, okay. to Irene, please. All right, um, I don't know if you wanted to take a break first, Andy. What we're gonna do is take a 10 minute okay. break and um, if we can come back at um, 240, 240, everybody, mm -hmm. and then we'll get started. Thank you, Ms. Carter. <coughs> yeah, thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're you're gonna stay here, right? Sorry? You're staying here. I'm gonna stay.
get started and reconvene the meeting at 2.40. Um, just a real 30-second soundbite. Um, this Form 6 that now city commissioners are required to fill out, um, this would be a question, well, maybe Irene or maybe one of our attorneys. Is there any guidance on that yet? That Form 6, which is that financial disclosure, one that might go into effect? Um, my understanding is that it did pass, um, but mm -hmm. it's pending the signature of the governor and that it would become effective July 1st. Okay. So, so if, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Regina, if it does pass, my concerns are that I have non-disclosure agreements with many organizations that would become evident during this disclosure. It's right. So um, we would have to sit down um, so that I could assist you in filling it out to make to kind of balance those out and make sure that you're providing the information that's required in the Form 6 um, while not valid invalidating some of that. So the, it, that would be um, a little bit of an arduous process. Um, and I would want to make sure that you were filling it out pro properly. Uh -huh. Well, um, yeah, so would right. I if I. Yeah. It just seems to be pretty intrusive. And then I'm going like, first of all, it was, oh, no, i got to yeah. do all this stuff. And then it was like, what do I do with all these NDCs I have? Right. Okay. So what we're going to do is shift gears now and go to item 7. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to um, Commissioner Kulia. <laughs> And I honestly don't know how this is going to go, so I'm just going to hope that um, uh, anybody involved in this will just follow our rules of procedure for prefer professional sure. decorum. So, Commissioner Kulia, this is your agenda item. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for the time. Uh, I, I, I sent in a memorandum um, last week stating that I would not be attending the meeting <coughs> unless, this agenda, unless this was brought up as an agenda item for many reasons. Um, I felt like it... Prior meetings, this was discussed that the workshop was going to be the time to talk about this, as uh, we as as we discussed, and uh, um, I think it's important. We're talking about transparency and perception, and just making sure the public trust is uh, withheld. And so, what really prompted all of this was uh, that interview or that article that was published in the Tampa Bay Times, in which. Uh, the comment that Commissioner Eisner had made is if he had talked with uh, City Attorney Salzman prior to Trask's resignation, his comment was, whether I did or if I didn't, it's nobody's business. And uh, unfortunately, I don't see it that way. I believe it's the city business of Tarpon Springs. The residents have a right to know. It's their business. We represent them. They work for us. Or, we work for them, excuse me, and we need to follow through with what they request us to do. And so with that statement, I set up a, a meeting with the city manager as well as attorney Salzman in which I asked, uh, I did want the interview to be recorded, but uh, city attorney Salzman uh, refused to have it recorded, which was fine. And here are my notes. These are actually the notes that I wrote down that day regarding the questions that I had asked. And so they lead me into some concerns and just clarification. And I'd like to go over some of these questions. Uh, the questions I had asked was, to City Attorney Salzman, how long have you known Commissioner Eisner? And his response, at any time, uh, City Attorney Salzman, if you disagree with these statements, you're more than willing to talk and, and, and correct your stance. How long have you known Commissioner Eisner? And his response was, I can't answer that due to the code of ethics. How long have you known Commissioner Eisner's wife, Linda? And his response was first from the Code Enforcement Board. First Did time I met her. First time I met her, yes. Do you socialize with either of them? If so, when was the first time? His response was no, never. When was the first time Commissioner Eisner or Commissioner Eisner's wife ever spoke to you about anything? He said he couldn't answer Commissioner Eisner. He could only respond to Commissioner Eisner's wife. When was the first time Commissioner Eisner ever spoke to you about the temporary city attorney services? And that was during the, the RFP process, he stated. When was the first time Commissioner Eisner ever spoke to you about permanent city attorney services? 
and he stated that was at the RFP meeting. And, he, and then I asked him, did you have any communication of any kind with Commissioner Eisner before Trash resigned? And he replied, I can't answer the question, but he never had discussions about Tom Trask. No, he never had discussed about Tom Trask resigning or his position as city attorney. Yes, sir. And then number eight, what was Commissioner Eisner's wife referencing when she texted me stating to me on July 27, 2022, are there temporary attorneys ready? There are temporary attorneys ready to take over day one up to speed until a permanent one can be hired. No loss of time. And City Attorney Salzman's response was, I have no idea. Number nine, the date, the text, the date of the text is July 27, 2022 stated in the previous question, had you talked to Linda Eisner or Commissioner Eisner about the city position at the time or before it? He said he first, the first person he spoke to about it was the city manager. Did you ever talk to Commissioner Eisner regarding taking over as interim city attorney before city attorney Tom Trask resigned? And his answer was no. When did you first realize the RFP for this position existed? How did you find out about it? And he said, Janina. And then number 12, during the interview process uh, for you, Mr. Salzman, after the first RFP, Commissioner Eiser was the only commissioner who had ex parte communication with you. Can you describe in detail what was discussed? Commissioner, I can go ahead. I can clarify that. Because I look back at when, when you asked that, I look back at it. I think I, I said on the tape that I had talked to him and the mayor about litigation. Okay. That, that's just wanted to clarify that. Okay. But during the time at the meeting though, the answer was, I do not recall. Right, that is correct. Okay. Uh, during the same interview when the BOC voted to send out another RFP because the board had a general feeling we wanted more city attorneys to apply, did Commissioner Eisner state he was happy with you city attorney Salzman and he stated common sense, we should keep him. And Mr. Salzman replied, I don't remember. Number 14, did you ever have any personal communication, Tarpon Springs City related communication, consultant communication with Commissioner Eisner before City Attorney Trask resigned? And he could not answer the question. Did Commissioner Eisner or Commissioner Eisner's wife sign an attorney client privilege document with you or your firm? His answer was no. Do you or your firm have an attorney client privilege form or document in place with Commissioner Eisner or his wife? His answer was no. Was a retainer requested by your firm from Commissioner Eisner or his wife, and what was the dollar amount and how was it paid? His answer was no. Have you or your firm ever represented or charged consulting fees to Commissioner Eisner or his wife, Linda? The answer was no. And number 19, have you ever represented or consulted with Commissioner Eisner and his wife, Linda, for free? And he stated that he can't answer the question. And so, what we have here is, you know, I'm just concerned. There, there's an issue with a, a current city commissioner and our current city attorney having a previous relationship that includes attorney-client privilege in which may include city-related issues that I believe wasn't disclosed. And, you know, as we talked about earlier in this Collier County Public Schools versus Mason Classical Academy, this is a fact-finding purpose because this is one of our four charter officials we hire. I, I am going back to, f to follow through with some questions to make sure we get clarity. And unfortunately, the other three charter officials, the city clerk, the city manager, and our internal auditor, I don't believe they have that right for attorney-client privilege if they were going through the hiring process with us. And so, and with this Collier County Public Schools, at the time, we talk about that attorney-client privilege can't be withheld, but Mr. Salzman was our temporary attorney. He was already working for us during the permanent hiring process. 
So there are, there are many variables involved in what I call this mess or conundrum. Uh, ex party communication, the day it was asked, there was a, an eerie silence. And that, that's all I can say. You have to go back and watch the tape. I truly believe one more question or two could help expand the situation and really get some answers that uh, the people want. And Mr. Salzman also did give an example of an, of an example of attorney being approached by a commissioner in which he may want to expound on that in which if a commissioner approached him saying he wanted to get rid of an attorney and hire him, that there was no ethics violations for the attorney. I'm sorry, could you restate that? Yes. There was an example during the meeting in which... Which meeting? Uh, the meeting I had with the city manager and attorney Salzman, in which Mr. Salzman gave the example in which if a sitting commissioner approached him and said he didn't like the current city attorney and he was going to try to fire him and he wanted him to be the attorney, that there was no ethics violation on behalf of the city attorney. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Say, yeah. <laughs> or, well, you, you did saying, say Commissioner Eisner. Are you saying oh, I, that that happened so, or you're saying that that... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get well, to. The well, example yeah. was given, if you would yeah, like let, to Let clarify. me just explain the example. This is before anybody is... Let me preface this, and I think Regina already talked about this and some of the questions were asked. So we have professional canons, and one of the canons allows for privilege. And I gave the example um, that if one of you commissioners came up to me before had, I'm not hired as a city attorney or interim city attorney, and you called me up and asked for legal advice and said, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. I can't disclose that information that you told me that unless you disclose it but because you contacted me for legal advice. You didn't hire me, but I still can't disclose that information. That's privileged information. And yes, it's different than city manager, and it's different than a, a city clerk, and it's different than a city auditor because, city, uh, because attorneys have an obligation of canons of ethics. And that's what Regina was talking about. Sometimes there are circumstances where they can be changed or, I mean, I've litigated this issue on when things are privileged and when they're not. But the privilege doesn't go to the attorney. The privilege goes to the individual. So as I've stated before, and I told commissioner, I can't say anything because it's not my privilege to waive. If the commissioner wishes to waive it, that's up to them. Now, I understand you know, what, what the alleged allegations are, I was using that example to say that, you know, it, it's ironic because the hiring of any, uh, any of your charter officers is done by three of you, right? At least three. Sometimes there's a requirement of four. Um, so that one person on the board by themselves has no individual power. Um, but a commissioner, and I've seen this happen because I've been involved in it. I've seen commissioners say, hey, I want to get rid of the city attorney. They can contact an attorney and say, you know, ask him about that. That didn't happen in my particular case, but yeah, they can do that. That's not unethical for the attorney. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't comment on the commissioner. I said the attorney. Because you have to have the ability to feel free to contact an attorney no matter what the case is. In a criminal case, you contact an attorney, divorce, anything. You're getting, that, that's a privileged matter. It's one of the privileges, husband and wife privilege, attorney privilege, um, um, religious pr privilege. Those are a few of the privileges that are allowed according to the law. So that's what I was explaining. I just want to add a legal thing to that. There are wealthy people that contact multiple attorneys so that the other party cannot even utilize that attorney to defend the case. That is true. There's a classic Thank example you. of doing that in divorce cases. That's all I wanted so you to can, say. Uh, just conflict out. And how you really conflict out is you say, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about a divorce, and you give a few facts, <laughs> and then you're like, okay, thanks. So when right. you posed this question, was it hypothetical or was it specific? No, it was just an example. It was just hypothetical. But would the, 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 yes, but the ex conflict did you out? What? If if you had privilege with 
the commissioner on a personal level? Because I would have. It obviously wasn't on a on a on a. He wasn't representing himself to you as a board member asking you questions. He was representing himself as right. an individual. So as, again, without way, trying to di without disclosing anything of a <laughs> privilege, right. I can say to you that if somebody contacts me as an attorney before I'm representing a government agency, okay, that privilege clicks in when any advice is given, no matter what the situation is. However, what, one thing I want to point out, and Regina talked about it, is that, and, and I made it very clear, I never had a, a, I had no conflict with anybody on the board prior to becoming the interim city attorney. No, that, that's where I was getting a little with your question. I don't think you weren't asking Mr. Salzman if that, if what he, if an actual conversation took place that uh, Commissioner Kulia was describing um, actually took place and that was the, the uh, uh, pri privileged speech. I think you were saying that as a hypothetical, I guess, your question. Well, no, I'm asking when conflicts arise. Yes. Um, if, let's say, we use the thing, the divorce conflict, right? So you, somebody, you're a divorce lawyer, somebody calls you, says, hey, I want to divorce my wife, and you say, okay, I, I, I can't really, um, I can't take your case because I, handled something else over here. Right. Okay. So because that involves that particular matter. Right. If there's a matter where that you were being asked to represent somebody and you represent somebody else in that matter, you have a conflict for that matter. So if 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 commissioner well at that it would have been Mr. Eiser, not Commissioner Eiser asking you questions. If he's asking you questions that relate to board matters would that have conflicted you out from being able to come work for this board? No, it would have conflicted me out if there was a matter that he discussed it with me that went before the board and then there was, and, and it came before the board okay. as me in the capacity as, as okay. attorney, but that, well, I can, can't say anything. I, I, wanna, I, just wanna, I just wanna say something. Uh, and we've had this conversation. Um, I see the frustration of Commissioner Eiser. I, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, is that what you were? No, <laughs> I didn't know what that <laughs> sign was. They uh, almost the hearing. I you want to give me something to drink. <laughs> 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 he was like this. I thought he wanted to give me something to drink. No, I'm already. I got some water here. Okay. So, um, but we we've had this conversation, and. I, I, this perception yes. that we need to clear up today is you had an introduction to Mr. Mr. Eisner, Commissioner Eisner, um, and you were discussing anything. I don't care what you were discussing. You had a communication with him um, prior to Attorney Trask leaving it's common knowledge that Commissioner Eisner had issues with Commissioner Trask, specifically charging on bills of travel time and, and so forth. Um, then he, he, he resigns, then you are now here. Not true. Okay. Well, there's no, some no, steps let me finish. missing. I know, right? I know there's a step, and that's why that's what I'm bringing this up for. I'm not, this isn't I got you. No, no, I'm not I understand. Trying to get, I'm not trying to get Commissioner Eiser. I want this thing cleared up. I know the missing pieces here, and I think they're important. Okay. So then you are here, and you're now the one of the city attorney, one of the two city attorneys yes. who had a communication with somebody who had an issue with, uh, com who, with Attorney Trask. The perception would be a common perception. I understand that. And them. you would understand right. that. We talked the about it. The common perception would be that, you know, he, he wanted, you, you know, wanted to boot out com Commissioner uh, uh, Attorney Trask and then bring you in. Okay. I, I, I want it, I hope we can clear this up today so we can move on with our business. Um, and let's, talk about what are these missing parts, if you can talk about I them. I can talk about the missing parts. Let me talk about them first. Okay. Okay. 
And I put on, I believe I told the newspaper, uh, and I, I at least have said that, I never talked to anybody about being interim city attorney or replacing Tom Trask um, the, with any commissioner, with anybody here other than the city manager. And, and here's my understanding, and Mark's here so he can correct. My understanding is that Mark went to a city manager's meeting. This was after Tom had resigned mm -hmm. and said he was looking for a city attorney and he talked to Jim O'Reilly, who's the city manager of Gulfport, and he said, why don't you talk to Andy? Mark and I have known each other because I was a prosecutor when Mark was a police officer. So we've known each other for know, 37 years his office, not even Mark, and I asked the name of the lady again, contacted, I got an email or a message that said, would you be interested in helping out the city as interim city attorney? So I responded, well, I need to find out what it is because I have night meetings and all these other things, but I'm happy to help. And that started a uh, communication back and forth with Mark. Okay. And it ultimately came before the board for approval as <coughs> interim. I talked to nobody on the board other than what I just said, which is why I looked at that meeting about, because uh, I, I took over litigation. And so there were questions about litigation that I talked to Commissioner Eisner and the mayor about. You know, you know and I think that this could have been averted. Um, when I was on the planning and zoning, I had a conf, uh, you asked about, uh, I'm, I'm speaking to, uh, Ms. Kardash, yes. um, about ex parte communication. Mm -hmm. I said I'd had something. You asked me to expand on it, mm -hmm. and I did. And therefore, at that meeting, when you said, yeah, I talked to Commissioner Meiser, and Commissioner Meiser might have said he talked to you, an expansion would have been helpful at that time. And, I, and, I understand. And, and maybe this whole thing could have well, been averted. Because I, I know you asked, because you were very specific, even when I had a conflict, you said, can you expand on that conflict? You want you, you just you didn't accept, oh, I just say I have a conflict, you said, tell me about it. Commissioner, so there's I think, a difference in the conflict. And again, unfortunately, I'm not hiding behind anything. I know, I know. It's a privilege. It's a privilege that I can't waive. I know. If I could waive, I would have answered the question months ago. Yeah, it's I'm just saying if, if, it, if it could have come out That's at that time, difference. I think that then it wouldn't. This whole thing wouldn't have simmered well, if and I had, become if what, I say and be that, here where we are then, today. Then I'm so. committing an ethics violation. Yeah. So that's why I try to be as straight up as I can. I get it. But I get it. I'm precluded from that. I understand the questions, and I, <laughs> you know, I can answer them if yeah. the privilege is waived. But this is a missing piece hmm. that understand. hasn't been part of the story. Sure. Okay. So obviously a very important part of, of the story. And I, that's all. Did can, you I, can I have a point of order here for one second? Can I have that? Sure. Can I have the floor? Mm -hmm. I have a stack of paper here that is going to answer every question that you could possibly come up with. Um, if you, I, I don't know if you have anything more pertinent to say, but I have everything here that will answer every single question that you could come up with unless you are got something that is really hidden. That's all. I, I, I don't know what you're going to present. So I don't have anything hidden, uh, Commissioner Eiser. I am strictly asking probing questions that haven't even led to any type of okay. assumption or, you know, we're basically going down this path of fact-finding. Let, let me just say something sure. so related to what you're going to do. I, in um, Mr. Salzman's reference to the city manager, I want to make sure that everyone understands the city manager was tasked with hiring the interim attorneys to fill in with uh, when Trash Stagnall resigned. And um, I'm pretty sure that there wasn't any commissioner helping you in that. Is that correct for the there record? There was none, no. Okay. Thank and you. there were four attorneys that you selected or brought on board. One was Mrs. Jackson, the Voss firm, which later dropped out. Mr. Salzman and Ms. Kardash, is that the four? Yes, okay. and, and Ms. Kardash and Mr. Salzman was, res, was the result of me talking with some of my city managers saying, I'm in trouble. We've got 30 days and we will not have an attorney. I need somebody in there now. 
and some of them told me their firms were trying to find people to handle their affairs, so obviously they were not people to go to in the cities because the attorneys were hiring. They didn't have the attorneys to handle their own city without going out. So the names I came up with, and I think the Voss Group actually came from the RFP. I never talked to them, but, but these were two of the attorneys um, that was referenced from throw me somebody out there to go to, and the city managers, and of course, I knew both of them. They were both people I knew because I'd worked with them both before. Jackson was And Ms. Jackson was already, is. she was the first one I screamed to and begged her, please, I know you're a labor attorney, you're not into all these city areas, but I, I need you in your 20 years or so you've worked with us and stuff, we're really in need with you now that gives me one but of course she had the rest of this litigation the city processes she'd do the best she could she'd get help where she could but I needed some other people and of course those two names I know would would meet it so that's why I gave them immediately to Janina please call these these are the names I got obviously we we're going to go out for some other ones which is why we got the Voss group and I forget the name of the group from Orlando. We got them through that process, but these I needed somebody now before we did all this stuff to try to come on board and help me. And I was able to get that the, the three-person team that made us survive, um, and we'd have been more farther behind today if we didn't have that one. So that was my press. I mean, and I did that all. You directed me to go do that. After you directed me, I involved none of y'all. Not me, the commission. You, you the commission. Yeah, <laughs> right. you, I say you and Thank you. You're looking at me. You and the commission. <laughs> the royal. Uh, right. You and the commission I'm author. accused of being the ringleader. And, up here, and, so. and I took the ball running as I'm supposed to do, and uh, and and that's where it went. So thank you. Okay. All right. So let me get this straight, though. The, the bulk of this question, the origin of all of this, is based upon a text that you received from Linda Eisner in July that you've outlined before that said there are attorneys waiting and ready. This is what caused all of this? No, oh, what caused? Well, that, that triggered, uh, obviously, a potential sunshine issue in which, you know, I wasn't going to get into any discussion with any wives regarding it, but really what prompted it was his statement to that, to that uh, reporter, whether I did or didn't, it's nobody's business. And I completely disagree with that statement. Well, you can this disagree. Is, this is the true. public, this is the people of Tarpon Springs. This is all of their business. Mm -hmm. And what I will state is we keep talking about this attorney client privilege and that's okay. The substance of that attorney client privilege can be withheld. But the date in which that attorney-client privilege started can be disclosed. And that goes with the case Wise for Southern Tier Express, Inc., case number 2-15-CV-01219-APG-PAL, in which uh, the plaintiff Wise contended that the date he hired his attorney necessarily reveals his communication to the lawyer that he wanted to hire him, but the court rejected his intuitive, attractive argument, noting that identifying the date Weiss contacted or hired his attorney discloses an act, not the substance of a confidential communication. So we would like to know the date in which uh, Commissioner Eisner did retain your attorney-client privilege services. And so... I would just like to see the case. Sure. I mean, I, again, I'm happy to disclose anything I can disclose. Sure. But And I've always told everybody on this board, I'm very conservative with my opinions. So I try to be, when I protect you all, I try to be as conservative as I can. So if there's a doubt, I usually go towards uh, what the rule says. And I'm just following what the professional conduct rule is. So let me try to, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this inception. So your concern now is the date they first spoke rather than the subject of or the the, the subject of or uh, whatever falls under that subject that they discuss at that particular time. So your concern is when was the first time that Commissioner Eisner spoke to the attorney? Sir, we, we, we've, what we've come across are roadblocks here, Vice Mayor, and with those roadblocks, we've had to find detours. And so I have a lot of concerns. All city-related issues that were discussed with uh, Attorney Salzman between Eisner should have been disclosed. 
to the extent during that ex parte communications. But since that can't be disclosed to me, I was able to find out the date in which it was retained must be disclosed. That cannot remain confidential. Okay, so the date has to be disclosed as far as you're concerned, but not the context of the conversation. And you've already heard that, that uh, you know, testimony from, from attorney Salzman that, that they did not discuss the dismissal of, or actually anything, I think, to do with, with Tom Trask. I so have a point of order, though. This is, this is just about the date that he first talked. I mean, right. I'm sorry, but I've been listening to this for hours. I mean, on different dates and so forth, and I don't understand the concern that you're trying to bring forward about the first date that one of our commissioners spoke to a lawyer. Sir, do you not understand the depth of integrity that we're talking about here with attorney-client privilege and we are doing a hiring process between four of our city officials and you can't comprehend that, Vice Mayor? Do you, does that not concern you at all? Because I'll tell you guys right now, if I would have known during this hiring process that these two had an attorney-client privilege prior to the hiring process, I would have fought tooth and nail to go back to another RFP and go back to another RFP. Because when all, those inter when all those attorneys applied, I'm just like you. I never spoke to any of them, unless you did speak to any of them. I didn't speak to any of them. Mayor, did you speak to any of those attorneys prior to them to the RFP process? No. Uh, Commissioner Koulianis, did you? I wasn't on the board. No, thank you. Well, I spoke to Mr. Salzman about the Anklote Harbor. Yeah. I can't tell you whether that was before the RFP was issued or after the RFP is issued? That was before the RFP was issued. But and I was, already and I was the liaison from the commission appointed to do that, and I was bringing Mr. Salzman up to speed from turning over uh, from Mr. Dagnall. And I can assure you, Mr. Salzman and I never spoke about anything concerning city attorney uh, coming on board or participating or, or any of that. I didn't it was strictly speak to anybody about that. So I just want to make more. sure, I just want to make sure that um, it's clear as order? far as the timing on it goes. So, um, well, uh, Mayor, if I could just say, number one, while I understand your question, I have said that I didn't do anything. And you're I talking do, about me now? No, mm -hmm. and yeah. I've been an AV rated attorney for 25 years. I've been an attorney in this, area for, in Florida for my whole career, 37 years, and I do, I do resent being accused of something that I haven't done. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that because I didn't do anything, and I said that at a meeting. I've done nothing unethical, and my ethics are more important than any position. Um, so I'm offended by that, fairly. Um, again, in trying to use the example, if I had any any conflict, I'd have to disclose it. That's an ethical responsibility. I don't have a conflict. I didn't have a conflict. I answered everything that I could answer. I've never had a, I've never represented the Eisners. I still have never represented the Eisners. I can't tell you anything more than that, other than I have, I'm bound by ethics, which are, I, I guess y'all don't seem to understand how important the canons of ethics are for an attorney. That is our, we cannot violate them because we no longer can serve as attorneys in the state of Florida. They will take our license. Sure, sure. Uh, by the way, that's a Washington case. It doesn't have any precedent in Florida. I oh. can't follow that. But if you find a Florida case, I'm I, happy. Yep. Can I just go ahead? Yep. Well, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I, uh, I, I really want to move ahead. I've got a lot of stuff here and it's gonna, like I keep telling you, it's gonna answer all these questions. Um, I don't know, we could keep asking these questions, but um, first of all, Commissioner Coolius, you used the word we need to. So who is the other part of we? The city of Tarpon Springs, the people of Tarpon Springs, absolutely, you, you keep, and this board. You keep saying we, and you're speaking for thee. And I don't know who we is. You did that at a few meetings, and I meant to ask you who we is because you're just representing ghost people. Um, do you have anybody like that signed a petition that's come before and said who we is? I don't need them to sign a petition. I need okay. pe people come to me. So the answer is we is you. 
No, absolutely not. Okay. And, and it should be this board. This board wants to sit there and ignore this uh, elephant in the I'm sorry, you're not room. this board. You are you. <laughs> and you think you represent a certain percentage or all of the people of Tarpon Springs, that's fine. But to come before us and say, well, the people of Tarpon Springs in generality, that doesn't wash in this particular case when it looks like you're trying to impeach at least the credibility of one of our commissioners and our city lawyer. On no I mean, facts. I'm offended for the city lawyer because he's already asked and answered the questions that you had. He did not have any conversation about removing Mr. Trask. He did not have any previous conversations with, with Commissioner Eisner about being selected as a city attorney. So I'm, I'm failing to see your point here. My point is that privilege needs to be waived so we can get the answers that we need that he cannot answer due to his code of ethics. I, so, I have to ask one. I still think I want to have this flaw. Do you want to declare here every conversation that you have with Jerry Theophilus before any meeting? Jerry Theophilus is not a city attorney that's been I didn't hired ask here. that. But I, you had no problem he's asking not my me. city attorney. You had no problem asking me if he represented me in the past, and I said absolutely. But when the question comes to you... You hide behind this attorney-client privilege veil. And so what I'd like to go is start in again with my, my statements. And so He doesn't want me to read these. Well, you had four weeks to produce it, and now you're producing it the day of, sir. So now I'd like to, now that the attorney is our city attorney and Commissioner Iser refuses to waive his privilege for the sake of transparency, perception, and avoiding even the mere appearance of impropriety. So if any other commissioner or the mayor ever spoke to Attorney Salzman, we need to know now. If... You're if, asking before I became interim. Sure. That, that, no, just trying to nail the time period. Sure. And if, you know, if no one during the hiring process there was an attorney-client privilege, I would have never approved Attorney Salzman as our city attorney. Look, you, you need to understand something. Even if... If, if, if Attorney Salzman responded to the RFP, and correct me if I'm wrong, we wouldn't have known that. Is that correct as far as the public record? Who responded to the RFP until they're open? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I think that's the case. I might be wrong, but I, I'm relying on... Until we can't. I can't go to Ms. Lewis and say who responded to the RFP. She, I know that I've done that. In the, she says, I can tell you... We've gotten some responses. That's as much as she could do. So I have no knowledge as far as what attorney firms respond to the RPs. I mean, I just want to make sure that that's clear for everybody here in this room. So I... And, I, you know, I also want to know how Commissioner Eisner or any other member of this board met Attorney Salzman and who introduced Attorney Salzman and Commissioner Eisner to each other. Well, <laughs> and I would also like to hear... From, I got two more statements, Commissioner Colinas, and then the floor okay. is yours, sir. All right, thank you. And I would like to hear from the rest of this board on these questions that can't be answered because of the veil of attorney-client privilege. And if Commissioner Eisner doesn't waive his privilege, then we have a conflict or potential ethics issue. So that's my statements for now. So on that, can, I, can I be the first to answer that question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, Vice Mayor, I think that... Um, your condemnation of uh, Commissioner Kulias is a little aggressive. Yes, sir. Um, because I think it's a legitimate question. Okay. They, uh, one of our commissioners met with uh, a pro uh, who, uh, with a, an attorney who turned out to eventually become our city attorney. And again, we had the issues with um, and this and this commissioner was the strongest um, and most vocal opponent to the prior city attorney. Those facts create a question. Okay, they create, a, and, and I think you even agree with me, Mr. Salzman, that they create a question. I do so, I and, and I you. think you do. Sure. And and I think any reasonable person would do that. Commissioner Kulias is. Uh, is, is discussing that issue, okay? Now, the time that they met would have been relevant because if they met, you know, 
uh, during the time that all this conflict was going on between our commissioner and our former city attorney, it would have been relevant to t if they were talking at that time and there was, in now again, what they talked about, I, I believe, Commission, I believe uh, Attorney Salzman, um, and, I, and I believe uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Eisner, okay, that that wasn't the conversation. I do, but it's, it's a, a legitimate question. So he's not to be villainized for bringing up a legitimate, uh, uh, whether they're coincidental, coincidental facts or situation, it's a legitimate question, okay? So but it's been asked and answered. But he, a he asks, he's, that's what he's asking. He asked the question, okay? So he asked the question about timing. Timing would have been relevant in this case. Okay, I think uh, our city manager expressing what he did, that you're, uh, you're uh, being chosen as the interim had no relationship to that conversation between you and, and Commissioner Eisner. That is correct. Okay, that's obviously another relevant fact. So the fact that, that Commissioner Kulias is bringing this up doesn't make him, I, he should not be demonized for doing that. I think it's a legitimate question. No, that I think it would. I think this would have been better um, addressed at the, at the time as it, when we talked about ex parte and maybe a little bit of elaboration might have didn't resolved it. And then he could have chimed in and he would have said, "Yeah, I, I picked the guy. He, just, he didn't pick the guy. I picked the guy." Okay, and all that would have been. Um, Maybe we wouldn't be here right now having this. So I'm happy that this is getting out there, that the, the story is being told, and we can move on as a commission. You know, uh, I, I was really excited about this meeting, not, for, not because of number seven. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't about number seven. It was about the other parts of this meeting because, you know, we talked, um, you know, you and I bantered back and forth about, you know, changing and this and that. You know, we, we don't, we can't, obviously we don't change our personality, but we can change our functionality, right? Mm -hmm. And that's everything you're talking to us about, is how we do things, that we do things a little better, and that we get, and, you know, I, I'm going to make sure my wife doesn't text any commissioners, because I don't think it's good policy, right? Okay. Um, she may have the right to do it, and we have things that we have a right to do, but then there's things that are smart to do or not do, okay? So I think that, um, you know, there's a lawsuit most likely coming around the corner. I mean, we already have the parts of it and the rest of it's coming. And that'll, you know, that's going to be where it, that falls where it falls. Um, and then people will be deposed and all kinds of stuff will, will get uh, um, exposed. But right now, we got to move on for what's best for this city. And we have to be able to function together. And I believe, let's, I hope that this is the end of this conversation. I really do, I hope we, we've gotten some facts out. I don't know, you can, you can say whatever that you wanna say, but I hope that this is the very end of this with us. Now what some outside parties do, that's something we have no control of. Um, but I, I hope that, that we can move forward and get some things done for the city and um, but again I, I have to defend my colleague and friend Commissioner Kulias because I think it's a legitimate question okay can I take this floor from here yes I'm done thank you so first thing I want to do thank you are you done Kulias I'm sorry uh, I do I do want to make another comment I, I do not feel villainized up here Never once do I feel villainized or feel like I'm an outcast. I'm very proud to be up here and, and, and talk about the issues that some of these board members are trying to deflect from. But the bottom line is, especially you, Vice Mayor, if you don't support the fact that Commissioner Iser should waive his privilege to find out what they discussed about city-related issues prior to Trask's resignation, whether it was about Trask or not, then shame on you. I'm and sorry, that's the I, bottom I, line. I thought your questions were in particular relation to Trask. They were. And to his, and to Andrews um, being selected for city manager. I didn't think that your realm of questioning involved 
anything else, whether they discuss the weather or whether they discuss a personal matter or not. I thought those were two specific points you were after. Mr. Salzman has already given you an answer saying they did not discuss this, they did not discuss that, and I think that's asked and answered. I think anything else around this <coughs> is, is not pertinent to this situation. So there's seven questions, in which, seven or eight, which he can't answer due to his code of ethics, that so you think they're not pertinent to this situation that we're talking about here? Can I answer all these questions that we keep going in a circle so we could move on? Because otherwise, my uh, city clerk is going to be ordering dinner for us. I'm just telling you, I'm going to answer every question that you ask. That's what I said, and I don't think anybody heard that. Can, we, can I take the floor from here? Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yes. Sorry. If we can keep it neutral and refrain from comments like the rest of the commission is deflecting and nobody's up here listening to what I'm saying and just get to the point of the bottom line. I mean, there's veiled comments that are being thrown in there that I take offense to. And even in your memorandum, I took offense to that, that I'm trying to do something. The difference between April 11th and April 28th is the fact that we have a lawsuit right now. April Thank 11th, you. we did not have a lawsuit. Thank we you. have an April, we have a lawsuit right now. I've discussed it with both Attorney Salzman and Attorney Kardash. I have concerns about the conversation, whether it's fair or not. It's in, it's in a lawsuit, I've said a number of times. Lawsuits will sort things out, as Commissioner Kuliana said. So in moving forward in this discussion, I, we can talk about anything. I, I don't really care, but I'd like to keep it, you know, whatever you have to say, say it about yourself, Commissioner Eisner, whatever you have to say, Commissioner Kuliana, say it about yourself. I'm sure Vice Mayor Lunt, if he's got something to say, he's going to say it for himself and the same with me. I don't want to get dragged into, like, I'm deflecting or the rest of the commission isn't listening to me or anything like that. So please move ahead. Thank you. First thing I'd like to do is explain to and apologize to the residents for this whole thing even coming about. Um, one of the reasons that I do not wish to speak about um, any conversation um, is because we have a lawsuit that is pending and I'm trying to take the responsible way out of this. So I want to start off by handing you this piece of paper. You could hand it this, this way. I have a piece of paper in front of me that was written by a doctor professor at St. Leo University. He teaches criminal justice. He's one of the top Miami chief of police cops who handled the Super Bowl security. His name is Eloy Nunez. This is dated January 20th, 2022, and I hope I don't get choked up in reading it. My name is Eloy Nunez. I served as Rotary District Governor in 2018-2019. I'm writing this letter on behalf of my good friend and fellow Rotarian, Mike Eisner. I first met Mike and his wife, Linda, a few years ago at a reception party for a group of Rotary Youth Exchange students who had just arrived in the U.S. for one year to stay with the new host families. Rotary Youth Exchange is one of the favorite programs in Rotary and one that Mike and Linda have long supported. My first impression of Mike was that he had a great sense of humor. That impression has not waned in the years that I've now known him. I've learned that a good sense of humor says a lot about a person, but it's only a superficial attribute that doesn't really define one's character. My impression of Mike Eisner was developed in time, in time as I got to know him better. I have found him to be a truly authentic person to his core and who has a genuine devotion to serving others. One of my responsibilities as district governor in charge of 1,800 Rotarians was to appoint Rotarians to 64 positions in district organization chart. As I became more familiar with Mike and his work ethic over the months leading up to my term, I asked him if he would consider serving as a membership chair of the district which is one of the seven most critical positions in the district. At first, Mike was hesitant because he had only been a Rotarian for a short time, and he felt he needed to learn much more about the organization in order to be effective. Indeed, the governor at the time, the present governor at the time, had asked me to reconsider my decision to appoint Mike maybe as a membership chair for the same reason. Or 
He felt that such an important role should be staffed by a more experienced Rotarian. While I considered the governor's advice very carefully, I knew that Mike would do the job good in that position. I thought to myself, who better to understand how to recruit and retain new Rotarians than a new Rotarian such as Mike Eisner? Indeed, I had once been a new Rotarian, and not long ago, I turned out all right. So I went with my gut instinct and took a big chance in appointing Mike to one of the most important positions in Rotary, district rather. As I look back, I have to admit I was not successful at, with all 64 appointments. Some simply, simply just didn't even work out, as I expected or hoped. But in the case of Mike Eisner, it worked out better than I could have ever imagined. Mike worked harder at his new position than any Rotarian that I've ever known. He visited and spoke at every one of the 48 Rotary Clubs at least once during my term as governor. Everywhere he visited, he brought extraordinary enthusiasm, which seemed to rub off on all other Rotarians. He did this on his own time and his own expense. He also appointed key, highly motivated people to his committee to help spread the best practices of recruiting and retraining new members. Mike poured his heart and soul into the job I asked him to do. At the end of the term, at the district award banquet, I bestowed Mike Eisner <laughs> the highest award that a Rotarian can receive at the district level. I made him the district Rotarian of the year. That's how highly I thought of his hard work and dedication to service above self. I took a big chance with Mike to be our district membership chair in 2018. I consider that to have been my best decision ever. I hope that others will take a chance on him too. Signed, Eloy Nunes. Now, I'm reading this because as attorney Salzman has said, to you that there was no ex parte communication, there was no talk of anything, I'm saying the same exact thing. And the fact that this is being brought up is an insult when we have a pending lawsuit, and I prefer not to speak to it. So I want to ask, I've been accused of a number of things, and I need to clarify and change the opinion of the residents. So I'd like to ask you, who's Nick? Cavuculis? Cavalicles? Cavacles. Cavacles. Who is that? Nick Cavacles. Yes, who is that? Who Nikita. Is it? Nikita Cavacles. You know who the answer. It? Why don't you answer it? No, I want you to answer the question. Are you trying to bring in opinions from other people now? Because nope. that's all this rotary thing was okay. a, a deflection. So you don't want to answer it, so I'll read it. Good morning, Mr. Vatikiotis. This is from Nick, Vatic uh, um, Nick uh, Vat Cavicles. I am addressing this letter to you because in a very short time, you're going to be the next mayor. Over the, next past two, over the past two years, I've watched citizens and city employees being berated. I harassed, um, harassed and taunted with so, many, so much as peep from your seat. Not once have you publicly spoken out about defending this. As you know, I supported and donated to a candidate which I believe truly was the best option for our city. Unfortunately, she did not win. That person was, of course, the person that Coolius ran against. As you know, per the email sent to the city manager, I and my family have received an invitation to the swearing in of this newly appointed candidate. The invitation was addressed in the exact manner as was the donation to that candidate that we supported. According to the city, the invitation I was referring to was sent per request by the new candidate-elect. This is without a doubt taunting and harassment ploy by the candidate-elect. We are no strangers to these taunts, as you could obviously see per all the restraining orders that we have Mayor, issued. Mayor, point of order here. I, I'm how reading. Is this, how is this? Even remotely relevant to this I'm subject ask matter. The city attorney still How is this remotely re related to this subject this matter? This is all opinion. No, it, it's like I. It, all right. Is deflecting from the facts. So, um, 
I am not familiar with the communication you're reading or where it's going. Right. Um, I am not really sure that it is um, particularly relevant if we're going to start talking about people's character because it seems, you know, Could that. You, let me explain to you why then I'm, well, I'm reading this. Okay. But hold on just okay. a second. Um, I, I do understand, um, you know, you did read the one. Um, and, and I didn't really comment on it, and neither did Attorney Salzman, um, from, you know, your friend that was talking about what you do in your community service. And oh. certainly, you know, that's something that we should all applaud, right. um, you know, when we do that um, and, and when we're recognized for, for our good deeds. Because I don't think that happens often enough, right? Um, but let's try and stick to the good that we do in, in our community. Um, a lot of people have things where they maybe haven't made the best decisions in the past, um, and that applies to everybody equally. Um, and you always have the option moving forward um, of making better decisions, right? Um, and so, you know, it's one thing to bolster somebody somebody's character. There's nothing really that says in your rules of decorum or rules of procedure um, about bolstering character. Um, but I do believe uh, that you are not permitted to um, attack somebody's character. So let me answer your uh, comment. Okay. I sat up there for 20 minutes at that first meeting mm -hmm. with Commissioner Coolius berating me as a bully. He, he claimed I was a bully. He claimed <laughs> I went up and down a street and did things. And this is a, which is all hearsay because he has no facts to it. And this is, in facts, it is a letter written by his first cousin saying that he is bullying him. And he denied that he even sent him the invitation. And I have Irene's response that that's who sent this invitation. He sent it to, to antagonize him. So he is a bully talking to me that I'm a bully without any facts. So that was my first comment that I wanted to make. If you don't want to hear it, I'm happy to put it down. Commissioner Eisen, if I could just there clarify, Ms. Jacobs did not tell you that uh, Commissioner Coulia sent it to antagonize. To no, no, antagonize. that's correct. And I never denied not sending it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, you didn't want to answer my questions. You're bringing family matters into a public setting, which is fine. It can happen. Well, my wife ways. into it. But this this letter, this rotary letter, by the way, I may mention, Mr. Eisner is no longer part of the historic Tarpon Springs Rotary. That's been over a hundred years. He actually had so many conflicts within it. He tried to fight, form his own right, rotary, we, hey, in which Mayor, he's not even please. part of anymore. I, I'm telling you, I, I you think know, you know we are we. Kulianis, yeah. I understand what you're saying. And, and I, I'm not going to, we've got two attorneys here that just lectured one commissioner about the exact same thing another commissioner is doing. I, I hear We're you. all adults. I hear you. We're all adults. Yeah. So at some point, <laughs> we're going to step up and be adults. And please, let's just move ahead. As I said before, follow our rules of decorum. Attorney Kardash made it clear, no more character assassinations, attacks, personal innuendos. Stick to what the issue is. Please, does that address it? Thank you. No. Whoever's got the floor. Well, you're saying <laughs> you 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 basically are defending yourself. I am basically defending myself. All right. I I need to be able to um, declare the pot calling the kettle black, and I I, I still <laughs> I, right. I, I, I I hear you. Okay. Let me, let me ask this. This is a, he, he, uh, Compicia Coolius wrote about texts with my wife. So um, in that attack of me, he said, he used the words we. And then his comment was, Commissioner Eisner, who's we? Was that we and Craig Lunt? Was that we and the mayor? No, it had to be we and your wife, right? Under so, Florida law, can we discuss pronouns anymore? I'm not really sure. <laughs> so I looked back. He only copied certain um, ones of these text messages, but we was used by Commissioner Coolius, not by my wife. So, And that's very important because he's the one that said, we have a attorney ready to go. So... He was the one that used the word we. 
I can promise you that everyone always has an attorney ready to go. I, I know. <laughs> and that is I just, know. that's just the reality of the situation. You know, Attorney Salzman and I, we work in a very competitive business, um, and even more so because it is so public, right? And so there's a, there's a lot that goes on um, in terms of how these different firms that do the type of work that we do operate. Um, you know, we are held to um, a higher standard in terms of how we operate because we are, in addition, like we said, subject to not only your ethics rules, but also the Florida Bar's ethics rules. Um, and, you know, we have to answer to bodies, governing bodies outside of your city commission on a regular basis, we have to do that, right? Um, and ultimately, part of my concern here is, you know, where this road is going to lead, right? What is what basically I'm trying to figure out because yeah. it just just I haven't been in a lot of your city commission meetings, I watch what I can um, when I have the opportunity. Um, but um, Ultimately, I, I guess I'm sitting here asking, what is really the the end game um, for you all in this? Because I mean, is it are, if if you're trying to get rid of your city attorneys, you know, we proposed together, we submitted our proposal together, um, and if your your end game is to invalidate that proposal. Um, then I, I, I think we're, we're both going to be gone. So I guess my ultimate question to the city commission is whether or not you're happy with your current legal representation. And if that's a problem, then we definitely need to discuss that and we need to know about it. Well, I, I have explained, and, I, and I'll tell you exactly where this route is going because I believe that waiver, that privilege needs to be waived. Bottom line, there were city-related issues that were discussed or, or not discussed, and the people of Tarpon Springs need to know. This board needs to know. And if this board, I'm going to be flat-out frank, if this board doesn't think that privilege should be waived so we could find out city what was discussed between these two individuals, then th that's on I, you. So, so from I, a, legal, a legal, a, a legal perspective, I? there's really no basis to waive the privilege or no requirement that he ra waive it. Um, you know, quite frankly, unless he's ordered to do so by a judge or who determines that the privilege doesn't exist, um, there is nothing that you as a body can do um, and nothing that Attorney Salzman or myself could do to waive anybody's attorney-client privilege, whether it's Commissioner Eisner's, whether it's yours um, with uh, Attorney Theophilus, you know, whoever it is. We have no authority over that, and neither does this board. That's a matter of state law. Sure. Well, if, the, if it's not waived, then I, like I've said, uh, I've, I've lost some of the confidence and some of the representation. I've spoken with you directly, Ms. Kardash. Yes. And, what, and I've said to this board, we may have to switch our meetings from the first and third Tuesdays. You've explained to me you wouldn't be able to take on that task till July. Mm -hmm. If that all pre well, came now, about. now we're, we would be looking at August or September. So can I can I ask a, <laughs> can I ask a question of uh, can I ask a question of uh, 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 of you uh, as as our our attorneys, mm -hmm. okay? And given that we have a lawsuit that has, um, do you really think this is smart for us to keep going down this road of conversation? <laughs> Do you, do you think it's even, do you think that we should even, no, I'm, and whether we should be reading texts open, out in, in the open, or whether we should be, I mean, the it's issue, your, the your issue's been brought out, the yeah. issue's been brought out. Speak solely as your litigation attorney? Yes, please. Of course not. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, the le, you know, the less is more, and, and, and I'm not trying to avoid anything, and I, I think we, we know that I'm not trying to avoid anything. But less is more. I, okay. I don't. So I, you I have really a provision in, that I haven't gotten. So are you are you, you advising us right now? Are you advising us right now to stop this conversation? I'm advising that yes. I wouldn't. <laughs> I t I'm taking that advice. Uh, uh, I, I make a motion. I would... make a, another motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? No. Nope. Do I hear a second, Vice Mayor? Vice Mayor, do you hear me? Oh no! I want to carry this out to its end. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, you're, I don't think you're going to get a second of that. Kind of I just want to. I just like this is. I think it's insane for us to be having this open conversation about things that are going to get litigated. It was insane to keep bringing it up three times, well, which he has done. You know, let me just say something. We seem to flip on both sides of the issue right here. We either 
don't want to do this for the purpose of litigation, then we say we all, the, we all have to hear it out till it's in. My concern has been the litigation since the litigation was filed, and I think the date was April 28th. And I've, and I've also asked, I keep flipping my brain between Commissioner and, and Attorney Salzman to issue that one provision in our charter which prohibits this kind of discussion that we're having. And even privately, that hasn't stopped anybody. And we're sworn, as Mrs. Uh, Kardash, Attorney Kardash, has shown us to, to abide by the charter. We swore that, that we promised that's what we're going to do. And we're still violating it. Because if we don't have this agenda item, we're going to be accused of something else. So, you know, and I've had these conversations for both attorneys to step in if they feel like we're jeopardizing ourselves in this lawsuit, which I think we are, just because of our own behavior right now. And I agree. And so uh, I, I, we're here. I want to finish to what we need to do to, unless the attorneys say absolutely not, to Commissioner Kulia's satisfaction, because you're the one who brought this forward. And, and, and if your position is that whatever, I, I'm not sure what your position is other than you're not gonna be happy until that attorney-client privilege is waived. And I think Attorney Kardash explained to you that nobody has that authority to do that except for the one person that has that privilege, which I believe in this case is Commissioner Eisner. And the commission has no authority to do that. So I guess it's either going to boil down to either you're going to be happy or you're not going to be happy as an individual commissioner. And then what do we do as a board moving forward? We just continue moving forward or do we do want to do something about uh, Commissioner Kulia? And I just say this with all due respect, whether, you know, about you being happy or not being happy. That's all I've got to say about that. So um, Ms. Kardash. Your comments are excellent. Where's this going? I have no idea where this is going. I don't know what's, where the end game is on this thing. All I know <laughs> is Commissioner Kulia asked for something, uh, an agenda item. The city manager felt, I felt it was better for um, a, a regular session to have more control over it from an attorney's perspective. The city manager felt it was better to do it here mm -hmm. so we could focus on city business on the regular session. So we're here. I, I'd like to finish what we what we started, and I, Commissioner Kulianis, I appreciate what you're saying, but <laughs> and I, I think we too, need to finish. What, but well, well, I, I think mean, we need he, to he, he's he's wants priv he wants privilege waived. The man saying he's not waiving priv privilege. Where are we going here? He doesn't I, well, want to waive privilege. Can, can and, I say something here? He doesn't. He can I, can not I, yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. I want I'm to get some advice from the attorneys what, where you feel we ought to go at this point on this. I mean, you've heard everything. You're as close to judges as we have in this matter. Do you have any ideas, any thoughts? Well, we, you know, we can't issue orders here. All we can do um, is advise you. Um, and um, what I would like to see, you know, is whatever information um, can be passed on. I believe we've already passed on. Um, I don't see where we can take any official action on anything that's been presented right now. Um, so you can you can keep bringing it up, that's your right, um, but to the extent that there's not going to be um, any resolution to your satisfaction, um, there will come a point in time where, where you're essentially beating the dead horse and, and that there's nowhere else we can go. And, and it does then turn to, are we wasting the city's time and taxpayer money talking about something that has no resolution? This is an immediation situation. You know, we're, we're all here trying to work through this together. And the more you attack each other, the more fodder you're giving the other side to throw back at exactly. you. Exactly. And, and whether you're, you're doing that and going to receive that individually and be responsible for that, or we're gonna to work together as a city to resolve that is going to depend on how you conduct yourselves um, in the city's official business. Sure. Regina, can I say something here? This is, this is not, I am happy to answer all Commissioner Coolius's questions after the case is closed. I am not happy to answer anything right now because, as I was told by both of you, 
don't speak of anything. Now, I have, you know, the responses and the answers, but giving those responses and answers would hinder our case or help our case. I don't know. Just saying so, that alone isn't helping. No, no, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> that doesn't. It, it, what I'm saying is it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm <laughs> I think I understand, and that's the key. Well, we're tearing apart the case no, 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 by no, no. talking about it, but, uh, you know, I, I just want you to understand, I don't want to talk about it. But it keeps getting brought up, and at the same time, it's not only getting brought up, but it's being brought up, and my, he, he's going after my reputation, he's going after integrity, he's going after my honesty. And I have been honest up until, you know, I, I just can't talk about I, that, I don't want to talk about I don't it. Well, now we have a clean slate, we've all received our ethics training, we've all received our sunshine law training. Right. Let's treat this as a clean slate. We can move forward and work on the business of the city. Right. I always say you cannot change the past, but what you can change is the actions that you want to take and how you want to proceed in the future. All right. So let's make that decision um, of how we want to move forward and how we're going to do that. Sure. Um, like, let me just go, Commissioner Quillard, this is your item. Did you want to have anything Yes, more I, I did, did want to continue? say I, I am still not sad. We could, you know, the, uh, I don't believe I caused this lawsuit. And there were some innuendos that were thrown out there that may have accused me as being one of the reasons behind that lawsuit during, you know, during the one of the regular session meetings or the OTA office meeting. And uh, if it's anyone on this board including the mayor that thinks they may be part of the, the lawsuit, then that needs to be disclosed now because wait, 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 wait. Let's, oh God. Oh, all we have is a public on, records right? lawsuit. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's not go anywhere else. The whole, uh, your, your code section just talks about um, not providing information that would put the city in, in bad light or, or have a legal aspect of it. Right now we're just dealing with public records. As far as I understand, sure. everybody has provided the public records that we need, and we're responding to it accordingly. Sure. And I will keep you updated on what's going on with that lawsuit. And, and if I could just add, Mayor, you know, I've been doing, I've been a city attorney a long time, and, and I know everybody on the board hopes that, and I hope you can all work together. There are, you know, we're human beings, and we all have different ways we come to things, and sometimes, we get along and sometimes, unfortunately, we don't. And that sometimes there's satisfaction, sometimes there aren't. Um, you, but there is a, a point where y'all are just, you know, going to have to work together. And there might be a consistent, I'm not happy, okay? That, that's a possibility. And I wish I could go like that and, you know, make you satisfied with everything. I, I, I do, and, and I've tried to the extent that, that I could. Um, there are some things I can't do. Uh, so, but, but as Regina said, you all have to move forward and work together for the city's business. And, and frankly, if we ever get to Robert's rules and your rules of procedure, you have adopted that that's your responsibility. I mean, that's why you're elected. You're elected to do, this, do the business for the city, do the business for the people, do the fiduciary responsibilities, and move things forward. And you have to move them forward. There are ways of dealing with that based on your rules and procedures. And sometimes, honestly, if you all continue the way this is going, well, you will have motions to adjourn, or you will have points of order, or you will have um, motions to table a particular issue. You know, all I can say to you is I, I just hope everybody tries to work together. Yeah, but so my final comment is if that if that privilege is not waived, I don't care if it's before or after, whatever is expected, the perception and transparency is, is out there, okay? No one can deny that. So if this board, as I said, you all individually can think for yourselves. It, I see it as an issue that it's not being waived. I'm asking this board to ask Commissioner Iser to waive his privilege, and okay. I expect you guys to ask him. And if you don't want to ask him, then that's a concern for, for myself and the people of Tarpon Springs that have reached out to me. So I have no further comments. But this issue will, will go to rest for the time being, but it will resurface again when it needs to because it obviously is an issue. Thank you. As litigation attorney, do you 
think it's with having a lawsuit against us. Is it best for me to um, move forward and remove that, or is it best I, I to? I can't give you. I any know ad that. Advice. I know. But in in the event of, I can't. I can't give legal advice, and neither okay. can Regina on that. Okay. You have to have your own attorney. What I dealt with was back in what I dealt with. I can't. That's that's the difference. You asked what the difference is. The difference is is if you don't have a conflict and you take on a client, you're responsible for that client. You're my client, the board. That's the client that I, but that doesn't, <laughs> unfortunately, that doesn't waive a, and as, you, as Regina talked about, and the rules are very clear, that doesn't waive a prior client's rights at all, and I can't do that. So if you're asking me from solely as a litigation attorney, I'm going to tell you, please don't say anything about anything, that's what ever. I, that's what I've been doing. You know, because I'm defending the city and you all, well, you're acting within the course and scope of, of your job, which is what you're doing, okay? I don't want you guys stepping out of that because then you have individual liability, and, and that's what I'm, I'm trying to keep you guys from doing. I mean, I, I was hoping today would resolve the issues. That's why I asked the mayor to move it up so we could have this conversation, at least have everybody air out their positions, because I know that sometimes that's helpful just moving forward. But from a litigation standpoint, I, I prefer you don't discuss anything. Let's see what happens. Let's see how we move forward. Obviously, I'm going to keep you apprised of the litigation as it goes forward. It's just public records at this point. Um, and there's some serious issues that could arise, and I want to make sure everybody is, is protected. You have insurance coverage to a certain extent, but some acts can take you out of that, and I'm trying to have you avoid from doing that. So even, even the accusations that somebody is um, acting in a certain way does not help us, right? You know, um, accusations at, and some of this was done before the lawsuit, as the mayor said, but accusations of somebody, you know, either doing something behind the scenes or, or, or trying to do something, that doesn't help us. Um, I want to... Did you have anything else, Commissioner Kuyas? No, right, not Commissioner at all. Commissioner Eisner, anything? Last comment, please. Okay. Two points I want to make. One, Ms. Kardash brought up our confidence in our two attorneys. I want to be absolutely crystal clear. I have no question concerning my confidence in Ms. Kardash and Mr. Salzman as far as attorneys go. I second that. Likewise. All right. So there's no interest in doing anything. Um, secondly... Um, I made it real clear, me personally, that with regard to any lawsuit, I don't care whether it's coming from uh, Trastagnol or anybody uh, that involves this commission, um, our, our fiduciary responsibility, as Ms. Kardash has made very clear in the past, is the city of Tarpon Springs. It's not the city commission. It's the city of Tarpon Springs. We're here to protect the city of Tarpon Springs. So my objective in any kind of a lawsuit, whether it's a Section 119, which is the public records lawsuit that we're going into, or it evolves into something else, is two things. One is to protect the city, and number two is to win the lawsuit. I want to be absolutely crystal clear about that for me personally. That's the way I dealt with things 25 years ago. I've been in the military, and that's the way I'm going to deal with things now. So if you hear me talking about the lawsuit, there's only the two objectives that I've got in mind. One, protect the city, and number two, win the lawsuit. And I think that's, um, Mr. Salzman knows how, that's how I feel about it. So that's all I've got to say. Does anybody else have anything yeah. to say on this particular item? We weren't trying to protect the city when we, when, we, when we brought up an agenda item with uh, Commissioner Carr. We exposed ourselves, and we did it anyways. Different. So oh it's God. not totally different. And, so thank and, you. And what I would say to you, Commissioner, is, and I wasn't here then. Sure. Yeah, I, I, we don't want to see repeats of things like that. And I think, thank you. I think um, Regina said exactly what her opinion was, and mine was the same. Mm -hmm. That's not something that, uh, um, you know, our job is to defend the city as part of the charter. Um, and all of you, to that extent, right, to a majority of you when you vote and do things, we, again, I'm very conservative. I want to keep you out of litigation. The best litig litigator keeps you out of litigation. Yes. Right? 
So that, that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm not sure I understand what's CAR got to do with anything that well, we're talking about today. It means exactly. We, we put ourselves in a potential exposure when we went to as what we did. As a, what did we do? What didn't we do, Mayor? What did we do? Well, Tell we, me what we do. You're saying what we didn't do. Tell me what we, we did. Had no problem berating him off of uh, you know a so-called you know whatever the attorney at Trask at the time used as a position, and then we we all took our shots at him, and then we all recommended that he went to the Commission of Ethics, that we filed a report, and then come to find out from Ms. Kardash what we did was completely wrong. So whose problem is that? The commissions or, who are not attorneys, or the attorney that was advising us but, at the time, Mayor? As a uh, parliamentarian, well, my point is, Mr. I, Salzman, I, I don't we want to keep, talk about, I understand we keep expanding this, and 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 I'm not going to well, get into this. We well, that's why a, we're trying to get you all to come back and not discuss these. Pa I mean, Regina said we're starting over, at least for the time being. Let us go with a clean slate moving forward. But you know, one of our, one of um, our human frailties here is that we always feel like we have to constantly retort. And oftentimes, you know, we need to just let, okay, he said what he said. We're constantly retorting. And I saw it for, for a whole year. You know, I had the advantage of, of not being with, you know, when, when the election happened, I, I was, I'm going to say something. When the election of 2022 happened and the four of you got in, I was very excited. And, and that's one of the reasons I decided to run for office. I wanted to be part of something that was going to be really positive. And I still think that that opportunity to be really positive is there. And, and I think you guys did some really positive things. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the comprehensive plan, the strategic plans, all those really important things. And we're moving towards the right direction. But it's like, I, but sitting back, it's constant defense. Somebody says something, I got to retort. Somebody else says something, I got to retort. You know, at some point, we got to let stuff go. And everybody has an opinion. He, 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 he feels that uh, he has remorse over how Jacob Carr was treated. Fine. He expressed it. Um, again. No, he didn't and, say and, he has remorse. He says he's, we've no, well, exposed the no, city. Hey, I, don't, I, don't I don't even know what, what that means. I don't even about. know what expose the city means. Mayor, but you know I exactly know, what I'm talking no, about. But oh my God. We know, I don't know what that means anyways. But, I, that's why, but I'm not commenting on it. What... The, the issue was whether or not the, Tom Trask should have been, been the one to make that um, ethics complaint. You believe it was not, should not have been him. Okay, that's fine. Okay, but, you know, none of us have a, a if we all had a time machine, we can go back a year, and we, I'm sure everybody, I'm sure you would have done stuff different. Maybe he wouldn't. Everybody else would have agreed they would do something different. That's human nature. But we don't have time machines. We're here right now. I, I don't want to sit here for another two years in constant bickering, bickering, bickering. Like every meeting, it's just like constant. It's like every meeting gets dominated by these, these personality conflicts. Everybody's got their high and mighties, and they're just going to stand in their ground. And let's just get some stuff done. I let things go. I shook hands with this man. We had some, a, little, a couple issues. We shook hands and said, hey, let's move forward. Uh, I, I want to, you know, maybe you, know, you don't I, agree with that. No, I, I don't agree with you okay, because fine. you're making it on a personal level. No, because, I'm you're, to because you're taking it defensive no, and you I'm, think I'm, it's about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's okay. about the city. The city's been exposed by what we did. That's got nothing to do with me. The vote was four to one. Guess who voted for it, too? Everybody voted for it. Now, you know, nobody f twisted anybody's hey, arm to file a resolution. We passed a resolution. Over. It was The resolution was factual, Commissioner Koulianos. The commission took the next step because there was no contrition to file a, an ethics complaint. You, you don't hear me condemning you for that. Uh, Attorney Trask, let me just me. finish. I'm very clear on the facts. Okay. Attorney Trask looked into it. An entity such as the city could not do that. So he did it upon himself. That's all I've got to say about okay. that. Whether he we, should have or okay. shouldn't have. Uh, we have Let's a question. Just have a question. Yeah. Was the vote four to one? It was four to one. On on referring uh, Jacob Carr to the commission, on, it was a four Jacob to one Jacob was the one who didn't vote for it. But he voted on it. <laughs> and he wasn't advised not to vote on it. That is correct. 
I'm, I'm 90, as they say, 99.9%. .9%, but in terms of law, it's that 100th of 1% that gets you into trouble mm -hmm. and it gets weaponized. Well, no, we just needed that information. Yeah. I, All right, I anyways. Okay. I just, I, I, I said my thing. So. My memory's my possibly but we, we, a little we, better. We'll check it It was 100% that it was, out, that it was a four to one. <laughs> well, I if I could go to Robert's rules. Rob I, let's sure. go. Thank you. Okay, so this is Robert's rules. Just a simple, small book for you to know how to run a meeting. Okay, it is a very detailed book. It's a very detailed rules, and you cannot adopt all of them. But they're generally used to allow uh, boards to run their meetings. So why Robert's Rules? Robert's Rules has been in effect since 1876. And as it says, it's a default legal process for most government groups um, because there wasn't any rules. And so instead of having just somebody come up with the rules, they, they came up with this really detailed book, and it, it, it's actually fascinating if you look at some of the rules and, and you're into that, um, but a lot of people don't know where these rules came from or why why people adopted, and, and I'll honestly tell you, I never knew about Robert's Rules. I went to college, I was in a fraternity, and somebody said, um, they asked, you know, made a motion pursuant to Robert's Rules, and they literally had a guy named Robert who was the one who responded. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. There, but these are the rules that you use to try to run a meeting in, in a way that, that really is helpful for not only the board, but for the public. And it allows the opportunity for people to understand what's going on. Now, I, I pointed this out before. To, um, Robert's Rules of Order, you cannot adopt completely Robert's Rules of Order. And here's one of the reasons. In Florida, when in doubt, you vote, OK? And the reason is, is that you're elected to be commissioners. And as part of being elected, the people have the right to have you, who is representing them, vote on matters. That's why you're here. That's why you were elected for that. In Robert's Rules, the mayor doesn't vote. He only votes when there is a tie, or you need a two-thirds minimum uh, vote. So that's a, a difference why you can't completely adopt them. And there's actually this statute that talks about the voting requirements. Now, the difference between this board and an appointed board is this. If you have a conflict, and Regina talked about the conflicts that you could have, if you have a conflict, for the most part, not always, for the most part, you're an elected official. You will participate in the discussion. Again, why? Because you were elected to represent people, and you have the right to speak on it even if you have a conflict. Advisory boards differ. If they have a conflict, they're completely out because they were appointed. So that's a big difference that you have. And you have to have, at least in my opinion, and Regina may feel differently about this, you need to have a conflict. You have to have a legitimate conflict. It's very tough when you're in uh, a city, say like Tarpon, where you grew up or you've known people. There might be somebody you know in front of you. There probably is you don't necessarily have a conflict because your neighbor is in front of you. If you did, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, we couldn't get a majority on a lot of these votes. So it's unfortunate, but you got it. You still have to deal with the situation. So it's very rare, at least in my opinion, unless you have a financial gain, unless there's something like, you know, it's, it's a family member, it's a business, you don't have a conflict and you're gonna have to vote. If you do have a conflict, as Regina said, we have a process, and it, you have to fill out the form, and you have to declare that you have a conflict. Okay, let's talk about this, because this is really what Robert's Rules is about. It's about motions and how to do a meeting, okay? We all know, and you all, you all do a great job. I have to tell you, you're one of the best cities I've ever seen handling Robert's Rules. Uh, majority of all municipalities and governments they don't handle it the way you guys handle it. You, you, have, you do a great job. You have the main motion. You introduce a new item. The second motion, this is really the second motion. We kind of talked about this earlier. Um, this affects the change in the main motion. So I, I use this example that happened in Gulfport where they were passing a lease. Um, but the, the question on the lease was the actual property. There was an Exhibit A and there was an Exhibit B as to different sides of the property. So. While well, somebody made the motion, second, to approve the lease, they had to make a second motion on which 
exhibit they were going to accept. And they had to do that. That's that second motion. Then you can bring it, and most of the time, you can bring it back for the original motion. A lot of times, people just combine the two, as long as there's no objection by the board. There's a privilege motion. Motion or important matter unrelated to public <coughs> business. Somebody's talking in the audience. There's making noise. Somebody's holding up a flag, something like that. That's a privilege motion. Incidental motions, questions of procedure. That's your point of order, right? And what's important about that is you consider that before any other motion because you're bringing up point of order, we're doing this wrong, or point of order, we need to bring this forward. I'm sure you all are aware of this. The problem with point of order is we always hear it from the audience. Okay, they're not part of your board. They cannot bring uh, a point of order. Motion to uh, postpone, that we've, we've done some of those. Delays a vote, that's, that's a motion to table. You're going to postpone the actual issue before you. And then a motion to reconsider, and I, th I think we had this, but the important thing about a motion to reconsider has to be made at the same meeting. You can do it later on in the meeting, but you have to do it at the same meeting. Otherwise, it becomes a new issue. But I gave you both a hard copy and a soft copy. Yes. Okay. Every motion has six steps. Motion, second, you restate the motion, debate, vote, and announce the vote. Very simple, very straightforward. All right, so requesting points. No motion, second debate, or voted, right? These are, these are the points we kind of just talked about. These are, not, these are issues that the chairperson, mayor, you will handle these situations. Point of information, that goes to the, to the mayor to make that determination. Point of inquiry, used for clarification in a report. Those all go to the mayor. Point of personal privilege, obviously somebody has to get up and go to the restroom. We do something like that, but the chairman handles that. And why is that important? Under Robert's rules, that's important because as we've just had the conversation, somebody has to control the meeting, how it's moving forward, right? You move your meeting forward. You guys have a very detailed agenda. It's great. It's, it's perfect because it shows people how we're moving forward. In fact, what you do which is really unique. I've never seen this anywhere else, and maybe Regina has. You actually have time periods when things are going to be expected to occur, and you stop your meeting at 7.30 to have ordinances or resolutions, right? That is, I've never seen that before. That's perfect. I mean, that allows me to come in and know when an agenda item is going to be discussed, about how long it's going to go, and how your meeting is going to progress. You walk into your meetings and you go, okay, now well, it looks like it's a lengthy agenda is probably till 10.30. You know what to expect. That's usually not shown. So that, that's an extremely good way of doing it, and that follows through with these Roberts rules. So this is kind of a cheat sheet of what you need to do on a motion, right? What to say? Can you interrupt the speaker? This is a good thing for us to talk about. Need a second? Can be debated, can be amended. Votes needed, okay? Easy, you're introducing a main motion. I move to approve X. You don't interrupt the speaker while they're talking about it. You let them finish. We need a second, absolutely need a second. This motion is debated. It can be amended. And you need a simple majority, easy enough. Amend a motion, I move to amend the motion. Again, same criteria, shouldn't be interrupting the speaker. Need a second can be debated, can be amended, majority. Postpone an item. I move to postpone the matter until two weeks from now, right? Again, can interrupt the, the uh, speaker, need a second, can be debated, cannot be amended. Because remember what it is. Now, probably technically time period might be amended or agreed to by the body, but it's usually not I can't say, well, I move to amend that, and we're going to still hear it today. I mean, that's just not the motion. Again, a majority. Objection to procedure, point of order that we talked about. Can I interrupt the speaker? Yes. If I'm talking and you have a point of order, if that interrupts point of order, we need to, uh, you know, look at this record. Or point of order, I think that's not part of this issue. And we talked about how do you guys stay together on a meeting? How do you get things going, you make, and we've heard them, 
point of order. That's not what we're talking about. That should be something else. No need for a second. It's not debated. Can't be amended. And that's for the mayor to decide. Okay. You do have, a, you do have, and we'll talk about that. You do have a parliamentarian, which is the attorney who's sitting there. <laughs> but the chair makes that ultimate decision. Recess the meeting. I move we recess until, again. Cannot interrupt the speaker on that. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm you're moving around. No, you're fine. I'm a, move I'm a, I'm a trial lawyer. That's I'm, what I'm, we did. I'm going to move it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you need a second. Uh, it's not debated. Again, it, it's not amended. So I move, you know, to recess or I move to adjourn. That's just a majority vote, right? That's basically taking the, the issue that's on the table and putting it somewhere else. Um, request for information. You'd say point of information. We don't really get this one too often. This would be kind of like with a report or I want some additional information. Um, you can interrupt the speaker on that. Uh, you don't need a second. Again, there's no vote. It's really a determination uh, point of information. Uh, city manager, can you hand me this document? That, that's kind of done. And then there is a possibility, and I we don't really see this, but... You could, you could move to overrule the chair's ruling. If the chair says, I think this matters out of order, you could say, well, I'd like the, the majority of the board to vote. Remember, the chair runs the meeting, but it's your meeting. It's the board's meeting. So the majority of the board determines how you move forward with your meeting. And so you don't give up that right. It's just a majority of you. If three of you don't say that, well, then, we go forward with what you know the mayor has decided. Okay. We got to test that one out. <clears throat> Tips and reminders. <laughs> this is what you all do that I I really like, but it's always something to remember. You follow the agenda. It keeps the meeting moving forward in an orderly fashion. The only times you really change the <laughs> agenda is occasionally when you're having a speaker come up or there is an item that you found that it's necessary, like. You know, if everybody's in the audience um, uh, on a matter and you know that it's on that matter, you may want to move that matter up. Because honestly, the problem with having, and no disrespect to anybody, when you have everybody there and you have a bunch of issues that people weren't planning on talking about, they come up and talk about it and it just extends your meeting. Well, I wasn't here to talk about that, but since I am, you know, why don't we take the main issue and get that resolved? So you can move that up and you have the ability to on your agenda and it keeps the meeting moving forward. You're talking about how, to, how are there ways to move the meetings, you know, make them, well, that's one of the ways you do it because if people, if there's a lot of people there, then let's talk about that issue. Let's have everybody resolve that issue. And then as you've seen, suddenly there was nobody in the audience, but you still have an agenda to go through. And so that helps you get through that. Okay, this is very important. Allow, and you do this, Allow all commissioners to speak once before allowing anyone to speak a second time. The mayor's great on this, but you don't see this in a lot of places. Um, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it the way you do it, which is you have the light, or I've seen it, and I'd rather do it that way, let me tell you why. Because I've seen it in other places where you ask everybody, right? And if you ask everybody, more likely than not, you're going to say something. I wasn't going to say anything, but he asked me, so I'm going to say something. That makes your meeting a little longer. But you have to give everybody the opportunity to speak first. Once everybody's given an opportunity to speak first, then you can speak a second time. Never try to you know, end the debate or discussion by a board. You never want to do that. But you want to do it in a way so everybody has their say if they want to say something. And you all, again, are very good with that. Okay. Okay. When discussions get off track, guide the board back to the agenda. That can be done by the chair. That can be done by another member saying, point of order, we're going off track here. And the problem, you know, the idea, again, if you want, look, you have to do the city's business. The business is this issue. Resolve this issue. Then move forward to the next issue. You have at the end of your meeting comments, reports, things like that, that's when you do those things, right? But make sure you stay on the issue. Um, I think sometimes we get a little far afield because we want everybody to have the opportunity to speak, but it may not have to be, uh, you know, dealing with that particular issue. Okay. 
You guys know this. And look, you don't have to agree on everything. You don't have to. You, I mean, it's not expected that you're going to. Um, and I think you all uh, have been trying to do this. Just be respectful to each other. Just treat each other how you would want to be. You know, people watch these meetings. People attend these meetings. They want to see that you treat each other fairly. You don't have to agree. I mean, if you all agree, there's something very odd happening on every day. <laughs> so just be courteous. I mean, you know, I, I think that if you... I don't like to interrupt anything in your meeting unless you're doing something maybe illegal. <laughs> but if you all feel that this is important to you, I'm happy to make a comment. And then when, and when Regina is there, when you change the meeting nights, um, <laughs> she'll be happy to, to just say, hey, you know, Mayor, we're, you know, we, we want everybody to be respectful to each other. Okay. This is an interesting part, I gotta tell you. This is probably one of the hardest areas because there's not, while Robert's Rules has this, most agencies don't do this because A, it's uncomfortable, and B, there's nothing necessarily in writing <coughs> about it, okay? So, potential actions. Well, there's a slight breach. Um, Addressing another member instead of the chair. You know, I'm supposed to ask the chair, chair, can I ask a question to commissioner so-and-so? Um, failing to confine the remarks to the merits of the pending question. Chair says, all right, bring it back. And the mayor's done that. That's not a problem. A little more serious. Uh, member repeatedly questions the motives of other members whom he mentions by name or persists on speaking on completely irrelevant matter. Excuse me, irrelevant matters in debate. By the way, this is Robert's rules. I didn't write any of this regarding what you are going through, okay? These are the rules, okay? Um, the chair warns a member, and if necessary, you call the member to order. Uh, now, when you get a grave breach, this is the hard one. When somebody just is repeatedly offensive, making personal references, um, interrupting. So there's a couple things you could do. You can ask for an apology. Let's assume the person doesn't give you an apology. You can censor him, okay? Have the member removed from that meeting, okay? Have his rights suspended or expulsion. Ooh, that's a hard thing to do. I've seen that only occur once, and that expulsion had to do with something completely different. So that's a hard thing to do. Um, can, can this commission do any of that, or? Well, here, let me say it this way, Mayor. There's nothing prohibiting you from doing <laughs> yeah. that. Okay. Um, you know, perhaps, and again, I, and I'm not going to get into, so I won't say what happened in the past, but if you have a situation where you have a concern about how a member has acted, maybe that's what you do. You take a vote. You say, can you give us an apology? No, okay. We're going to censor your actions. You know, as, as a board, you're saying we believe that your actions were inappropriate, right? Um, if you can't control yourself at a meeting, yeah, we can ask you to leave. That's a little tough to do, again, because I'm an elected official. I have the right to be at the meeting. Um, suspended or expulsion, that would have to be something very grave. And I can't even think of what it would be. I'll just pull one out of my hat. Somebody brings a gun and is waving it around at the meeting, okay? I mean, that's got to be something like that. But if you have somebody, instead of going to maybe other extremes that have occurred, maybe these are better. These are Robert's rules. These are accepted rules. And so these are things that you, that you should look at. That is, so that, that's Robert's rules. It was that last item in line with Florida statutes? Do we have that? I don't, do we have the power to expel? You somebody? don't. You have the power of controlling your meeting and making determinations regarding your meeting. Right. Uh, you do have the right to expel members of the public, but I would be very he oh. Oh. Yes. Oh. Um, but in terms of you, your constitutionally elected officials, that becomes a little bit of, of a different matter. Um, and doing that under Robert's rules could have other um, implications um, that would be unpleasant for the city. Um, so I don't think either myself or Andy would um, go that route unless it were incredibly extreme. 
what I'm going to try to do in a relatively short period of time is this is your rules. And again, I have to tell you, these are some of the best rules that I've seen put in place. Very comprehensive. You don't see them this comprehensive. This is your res resolution on your rules. What I did is if you open it up, you'll see some sections I highlighted in red, and those were really for us to discuss. So <clears throat> if you turn to the second page, B, it says, it shall be the responsibility of each individual elected official to ask the appropriate city personnel through the city manager any questions or otherwise inquire regarding such materials to ensure that he or she understands their respective duties and responsibilities to the city and to the public as it relates to these matters. Okay, why is that important? Obviously, there's a couple things that are important here. Number one, keeps you out of trouble in, a, in your rules, which are the interference. The cent central, uh, central person to talk to is the manager you should be getting the information you need to make in a decision. He's the person to go to. And I highly recommend if you don't do it, you should be meeting with the city manager before every meeting. You, I just recommend it. I've had it where people don't like the city manager and I still recommend it because this is the person who's putting together the agenda. This is the person who's, who can answer your questions. You know, the other thing about meetings too is that you may have a position on something and it's always been my opinion and I probably have told each one of you this. I'm big on not embarrassing an elected official. I'd rather discuss the issue in advance and not have them go far afield on something that is either illegal or improper or something. So if you're talking to the city manager, normally he'll tell you, okay, well, did you consider this? Or here's this information, or we're doing this, or what can I help you in, in making you know, that statement or anything along those lines? So that you have it in your rules. Use it, right? Similar to uh, page three, which is all requests for information. Now, the difference here is that you have the right to get information from your charter officers. It's a fine line the way this is written. It basically looks at what is reasonable. So if a commissioner comes to Regina and says, I'd like you to research this particular issue, no problem. That's not a problem. Unless, yeah, that'll take me three days. Then we have an issue that that's not your intention, right? It's not our intention to have a charter officer looking at something like that without the board's approval. There's nothing wrong with bringing it forward to the board and saying, hey, here's an issue. I think it's important for the city. Um, I would like to have the city attorney research that, get approval of the board. Then we're fine. Then there's no problem. Okay, that, That's an important thing to do. Can I tell you it's an hour? No. Can I tell you it's two hours that what the fine line is? No. I think I could tell you that if you ask me something, I could probably figure it out. And more likely than not, Regina and I are going to go and do what you need to do. We might call you up and say, oh, it's going to, you know, it might take some additional time than we thought and just talk it through with you. Um, but you have the right to have that information again because you have issues of the city that you want to deal with and you have the right to have that information. And that's not just from the city attorney. That's Mr. from Salzman, other I, I think you and Ms. Kardash are in a unique situation because you're under contract. If the city attorney was really the city attorney, he would be an employee of the city. And, that's and, true. And those, that way we could get that research done. But also it would be up to them as far as whether they wanted to bring it mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we, I think that's always been somewhat of a rule that it, it, also with the city manager, if we ask him for something, it looks like it's going to cost some money or right. in, expending engineering hours. It, he's going to tell us we need to bring it to the commission to get approval on it. So I would think that would apply with you as well. Yes. Because it, we bill you hourly, when, you know, I think we both will look at what your typical bills are just for your typical city business. And if it's something that's really going to kind of put a outside dent on what you would normally see. First of all, I would go to Mark first and let him know, hey, I was asked to research this. Um, I think it's going to take an excessive amount of hours, um, you know, and either confirm with him to move forward or depending on the subject matter, just have the board approve whatever the research project is. Yeah. 
In reality, we want to just be able to defend ourselves when you're looking at our bills at a public <laughs> yes. meeting, and somebody <laughs> says, hey, it took 10 hours to do that. And you're like, uh -huh. well, what? they told me. You know? <laughs> but no, it's true. You, you need to make sure that everybody's on board when you're spending uh, city funds. If you turn to page four, this is one that Regina talked about, but I think, uh, again, you have a comprehensive policy <laughs> that you've adopted, and that's the individual opinions. Individual members of the city commission must not represent their own views or recommendations as those of the city commission unless the majority of the board of commissioners has officially voted to approve such action. You can, <coughs> I mean, it's very clear, and maybe in practice it's just a little difficult. I don't know. Um, I have seen this issue probably with every board I've ever dealt with. Uh, people are looking to say, you know, well, should I, I mean, as a question was asked, if I walk around city in, in a city and I'm wearing my city shirt that says commissioner and I give an opinion, am I violating this? Maybe. Are you making it clear that your opinion is just yours, that it's not the board's? Unless the board has taken action or the, unless the board has authorized you. There are times when you go to meetings on behalf of, of the board um, that you've been authorized to communicate this particular position. That's fine, but it's a fine line, and this is an ethics issue, as Regina talked about. So you already, so here again, kind of what we talked about before, You're, you've been told the ethical position. You have adopted particular rules of procedure, right? You have agreed to this. Now, if you're violating it, yeah, you're starting to, it's on you, right? Because you've already been told not to do it. You've already adopted a procedure not to do it. But the only other thing I can say is don't do it. And so if you're going to do it, you, you might have individual liability as opposed to the city in those situations. Okay. Again, this is pretty straightforward, but public statements or opinions should contain no promises to the public that may be construed as binding on the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could innocently walk around and look. One of the things you all talked about that, that I've heard is we need more parking in, in downtown, right? There's a building that you know somebody says to you, hey, this building is going to be uh, for sale. Well, definitely that's a, that's a city. The city will purchase that, that building. No, you can't say that. You could say, though, I'll bring that to the city manager, I'll bring that to the board, see what they're willing to do. And you all have done that, and there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to make sure that no one, you know, I'm acting as an individual, I'm not acting on behalf of the city, don't take it off the market because I said we're going to consider it, you know, things like that. So you just, have, you just have to be clear. People are going to come to you and say, hey, commissioner, you know, and, 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 and think that they can get a response from you and that you're binding the city. You just can't do that. You got to make it clear. And Andy, yes, sir. The problem with that one is one of the ones that I ran into, because I spoke um, very innocently, and things were twisted around to fit the narrative of what they wanted to say. So that's not 100 percent true. Uh, you know, you well, can. Well, the problem is, you're right. That's yeah. a problem. Yeah. And the and the only thing I could say to you, and this always happens, and you all, well, one commissioner is new, but it's almost like a lesson learned, right? You learn it once, and then you don't do it again. Um, you gotta you gotta know who you're talking to, um, or look, it'll come out <laughs> at a public meeting, and you'll just have to respond and say that's not what I said, that's not what I intended. Um, they're misconstruing that. You know, we want to make sure that. But again, these are ethical violations. You've adopted the part of the, of the state ethics. So these are ethics rules. You have to be very careful. Otherwise, you'll, you'll have an ethics violation against you. OK, individual members of the city commission shall refrain from expressing their position on a matter to be considered in an upcoming commission meeting. Well, OK, that's a sunshine violation. So we know that. You, you can't really disclose that. Now, are there exceptions? Yes. Here's the exception. The exception is you're gathering information, you present it to everybody, and no one discusses it, right? Is that the best way of doing it? No. But can you do it? Yes. 
but I, I think it's a mistake to do it because uh, in essence, you should take information that you gather, like there's a parking, this building's going down, and you bring it to the city manager, and you say, you know, hey, can you look into this, or can we have that information, and, and not, you know, really discuss that until it's being vetted. If, uh, right, so let's see, if any mayor, if any mayor, if the mayor or commissioner wishes to provide additional information or explanation, it is be given to the city manager to be added as the agenda backup. Nothing wrong with you all doing that. I think it's interesting under 6 uh, F, um, the city manager will answer individual complaint letters. So any kind of complaints you're receiving regarding the city, those go to the city manager to handle. So I think that's important. The other important one on page five is the files and public records, and this is basically everything that Regina talked about. You have adopted that as your policy. So not only is it in the state statute and the requirements, but you've adopted it. I don't know if everybody knows C, but I wanted to point it out to make sure that you understood this was your policy. By the 15th of each month, the mayor and each commissioner shall ensure that their respective files in archives are up to date. Mm -hmm. That's your policy. No public record shall be destroyed unless done so in accordance with the state of Florida's retention schedule. That's your policy and accordingly approved, reported, and documented by the city clerk. That is your adopted policy. Okay. On page six, the agenda preparation. The city manager, city clerk, city attorney, or the mayor or any commissioner may place an item on the regular agenda for action. Matters placed on the, agenda, on the agenda by the mayor or any commissioner must be related to the adoption or implementation of matters of policy. Now, the one thing to consider with this is that you guys have pretty extensive agendas. You don't have like one or two items. Your meetings are, are, are intensive. So the, the manager has to be able to make sure all the documents, the people are there and all those things. So while that does say that, it doesn't mean it will happen, you know, immediately. Um, you know, some things take a little time depending on what's going on, but you have that provision in there. If you turn to page seven, you have your orders of items consent agenda. I've talked to the mayor about this and, and I said I would talk to the board about this. You have consent agenda items, all right? The idea behind the consent is that they're really not for you to discuss. Not saying that you can't pull an item, we've talked about that. You pull an item and everybody can talk about it. But why are you pulling the item, right? Is it to talk about some, hey, I just want to say I, you know, I reached out to this person or that. You could say that somewhere else, right? You're pulling, talk about extending a meeting. You're pulling an item off that we now have to <coughs> vote on individually, discuss individually. By the way, based on your procedures, the public gets to comment it. Consent items are not really supposed to be things that you, that people discuss. They're supposed to be just matter of, matter of fact. Hey, we're going to have a flag for July 4th. Okay. I mean, we don't need to talk about that, right? So you talk about, that's one thing I've seen extend your meeting some. And I'm not saying there aren't items that, you, that should be pulled. They sure, certainly that's your right. But are you, if it's to discuss the item or is it to make a comment? I would just say if it's to make a comment, you may not want to pull it. If it's to discuss it legitimately, uh, questions and concerns, then you pull it. And frankly, it should be something that you may want to talk to the city manager in advance because it might be something that he didn't realize would be controversial or something that you, know, you needed to consider. Um, I'm going to skip through that. Quasi-judicial hearings, again, you all do a great job on quasi-judicial. You have your rules, you, you follow those rules, you do a good job on it, I, you know, that, and, and we're, we're going to talk about that a little more, but I like the way it's laid out, it, it's good, the procedure's good. I didn't pick up on page nine when I first read these, um, and I don't know how Regina feels about this, but I have to tell you, on the paragraph A, you have 
about three sentences down. A minimum of 24 hours notice shall be required before any special session, work session, or open public hearing of the city commission. And I don't agree with that at all. The law is pretty clear on this. If you're calling a special meeting, you need seven days notice. Seven? Seven. If you have calling an emergency meeting, you could do it within 24 hours. Remember, an emergency meeting is an emergency. We have a hurricane coming. We're doing something, you know, because remember, remember the idea behind this. Sunshine law, notice, have the opportunity to come to the meeting, see what's going on. So why are you doing something in, in a shorter period of time? It's an emergency. And when it's an emergency, it's one item, and it is discussed, I mean, it's ratified at a subsequent meeting. If it is a uh, workshop, if it's a, hey, we need to call a special meeting because we didn't resolve these issues, that's normally seven days. Okay, that, that, that is what the law, and that's what the case is, and what, that's what the Attorney General has said. And I get nervous because, you know, you could, here, is it, you're doing something illegal? No, what you're doing is probably doing something that will require us to do it again. You didn't give adequate notice, right? What, what was so important that you couldn't give seven days notice on this issue? So. You got to be careful on it. So th that's when, when I saw it, I was like, "Oh yeah, I miss that." Um, your meeting times, I I think that's great. I really don't normally see that, but uh, that I, I think that's helpful for everybody running the meetings and <coughs> attending. Under the uh, points of order, we kind of talked about that. Uh, here, the okay, and and, and I wanted. I'm happy we're talking about this because I. I wanted the board's buy-in on this. You talked about the city attorney being the parliamentarian, okay? That's the hot seat for the city attorney. And I don't have a problem, and I know Regina doesn't have a problem, but don't hold it against us because we're following your rules. And, it's, and you don't like to interrupt. I don't like to interrupt commissioners. I don't want, but if you're, if you're saying I'm the parliamentarian, then don't hit me. Because I'm going to have to say if I'm following the rules as a parliamentarian. And as long as the board's fine with that, I'm fine with it. Um, so, but I just understand that's one of those things where you're feeling a little, uh, are they going far afield here? Uh, you know, I think, I think Commissioner Eisner, I said something to you the last meeting, and I asked, what are you going to say on this? Because I was getting a little, you know, so I don't normally like to do that, but. It's, it's your rule, and we'll follow your rule. I wasn't offended. Don't worry. Okay. You didn't hit me, so that was good. On page 11, um, we're talking about public comments. So you guys do something a little differently than, and maybe Regina's seen this. Um, I've never seen donate time unless it was a group, personally. I've never seen the donation of time by one individual. But you all do it. It's part of your rule. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, you also have, uh, I don't, I'm not sure we, we go ahead and, and do the Zoom or phone only two minutes. That's, uh, is that always been, do we click them off after two minutes or? Well, it does buzz sometimes. Okay. If, if that's a little harder it, but... to do, um, but that's your rule. Oh, here's the part that when we talk about decorum of the meeting, and unfortunately I've had to deal with this with another client and it can get pretty nasty. But people need to know that they need to address their comments to the chair, okay? Not talk about individual commissioners. I know sometimes that's difficult because the issue is Commissioner X did this, right? You know, why would you do that? But you have to really do it to the chair. And the reason why to bring it back to the chair is kind of just to calm down the meeting and the decorum. I've been in uh, many meetings in Gulfport where we've had to escort people out because they just don't follow the decorum. Um, they curse or they, you know, they're, they're doing we, things. We don't that have that here. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have that here. Well, then good. <laughs> Is that a problem? <laughs> I mean, I don't want the chief to have to get up and escort mm -hmm. somebody. But, but I've, had, I've seen it, Neither and it's I. gotten so bad at, at one time that we just wait for the guy as soon as he gets there to go, well, how, many, how many words before he curses? Oh, he got a sentence in. <laughs> and then they escort him out, right? Yeah. Um, but your decorum is to keep everything going, respectful, as you've agreed to treat each other. 
you will treat the people in, in the city. And, it, and, and you need to make sure that if any of you, and we, this happened today, if any of you feel like you're going far afield, just bring it back in and just say, okay, you need to address the chair, you need to you know, be civil in your comments. Um, this is something that, I don't know, we, we kind of talked about this, uh, Regina talked about this, and you, you kind of asked the question, this is a makeup of a board, right? Some boards like to inter engage with people when they ask questions. I have some boards that say, thank you for your comment, and the city manager will get back to you on that, right? That's, that's however you want to do it. I've had people that say, we want the public to come up and say whatever they want on every issue, and we're happy, and we're going to engage in those questions. The only thing I will say to you is when you engage, and as Regina said, if you're going to do it for one, you do it for everybody. And whether you like me or not, I'm standing up there, you're going to answer my question, or you're going to defer to the city manager, you're going to do something, because you're going to treat me the same as you're treating her. That's the only rule. I think to do that is a major mistake. Um, and I'm going to say why, because if my if I decide to answer the person differently than the rest of the board does, then John could turn and say I, I don't agree with that. And the next thing we know, we have a argument or a discussion, and I, I just think that it's best that it all gets either referred to one person up on the board, or it goes to the city manager. Well, okay. So here's the scenario. So I come up and I ask a question to the mayor. Mayor, I want to know what uh, Commissioner Eisner uh, has to say about X, Y, and Z. I heard that he said this. And do we then say, okay, Commissioner Eisner can answer. Well, now I'm here. Well, that's not what I heard you said. You know, so it goes, this banter goes back and forth. There's nothing wrong if that's what you want to do. That's a specific question. Um, and in that aspect, I agree with you. But in the aspect of asking uh, when is blah, blah, blah street going to get paved? And we can't all answer, you know. Can't all answer, but you have, as a group, said, you know, pushed your button and mayor will acknowledge. And you you have said, yeah, we've, we've been looking into this. Somebody else, yeah, we've done it. So groups of you do answer those questions. All I'm <clears throat> saying to you is that when you engage with answering a question, you're going to engage with that conversation. And so just know that that extends meetings because you're engaging and you have to treat everybody the same. So when I get up there and say, I, you know, I don't like where you put this stop sign and it, it's causing problems and, and maybe I'm, you know, one of those people that talks about every stop sign every week and you don't like it and it doesn't make any sense, you're still, <laughs> you got to treat me the same, right? Yeah. There are some people I know, I've heard the comments, well, that's not really, I don't know where that's going. Well, but you, you've got to treat me the same as you treat that person. That's the only thing. I mean, there's, it's, as long as everybody's treated the same, we're all good. So the last, under E, the mayor shall pre preserve order and decorum, uh, prevent attacks on personalities, and some of that is, is in, you know, the mayor shall ensure that there's no cheering, clapping. Obviously, in certain circumstances, you, you know, we gave awards to uh, uh, with all the kids at that meeting. It was a wonderful uh, awards, and you know, you're going to have clapping and cheering in those situations. What you don't want is when it's a controversial issue and you have people just interrupting the meeting. Um, and that's while that's the mayor's responsibility. Really, the whole board needs to be on you, together on that because you just it, again, if you allow it. For this group, then you have to allow it for that group, and so everybody needs to be treated the same. There is a difference when you're when you're doing something like just, an award. I, you know, for me personally, I think trying to inhibit applauding kind of creates more of an issue than if you just let it happen. Um, and sometimes you're right; you get the situation where some boards allow clapping when it's people are approving what they're doing, right? and then you're objecting when people are plotting for what people don't agree with right. the commission. And it's like, you know, what's good, as you said, treat everybody the same. So 
I, I don't have an issue with applauding if it's just in response to a person having commented and sitting down. It's another thing if it becomes to, to disruptive in some way, um, in some form of, um, of uh, uh, display of... Uh, and, of and, and, right, and honestly, it happens in controversial things. Mm -hmm. We know that. Um, people get excited, or, people take those statements, and I think there is, uh, I agree with you, there's a difference between, okay, yeah, I agree with that, versus heckling and acting or, or that applauding, way. That's a different, trying to shut somebody down or right. quiet them down in some way or another. And again, attacking anybody on the board. Yeah. Um, I just think that, you know, you can't have that. You can't have people standing up and saying something about, you know, uh, and, and I'd look at Mark, but I'll say the police chief. You can't have him standing up and yelling about the police chief. Um, you, it, it's just disruptive and it's not mm -hmm. professional. And I, I don't think you guys have a problem with that, but it, but it is one of your policies. So you want to remember, well, why is the mayor shutting down those people? Well, it's your policy. So you all need to be unified with these policies. Look, here's the nice thing about a resolution. Resolution can be changed whenever you want. Yeah. So if you want to add something to your procedures, you want to remove something from your procedures. It's very simple. It's, it's a living and breathing document. If something isn't working out, change it. As long as it's not illegal, th then you can do it. Um, you have, I mean, again, you have the most detailed resolution I've ever seen talks about how ordinances, about resolutions. I mean, it, it's phenomenal. Um, and, and I think other agencies should follow it. Uh, it's, it's really good. It follows the state statute, follows all those laws. So um, I, I think your procedures are in place. They follow Robert's rules for everything except for obviously the voting conflict. So you're in place with all those things. So all you have to do is follow your procedures. You'll be following Robert's rules. We'll let you use it as long as the board agrees with me. Um, we can have Mike. We can have Mike Racy's have a sign. Clap, no clap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the or, mayor, a, I, or no I, revelry. I actually have another sign. board meeting yeah. to go to. Um, is it possible? What, what, what do we have left? Uh, was it just the quasi judicial? Well, day? there's the, it's the quasi judicial and those charter provisions that we've presented. Um, that. Uh, I'd like to do it. Why don't we, that if what I can, we, real quick. Don't be late to your meeting. What we can do? Do you want to try and schedule that for? We've got a light. Well, what, I talk, what we talked about earlier about an item, um, the agenda that I expected for this meeting for Tuesday of, for Tuesday night, a lot of items that were going to take up time got moved to June. So we do we do have, you know, an extra 20, 30 minutes would, would, would be like easy that. to fit into the agenda. Um, as we pose it, um, just sometimes how those agendas fall. So the two great. sections I'd like to talk to you all about, obviously, is one that you're very familiar with, is just generally the charter, you're the legislative body, who does your administrative stuff, that's easy. Second part, I do want to talk to you all and remind you, is that section regarding um, uh, litigation and your responsibilities, and most importantly, what keeps you protected. So if you step outside of those then you have exposure, and that's what we're trying to eliminate. We've talked about it a little today, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about it at, say, at the end of the meeting, would, would, if that's okay. Would a regular session be appropriate for all of that? Yes. Okay. Always. You, know, I, you can get in touch with... Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Salzman on that. Okay. John Rod, to comment on okay. tonight. Put it at the end of the okay. comment. Yeah. Uh -huh. or, we need to start the meeting early, we could. Yeah. No, so like I say we lost some okay. big time agenda items to June. I may have some problems with the June, but the um, but this one opened up surprisingly. <laughs> Mr. Salzman, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Kardash. Did you want to finish up, or um, I don't have anything further for you today. <laughs> Okay, um, let me go to board staff comments. I know it's a work session. Anything else? Sam Manager LaCourse? No. Nope. Ms. Jacobs, Chief? No. Ms. Kardash, you're okay? Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Sorry, comments? Yeah. Um, Mayor, thank you for putting this together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see the glass is half full. And I think it, this was a very, I actually believe this is a very productive meeting. It was meeting. necessary. It was a necessary yes. and productive meeting. And I want to I thank you for that. 
Commissioner I have nothing to say. No comment. Uh, I think it was a productive meeting. It was a good way to get some uh, some things aired out. Uh, we understand where our next steps are in protecting the city of Tarpon Springs and, and uh, what's to be talked about in the future after the city of Tarpon Springs is protected. And I, I fully encourage this board to uh, seek those answers that, that need to come out here in the future. So thank you so much. Can I uh, say something now? <laughs> thank you all, Mayor. I, I just I just want to say one thing to you, Coolius. Um, you're going to be in for a shock when you hear what you don't think was there. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say. Okay. You mean when you wave your when I when I wave okay. everything and when I tell you what I, you will be shocked. Okay, Mayor. One thing I forgot. Go ahead. Make sure to get with Trish. That you know, I know some of us, like the mayor and I, have already signed up for the four hours of this training. Now we have get with Trish about what you need to send in uh, to cancel it. To, to send in to to, oh, to make for, for your statutory for requirement. This meets it now. I said we got to cancel our right. we got to cancel it. But make sure you get it in and you get it into the state so you're covered. Since this training covers your hours and stuff, whenever you're going to take it in the yeah, next three months, you got to send a notification. So I think Trish and between Trish and Irene, make sure you get and get your training in so you're covered for this year by the statute because that's important. Thank you for saving four hours and, of video help. And uh, <laughs> let me just um, let me just say I, I want to thank uh, those that are here, Ms. Kardash, Mr. Salzman, for their time. The, the residents that are here also it's it's been televised, um, and also the staff and Ms. Jacobs. Thanks for putting the lunch together for us and everything. Good. I want to make it clear to all the commissioners, I, I'm i probably the least guy that makes things personal. Um, I don't have an issue with whatever anybody says. I learned that a long time ago growing up in Tarpon Springs with my friends. I would suspect some of y'all that grew up the same way. You get into some pretty hard arguments. A couple of days later, you're back to being yourselves again. So I want to make sure whatever I say here that seems to be harsh and stuff, um, don't hold that personal. I don't, and I just want to make sure that that's clear for everybody. Yes, sir. City manager knows that too. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Four fifty-six. You made a nice mess. That means it's you know, enough garbage. Too. That's that, not uh, my problem.